Hello, everyone, and welcome. Hi, Marina. Hello, Marina. Hey, hey, good morning. Good morning. I hope you can hear me well. This is just a testing because we are getting started in just one minute. It's probably the biggest FinTech event uh, in Moldova uh, that is happening this year. Um, until now, we have more fans. So good morning to everyone who's watching us. Please let us know if you can hear us well by putting um, a good morning sign in the chat or raising your hand. We will really appreciate that. Uh, also, uh, please let us know if you can see us, just to make the final technical check before starting. Great, I see some good mornings here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have uh, we, we have one more minute to go, and um, today we are talking about fintech and everything related to fintech. We're going to learn a lot from previous experience and what fintech means, what what are the ecosystems, and many more. There is an eco. Okay. So a couple of technical more details. Um, once we are talking, since some echoes may, may appear, we'll ask everyone to remain mute. All the participants are kindly requested to, uh, to, to put their questions in the Q&A session or in the chat. We prefer the Q&A session, but you are welcome to, to put the question in the chat as well. I see that we have Alex here, and now it's 11 o'clock, so basically we can get started. First of all, I want to thank all the participants and all the speakers that joined today, uh, because the FinTech Business Bridge uh, between Sweden and Moldova is the greatest event uh, that we are having. Uh, we, we know that FinTech is not only an enabler, but also a driving engine, and it's going to become one day a driving engine for a Moldovan economy. Um, Attic organized this event in order to get more insights and more con connectivity on uh, and in the fintech area. And we know that the future of financial services in Moldova is bright. And now uh, we are trying to connect with Swedish part, learn uh, something more from Sweden. Uh, therefore, Attic is very happy to have all the participants that registered on board and all the speakers, the great speakers that we have on the today's agenda. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, first, uh, for being part of this event and uh, for helping the Moldovan community to develop its uh, fintech ecosystem, and not only. I have by my side Alexandre Bouton, who's going to be co moderating with me the first part of our event. And uh, Alex and I will make sure to ask the questions that the audience will address in the QA session. Uh, and we will also look over any other um, uh, details that might appear. So, Alex, please um, uh, say hello to everyone and let's proceed with our agenda. Thank you very much, Marina, and good morning, everyone. I hope uh, Alex, uh, you're hearing we are me not well. Able to hear you. Do you hear me now? Fantastic. Yeah. No, good morning. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Marina. Uh, for starters, I feel honored to be here today. Firstly, since there will be a lot of talk about Sweden, a country that has excelled at so many social and economic chapters, but also about Moldova, the country we all do wish to excel in pursuing its development goals. And I'm certain that we will learn a lot of lessons from the Swedish experience, uh, that will be shared in the first part, which uh, uh, I will proudly be co-moderating with, uh, with uh, Marina, uh, and which will be considered within the expected brainstorm for Moldova's path for the second part of our discussion. Uh, 
And besides, since I have received already several feedbacks on the opportunity and timeliness of having today's event, even prior its start, uh, the, the interest for the topics is basically pre-confirmed and uh, it's also raising the expectations to a quite high level. But before we unwrap the story behind Sweden's success and jump, jump into the uh, uh, exciting details, um, I, we will kindly ask Her Excellency, uh, the Ambassador of Sweden to Moldova, Anna Lieber, uh, to say a few introductory words on what she's expecting from today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Good. Well, let me start by saying to you, dear partners and dear colleagues from both Moldova and, and Sweden, that I'm very pleased to, to be here and to have the opportunity to welcome you all today to this first fintech bridge between our countries. And I'm delighted to see all of you joining this virtual uh, knowledge sharing and networking event that it is. You know, today, um, Sweden is one one of the most competitive, productive and, and globalized nations in the world, but it's also a um, country of innovations. And we see that innovations has played a crucial role in the development of Sweden's welfare and, and success over the years. But I dare to say um, that innovations has maybe never been as important as it is today and when we are um, sort of moving into to the future. Um, I would say that Sweden has always been open for international trade for new influences and, and, and foreign people. And I believe with this, it also comes a um, curiosity for, for new ideas and trends and, and techno technologies. And, and um, in Sweden, we have seen several strategic decisions being taken and that enabled our society and our uh, people to, to become these early adopters of, of technology. And in, in, in a way, the Swedish success in the digitalized economy can be explained by strong investments into digital infrastructure, um, but also a supportive regulatory framework um, that has created um, an environment that is also ideal for, for innovations and, and implementation of, of new um, applications. And for, for example, Sweden is today in the forefront when it comes to modern digital payment solutions. Um, we're becoming even more and more cashless in Sweden, and we see that less than uh, a tenth of payments are made in, in cash. Um, so we have started a project in Sweden to develop a, a e digital currency. It's called the e krona, and this has to do with the practicality, with openness to change, but also I would say a um, thriving tech thing. And also in, in Moldova, it is important to, to create a supportive ecosystem that facilitates innovation, um, where fintech can really flourish. And finance is an essential component that could make Moldova swift um, to cashless economy and to boost also the e-commerce development that we see now is in a very important sector that has grown in importance also here in Moldova, not least also in the light of, of the um, COVID-19 pandemic. And we know that um, financial technology is an area with great potential for, for Moldova. And a lot of work is already ongoing. Um, and, and we see an expanding IT industry. IT specialists can really contribute here further to, to the process of, of technologization uh, services, also in the banking and in the financial field. We see that Moldova has a huge potential in developing innovative fintech solutions um, that can strive in the local economy. Um, and I can uh, only underline the importance of continued focus on developing fintech to find solutions um, that can boost the use of, of digital financial uh, services and promote innovations and develop programs dedicated for, for fintech. Um, so Sweden, I said, is keen on, on digitalization and, and this is not only at home, uh, we also work on this globally. ICT and entrepreneurship and in innovations, these are elements that are encouraged and promoted also through our development assistance projects that we carry out also here in, in Moldova. And we see um, the possibilities and the opportunities these sectors are providing for not least an inclusive market development. Um, because we should remember that FinTech also can provide major benefits to the society 
in promoting financial inclusion and, and making financial services widely um, available also to the general population that maybe has no access to finance. And this is, is also surely um, an important priority for sustainable global development. So um, let me conclude by saying that we in, in Sweden, we see how cooperation between various stakeholders um, lead to the development of fintech. Um, and the fintech business bridge between Sweden and Moldova gives really an opportunity for local business community to, to learn more about the Swedish experience. And I hope that we, with today's event, can give an opportunity to share these experiences and to facilitate the dialogue um, between the private sector and, and policymakers and also set ambitious goals that will um, boost financial and, and digital innovation here in Moldova. So uh, I would like to wish you a successful event today with very fruitful and inspiring discussions. And needless to say, of course, the Embassy of Sweden is ready here to support and, and facilitate any connections and also to, to catalyze synergies wherever possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the support, for making this event happen and for connecting us with the Swedish experts that we are having today on board. We're excited to, to get started. We are excited to what's coming up uh, for Moldovan uh, development. And I mean here e-commerce, um, econo economical development through FinTech and not only, and how, how FinTech can be a game changer for our country and uh, for Moldova overall. This is really important for us and this event will probably show once again what we need to do, some conclusions and bring us more light into, into development of uh, FinTech uh, in general. We have here today with us Vasilia Valka, who is the, um, uh, the president of the FinTech committee within ATIC. It's a new committee that was created just a year ago so, uh, Vasilia, please welcome with uh, some welcoming remarks uh, from uh, your side. Hi, Marina. Hi, everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here, and I want to welcome the guests and the participants at this conference. And I have to say I'm quite excited and look forward to the panel discussions ahead, as they promise to be very interesting. As Alexander said earlier, there's you know a lot of interest around these topics. Uh, but looking uh, back at how uh, this all started, I think none of us at uh, ATIC and the FinTech committee was expecting this. Uh, when we had an online breakfast with Ms. Uh, Liebert back in December, but the discussion kept turning around FinTech and the Swedish embassy was kind enough and very helpful in introducing us to people with experience in FinTech from Sweden, uh, who are the speakers today and you'll see them throughout the day. Then we got invited to the Stockholm FinTech Week, which was a great event. Uh, and we thought of organizing something, well, not similar, but, you know, bring that uh, Swedish experience back home. And the initial idea was to have some uh, presentations, you know, separate events. And then we thought of organizing, maybe putting all of them together and having uh, one online conference. So we're all now gathered here on this virtual uh, business fintech uh, bridge. Um, and we at the fintech committee, we have several important items on our agenda and we've been working uh, on them throughout the last year, um, such as the implementation of open banking legislation in Moldova, uh, crowdfunding, EKYC, e-commerce, and uh, the broader digitization of the economy via online and digital payments. So as you see, uh, most of them will be uh, presented or discussed about during today's events. Uh, looking forward to it, and I wish everyone to enjoy it. Thank you, Vasilen. Uh, indeed, uh, we will definitely hear more about uh, the Stockholm uh, event, uh, but uh, before going into that, um, just building uh, up on what uh, Raxon said, mentioned the importance of building the proper revolution in the distance, which will support... Alex, we, we are... Yep, now it's better. The sound was a little bit uh, fuzzy, sorry for interrupting. Okay, okay. Now it's better. No. So uh, building up properly functioning ecosystems for uh, startups development uh, is absolutely undoubtable. And it's clear to me that for the next phase in the industry growth in Moldova, it should be the focus on uh, a shift of focus towards entrepreneurship, startups, innovations, and coming back to what I said earlier, as we enterprise excel in many ways, and the building up of that startup ecosystem is clearly one of them. Swedish excellence in innovation and high entrepreneurial culture actually have uh, led to the creation of that mature, value-driven, and truly international ecosystem. On the other hand, 
flourishing innovation in the ecosystems in the original EU 15 countries are the results of many decades of careful planning and large public investments. Uh, and for excellence, you mentioned that those public investments in technological development. We here in CED actually do you hear me? It's it's quite surprising going up and down your sound. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will try to reconnect when Anna will, will start her, her speech just to introduce you to introduce her in 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 in, uh, in, uh, in the following couple of seconds. So uh, uh, as I was saying uh, here in CE we can't simply copy those procedures, but rather need smart strategies to be proper. Uh, innovation ecosystems with a far lower investment cost than those in the EU 15. So, as our first speaker, I will talk about the development, the development of these deeper ecosystems. And she will most likely raise the curtains on, on what those smart strategies would be. And also, um, considering that Stockholm has almost one fifth of the entire workforce work, work, uh, in tech, involved in tech being the largest share of uh, any other city in Europe, we would really be curious to hear out what lessons can be learned from the 2021 edition of the Stockholm Fintech with Anna over to you, and I will try to, to, to recollect myself uh, to make it up. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Alex, for introducing me. I have one technical question. I would like to share my screen, a few slides. However, I've, it seems that it's not possible. Is there anybody who could help me with that? Now we'll do that in a minute. I okay. Guess. Yeah, we, we should be able to, to do it in a second. So basically, um, you will uh, share your screen, right? Yeah, um, so I can just give a bit visual, um, like a picture, so then uh, it would be easier to follow the story. It seems that I'm not able to. Okay, uh, Yula, can you check once again? Should, you oh, should I be able to now. do it now. Yep. Yes. Um, do you see my screen now? Yes, we can see it well. All right. Uh, I'm. Uh, my name is Anna. Thank you, Alex, for introducing me. So, I'm, uh, I am a co-founder of Sogo Fintech Week, and today I will uh, give you a bit of a short of a description and share the knowledge how I've built the different ecosystems, including the Swedish one, and also share a few key takeaways from Sogo Fintech Week 2021. Um, together, fintech startups, our financial institutions, regulators, investors, our education institutions, financial services form the ecosystem. All these players contribute to the innovation, stimulates economy, facilitate collaboration, competition, and ultimately benefits the uh, customers in the financial industry. From an innovation perspective, one's effort helps further to work. Working with and building fintech ecosystems are, I could highlight six different elements which are successful when building the fintech ecosystem. It's a government support, access to capital, the progressive regulator, access to the right talent, a startup supporting community, and the literate customers. We start with, with the government support. So government may fund our, the, the fintech ecosystem. It could be influencing in a different aspects in the ecosystem. And then of course, it varies from a region by region. However, there are a few examples how government can support and force the fintech innovations. That could be encouraging investments or the tax breaks or providing direct funding for the innovations. It could be empowering to or also a mandating regulators to encourage innovations and competition. Just a moment. Our, um, 
innovations and uh, competition. So PZ2 is one of the examples that could be mentioned here. Also, that could bring pipelines of talents through the different investing in education initiatives and by attracting top talents from all around the world. However, uh, each government has different tools and somewhere they are powerful, somewhere they are less. And that could be an interesting uh, motivations are an inspiration for Moldovan government. Capital is very important for the fintech ecosystem, fintech startups. So it's a different mechanism that could uh, support the fintech uh, ecosystem to grow. Government again plays an important role and that can provide seeds, funds, interest-free grants. Also that could be initial support to the venture capital of private equity banks, firms and incubators. Also incubators and accelerators, they play an important role in, in capital fundraising. In some ways, they are the first one who discovers the startups and give them the opportunity to explore their ideas further. They also provide different tools, such as their um, different type of uh, coaching, are uh, helping them to connect to different players in the ecosystem. So they, in the other hand, in the other hand play as a, a role as a one-stop shop for buyers and sellers in the ecosystem venture capitalists and private equities. They're specific, very important too when it comes to working with fintech startups. They're the one who directly fund the fintech startups and help them on the different stage of their development. We should not exclude though the traditional financial institutions that are also playing an important role in, in the capital function of supporting the fintech ecosystem. They could create different initiatives, they, they create funds are where they we are then they invest in different fintech startups. So there are examples of HSBC, ING, or SAB and further BBVA uh, banks, which are very much involved in working with fintech startups in early stages by investing in them. Progressive regulator. Having a progressive regulator broadly translates into innovations are by working closely with fintech sector to understand new models and helping innovators to understand the regulatory environment. Regulators and policymakers are actively seeking to develop attractive fintech ecosystems through the range of policies to other interventions. Together with fintech industry, associations, regulation are forming partnerships globally to share leading practices, experiences, and framework to help fintech companies to export their services and expand into each other's markets. Regulators should support their experiments so, uh, over, over fintech startups. However, they should manage the risk and uh, as their function is to, uh, to maintain the trust and as the financial industry is heavily regulated. Access to the talent, to the right talent is critical in building fintech ecosystem. Fintech businesses require, require specialists with a blend of skills, such as in corporate technology, financial services, general innovation, entrepreneurial and customer-centric thinking. It also requires our talent to understand the market, the customer needs, the business models, and can also manage the relevant compliance requirements. However, we may come here to the cut in 2022, where the talent is not ready to join where there's no capital at the company yet. However, investors, when they're looking into a sustainable collaboration with specific fintech startups, they are emphasizing specifically on the appropriate skills of their staff. Uh, and that could be challenging. Uh, and we could see there are different ways where the other actors, other factors could support that challenge in order to succeed together. Very important role there in, the, in, the fin, in building fintech ecosystem, we could see how their 
fintech community is playing the role. And Sweden is a very important uh, example how that succeeded, where the driver of a, of a, of a, of a fintech ecosystem is the supporting community. Here, there's a few different examples how that could be represented. That could be facilities, we are different core working spaces and a variety of, so, of supports of different uh, players, such as a different uh, more easy or um, lower budget type of role of a co-working space. This could be an interest for fintech startups to, to grow or even start the service providers, uh, which are having a different programs where they're uh, serving the, the early stage fintech startups, including the lawyers, recruiter, our um, service and so forth. And in return, the fintech companies, they will help to generate the business, the, the pipeline for all these fintech uh, service providers, I'm sorry. Of course, it's very important to mention the fintech clusters, hubs, fintech, accelerators, incubators, which are important tools when it comes to building the fintech ecosystem. They all are working together in terms of fostering innovation, and they also gave and provide tools of the early stage startups. Uh, in uh, coaching them and giving them a different um, support, starting from connecting to the right people, to right organization, organizing bridges like this today, and also working with a different financial ecosystem players to foster the collaboration in between them. Important to mention are uh, fintech events and programs. These are the tools which are could be made independently or also could come from one of their uh, ecosystem partners to, to build the connections uh, in, in each other. They help to force the innovation, they help to share the knowledge, create uh, the networking experience and of course grow the business. If anybody have a question, I'm happy to answer by the way. Um, literary customers. There are different, uh, when it comes to, to customers, they play an important role in, in, in growing and in, in moving uh, the fintech startups you know, through, their, through their journey. New providers are usually more customer-centric focus or they have a focus on a specific service area. That means that the customers are ready to engage and try the new services. However, the established players, they have more large, um, customer base, databases, they have stronger brands, they have a trust behind them, they are more mature when it comes to compliance function, also have a, a deeper pocket. However, we see the tendency that quite everyone who in the ecosystem or the consumer itself, they have their, they try different fintech, new type of services, but they're reluctant to move to or all their, for example, assets to, to the new providers. There we see the strengths and importance of a collaboration and partnership between the two of the, the new providers and existing businesses. And where and that's where the customers benefit. They get the most uh, interesting uh, type of a product that they could be engaged with. And they also get the trust they need from established players. And that's where the sweet spot of collaboration and partnership between these two players and beyond, of course. Nevertheless, it's very important to mention that all these factors are good to consider. However, they all need to play uh, and together. That's is that would be uh, that's what the fintech ecosystem would be successful, as from my experience and knowledge. You need to collaborate. There is a possibility to grow the business, to grow each other's. Uh, um, functioning ecosystem itself as you work together you work in a partnership and you help each other to succeed coming to uh, the Stockholm fintech week which is one of their elements of the whole ecosystem and the reason why Stockholm fintech week exists is because we wanted to create and support the fintech ecosystem in sweden so we created the platform for everyone all the different actors in the financial ecosystem to come into play and share their knowledge that's the core of a fintech week 
So we are a community-driven event, event. That's mean that we are engaging with different individuals which are coming in and share their knowledge. So Gun Fintech we has different vectors uh, where the focus on the specific area of a fintech. There's a rec tech, blockchain, AI, uh, and their intro tech, and furthermore, every year we could come in with a bit of a new twist and bring, for example, the core banking track that we did last this year, or um, bring in our, another track which will stay with us for the rest of the week. That's what happened with combating, combating this dark side of fintech. So it's a living mechanism which is very much based on the knowledge, and we want the industry leaders to come in and share their knowledge. Just a few, uh, few aspects how the Sogon Fintech Week went from a logistical perspective. So as every, every event these days, we had to adapt. So we had a digital event. Uh, usually the Sogon Fintech Week is a full week of, uh, of activities in the city center of Stockholm and different locations. This year we did it for two days, it was online. We had around 85 speakers that shows that we want everybody to be part of the event and the movement, have around 700 different attendees. We had, as I've mentioned, vertical leads, uh, which are we're handling uh, specific tracks uh, as we have time on this time. And we had engagement from 29 countries on different levels coming from the speakers and also attendees. However, very important to mention, that's a very Swedish event. Everything which is discussed um, on Stockholm Fintech Week, it's Swedish focused and of course the Nordic touch. We do of course have a different aspects of their different geographies, but the idea is to force the local innovation and make sure we share the knowledge among each other. There's a few different, a few takeaways that I would like to mention here, uh, which was discussed in different tracks, and it's important to highlight trust since the. Uh, we uh, the Stockholm FinTech Week was in 2021 in February, so we had the possibility to reflect on what has happened in 2020 with the coronavirus, and that the trust is extremely important. Just the fact that a lot of people went online, including unexperienced people, and there were questions how to maintain trust, how to sustain trust, and that's also. Apart from the worries, there's also grief that opportunity to, to open the new businesses, create new opportunities in the fintech space, especially when it comes to digital or identity, for example. However, the, the trust still stays as one of the fundamental part of the industry itself. When it comes to AI online, it's very important to, to consider the usage of the data. So of course there's a lot of data and we are looking at, we are talking from a fintech perspective, which means that there are different um, uh, ways how we work with data and AI as a tool was brought in quite some time so are on the different tracks. As you can see, there's important to have the right, the right data so you can analyze it correctly. And that's also was brought up as a, one of an important topics. However, this year we didn't have AI in our AI as a specific track. We put it into the prospect of having it on all their different factors of a fintech ecosystem or fintech industry as that became as new normal, sort of say. Cloud is an important part um, of development of the ecosystem uh, of the whole financial ecosystem. It is the foundation of a digital transformation. We see that um, a lot of different uh, legacy um, or more traditional type of players are looking or maybe already moving into the cloud. So that's quite an important topic to address, specifically when it comes to the legacy system or the core banking in that sense. They're all of course different regulator um, discussions when it comes to regulatory parts of the cloud and outsourcing of cloud services that were brought up at the discussion. And we had a few different um, uh, important uh, notes there in terms of our EBA guidelines. 
and of course when you are in uh, in 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 a situation where everything is online agility and speed is extremely important and that was also highlighted at the Stockholm fintech week of course, digital transformation with all these different um, movements in the ecosystem where we are already digital. I, I am sure there will be my colleagues in the fintech, specifically in Sweden, highlighting the different way how Sweden is, um, how, what's the state of the Swedish ecosystem now, including cashless society and different digitalization movements and so forth. I would just like to mention that it goes beyond that. We are not standing still. We are still moving and transfer more digital. And that is important to consider that there are a few things that, that are moving and there are a few different um, aspects when it comes to digital finance, that there it is a prioritized question for you that there, that is moving forward and through the crisis of our uh, um after the, uh, the coronavirus and of course the, the APIs and their open banking is still in a hot topic even though it's an ongoing uh, regulatory challenge at the moment. So that is it for me. I try to keep it short. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out or if you're interested to, um, to, have, to ask me a question now, I'm happy to answer. Alex, I really hope your microphone is better this time. So let's check it. <laughs> um, I don't think we're able to hear you, but yes, we do have a question. Do, 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 do you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we do. Okay. So uh, <laughs> it seems that tech is not really the best working for me today. Uh, we actually do have a question, Anna, from uh, Nadezhda. Uh, in the chat and the question is the following uh it's related to the link between the fintech practical realities and the academic concept okay given the expert visibility over the topic what we are um what are the main knowledge gaps where you feel there are more research and academic concepts are needed in order to foster a sustainable growth of eco ecosystems and fintech companies um i would say that's it's very it's it varies from country to country when it comes to um, to sweden so there is not enough when it comes to academia um it's very the fintech industry is very practical so what is needed is a talent as i've mentioned before talent is important so we need to educate people who could go and uh, work and support the financial ecosystem talent is extremely important topic in sweden in terms of uh, growing the businesses the fintech startups and also there is scale-ups however um usually um the academia starts to to do the research depends on um, on the special uh, region and the special request. And I think usually it's it's important to concede that, that the fintech is a very heavily regulated industry, and that's potentially the area that could be uh, a bit of a gap as the, the regulators are a bit far away from a practical size and innovation. So the regulators are a bit behind. So in that sense, if I could highlight, that could be the one area to hook into. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And actually, uh, just to broaden it up, um, thank you for connecting the dots on the key elements of a successful ecosystem. And uh, as I was trying to say earlier, uh, here in uh, Southeastern Europe, uh, we would need to identify some smart strategies to leapfrog into advanced innovation ecosystems with far lower investment costs than those in the EU countries. And my question here would be, uh, which of the trends on building up the ecosystems you've observed and um, uh, implemented, participated in implementation in the EU countries should uh, smaller economies in the southeastern Europe focus more in order to be able to catch up? What do you think about this? I think um, support from a regulator, from a from a government, that could be the fastest way. Um, okay. So you can see a good example of Lithuania, for example, where the the governmental are 
institution took a lead and, get, and provided the very uh, warm climate for all the international investments to come in. So it's extremely important. For example, in Sweden, we don't have that. So most of their success in the Swedish ecosystem, it's a private. So their success stories such as Klaner, IZ, Telebambora, we have Trustly now, Tink as well, which are privately uh, owned companies which succeeded. And there is the, the movement when it comes to pay back to the ecosystem. So they, they initiate different... Um, uh, type of uh, supporting mechanism or arms to support the early stage startups. So I think if the government could support with the different tools such as um, funding or easy up regulations or potentially they could do, um, have the sandbox environment for fintech startups that could be the, the, the best as the easiest one because as mentioned uh, fintech industry itself is heavily regulated. They, the, the companies would have to comply. And if, and that's usually is um, one of the important um, challenge to the early stage startups. They need to comply. And if the regulator is open to, to discuss that, if the regulator is open to potentially help and any guidelines or potentially create sandbox, that would be the fast way. But there is also a way of doing that. This is a, this is a venture capitalist when the VC support the, the ecosystem. They, they do all these different um, initiatives are, are by giving the funds, by creating a different type of uh, ventures. That also could be the way. So it's very much depends on, uh, on, um, on the regional um priorities if the government is not there then the private sector should do um, and the private sector could come from VCs and we see that in the Singapore for example um, as it's a bit further away from either where the VCs push that very hard and then support the, the, their ecosystem and we see foster, fostering there as well. I see that we have a follow-up question you mentioned sandbox and mm. we have a question uh, if fintech sandbox is necessary or not for the ecosystem and stimulation of innovation in, uh, in fintech? Um, it's, it's, it's not necessary, um, but it could be um, a very helpful tool for a few. So, um, so for example, uh, we have sandboxes in UK, in Lithuania, or wherever we don't have a sandbox environment in Sweden. It's been decided not to have it. Um, and then we also see that it didn't stop the, the growth and the success of a fintech ecosystem. However, it could be a supporting element. As, um, as an early stage startup, you usually would, you might not have, as I've mentioned, a very good support from the VC or from the funds. So, you, and the, to gain the license, it's not only their, the funds you put in, in there, it's also the timing. So if there will be a shortcut, more or less, or the possibility to play around and actually see if the, your idea is valuable enough, and that would be good uh, to, from, our, from a perspective to use a sandbox. However, it is not necessary, but that would help. If, if there is a possibility to do it, I would say that would be very helpful for the fintech startups to, to play with it. But you can also do it without it. It just will be harder. Um, I see. I guess we need to think more about this and maybe brainstorm together with all the stakeholders that are involved in order to, to make some conclusions that might work for our country. Um, do you see also, just to, to follow up on what you mentioned, do you see a contribution of open banking and uh, the transformation of the payment systems, um, basically having the future PSD2 implemented in Moldova as a game changer uh, for our country, as it was for Europe, um, as we observe and we can see? I think yes, um, absolutely. Um, so we have the whole company which built their their business on PC2, this Tink, you might have heard of it. So that's 
that's one and there's only there's only one example there's a whole sector of a different fintech startups which were able to to build up the whole business just because of the pg2 so that's also gives a possibility first um, of providing the new business uh, the new services to the consumers and to the banks itself because the banks will serve their consumers better and also it also gives an opportunity for for the local people potentially to join these startups or new businesses and that will also have a very good impact and then pc2 and all open banking goes beyond pc2 so there's we see now all this ecosystem on the platforms such as um um, like connecting everything together with open APIs, and that is where it all goes. Our every every in order to go further in the development of financial ecosystem, from my perspective, there is need to collaborate. And how do you do that? You need to make sure your applications or application of any other uh, third party partners can talk to your application, and that is important. Um, to to be able to serve your customers and uh, that is open banking that goes in even the second wave or even the third one beyond PSG2 so I think it is important too and uh, it goes and it will benefit the, the, the industry itself not only a specific um, cluster of it it will, it will have a very big impact on the whole industry so I would say that's a very important aspect. And we see that, for example, company, oh, sorry, countries which are outside of EU zone, for example, Aust Australia, they also go and adopt BC2 requirement just by themselves. So, and they just do it because they find it valuable, viable and they see that as a potential um, revenue model. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense, and it's important to, to tr stress it out. Uh, we know for sure that we have a plan to have PSD2 implemented in Moldova. Looking forward to, to having it here. Anna, thank you so much for joining and for, ex for your expertise. Uh, we will definitely come back to, to your presentation whenever we we'll make some conclusions and uh, um, yeah, basically find solutions for Moldovan ecosystem to develop. Please stay with us. So you are welcome to stay until the end uh, and uh, maybe also join for uh, Moldovan panelists so to see what the ecosystem is in Moldova. And thank you so much once again for being here with us. Thank you, Maureen. It was a pleasure to have a chat with, uh, with all of you and uh, share my knowledge and expertise. So. Thank you. Um, now we're moving to Tom Holgerson. Tom will be here with us with another expert presentation from the Swedish part. Uh, Tom uh, is uh, important for us because he will uh, he's representing uh, FinTech Hub at FinTech. He's the Director of Innovation, Scale-Up and Expansion at FinTech. Uh, he'll cover a lot about Swedish ecosystem around FinTech, and financial services. Um, we know very well that uh, Sweden is well known for the great fintech development. Everyone knows about Klarna and our fintech uh, communities and companies that were able to, to be developed due to the ecosystem and I would say all the stars aligned in a, in a good um, in a good way. Uh, also, Tom will be able to cover <clears throat> some topics about expansion, um, as well as structured fintech ecosystem, new ways of exploring to financial inclusions that can be utilized by, uh, by the people from all walks of life, from every country on our planet on our planet and in, in every country as well, not only Sweden, but maybe tomorrow in, in Moldova as well. Tom, I'm giving the floor to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Marina. And thank you for having me over here as a uh, speaker. So I'm gonna share my screen here. OK, 
can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, we are able to see it. Super. Uh, now, so I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we do um, here. Tom, uh, no. we can see your QA uh, session open, but we yeah. don't see the presentation. Probably it's your screen. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. Super. Uh, no, so, so first of all, I mean, uh, I think it's super interesting to see that. Uh, that you're interested in, in fintech and I mean the whole fintech space. It's uh, it's it's a fast it's a very fast growing sector and I agree to everything that uh, Anna said in the previous session. I mean I, I know Anna for, for quite some time and we speak the same language. Uh, so just briefly about uh, fintech. That's what we call the Swedish fintech hub. Uh, so this initiative was started uh, last uh, night, two years ago, and uh, the idea was to uh, uh, to develop the, the sector here in, in Sweden, uh, primarily. We could see that there's a lot of, uh, of Swedish fintechs doing really well, uh, like those that uh, Anna mentioned, for example, Klarna, Tink, Trustly. And there are quite a few others, uh, but we didn't see any any real uh, initiative here in uh, from the Swedish side. Uh, as as Anna mentioned, also it's 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 a lot from these sort of private uh, initiatives, but uh, there was sort of like no one uh, helping companies that came from overseas who wanted to know more about how does Sweden work, uh, what's it about? You can see a lot of these successful companies uh, online, on, on media and on te television, but no one actually knew how it works. And uh, from our own background, I, I worked uh, both for the Swedish uh, government's business development agency, Business Sweden in Asia for several years. I also worked for the Irish government as head of FinTech uh, in the Nordic markets. So I can see things from uh, different perspectives. Uh, it's very easy for us in, in Sweden to say that we're doing really well because we have a lot of unicorns. Uh, yeah, that's true. We, we're doing well, but we could see that we could do so much better with uh, a few changes. So we, we're also collaborating with lots of different organizations from around the world. And uh, the whole idea is, is sort of like to build and develop the ecosystem by Sort of sharing knowledge, building networks, and also to collaborate with different stakeholders, not only in Sweden, but also in um, in other countries. So the initiative uh, from FinTech side, the hub, it's a private initiative. We are a non-profit organization, and uh, today we have uh, there are around 400 Swedish FinTech companies, and today we have half of them as members in our network. Uh, so the idea is like we need a way to sort of like communicate between uh, startup institutions and also the regulators. Uh, by doing that, I think we could create a lot of, of uh, business opportunities. Uh, and not only that, because we also can see there's ways to, to find innovation. Because uh, the key to innovation is not just looking at like one specific sector. Uh, you could work with people from retail, from telecom, and you can see there are mutual benefits between the different parties. Because it's it's quite often, I mean, uh, you probably know that if you work in, in banking or a specific industry, you know that industry really well, but you don't know much what's happening outside. And that's where we also see there's uh, lots of opportunities for stakeholders to cooperate. Uh, 
uh, even in a small country like Sweden, only 10 million people, we can see there are lots of things that have been undone. And we try to sort of push the speed of doing that. And we also try to attack, uh, attract other stakeholders and sort of help them with business intelligence to see what's going on in the market, but also to find uh, business opportunities uh, in overseas markets, Europe, Africa, Asia, South America, and, and uh, North America. And we have like, let's say that we have three missions for the hub. Uh, we want to drive innovation and uh, we want to help companies to go from uh, the development stage to, to, to the market. Uh, we also want to attract talent, just like Anna mentioned, and, and build companies. And how are we going to do that? Yeah, we're going to need funding, we're going to need expertise from different people, and we need to build a, a big network with experts, not only in Sweden, but also in, in other countries. Uh, no one can do everything on their own. So the idea with, the, with the building the ecosystem, and, and this is something that uh, you could take as a lesson as well, uh, we, we sort of want to be uh, the spider in, in the web. Uh, collaborating between startups, I mean, big banks, the regulator, support organizations uh, from, from Swedish government, but also from overseas governments. We work with different advisors, all kinds of service providers, academic and research. We have a collaboration now with, uh, with Stockholm School of Economics and also with the Royal School of Technology. But we're also trying to uh, sort of work with, with not only with Stockholm, but also across Sweden. There's a lot of things happening in, in the second large city, Gothenburg, and also in, in Malmö. Uh, and we're trying to capture what's, uh, what's going on, because there's a lot of interesting ideas, but sometimes it's quite easy. You're focused on only one thing. You can easily forget about what's going on in, in uh, sort of in the rest of the country. And another big and important task that we're trying to do we want to work with uh, other hubs around the world and also other uh, agencies because Sweden is, is a small country and we need to sort of like get the international understanding of what we're doing here and it would be easier for us also to promote and to bring uh, these companies to overseas markets. We work very closely with uh, Business Sweden as well uh, where I used to work. And uh, post-COVID, we also will try to do some trade missions. We will go to different countries to see and learn what they're doing. And then uh, events is another thing. We work with uh, a few events, not so much now, mainly online. But uh, on a regular basis, we have a lot of uh, events in Sweden. And we also uh, participate in the big uh, events around the world uh, relating to uh, fintech financial services. And we also work with uh, a network of uh, different investors who want to look at uh, interesting Swedish fintechs and uh, interested in, in investing and helping them. Uh, this is sort of like uh, a little more of a of a map where we can see the uh, uh, I mean where we're sitting. You see like. Finnick, we're in, in the middle of everything. And uh, we're working with I mean, startups, scale ups, the big banks, regulators, government agencies, different kind of advisors. Uh, it's, it's sort of like covering uh, the whole spectrum of uh, those that are interested in, in working with FinTech and to developing the sector. There are lots of, of great initiatives in, in Sweden. And I think that. Uh, uh, I think what's great here, it's, it's, uh, we, we don't really compete, we really try to help each other in, in different ways. Then there's always, I mean, different views of how we want to do things, but we still have the same goal of developing the, the ecosystem. So a bit about FinTech Sweden, you probably 
uh, know a few of these these companies. I think Klarna is the most well known. You've probably heard about Trustly. I settled was acquired by Tink a while back, but uh, these are just like uh, I mean uh, uh, a view of, of, of some of them. There are many, and there are quite a few that uh, could do really really well in 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 the coming years. And I I work with this every day, so I can see that because uh, we, we meet a lot of the teams. And we can see quite quickly uh, which one will do really well and which one that will need to do a lot of changes. And, and that's something that uh, working with this, you, you learn after a while. And it, it's quite interesting because we can give uh, a lot of advice to these different uh, companies. And I mean, a few suggestions here for you guys who thinking of, of, of building um, a hub and f f coming from sort of your own, 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 own country and your own perspective. Uh, this is a few things that uh, I, I, I usually focus on when I want to build something new. Uh, focus on a few verticals and, and try to do that really well. I know there are lots of, of um, hubs and lots of entrepreneurs and companies who want to do many, many things uh, at the same time. And I, I can understand that because it's, it's always fun to think about you want to do everything today. But uh, the experience tells me that it's better to focus on a few things uh, and do that really well, uh, and the rest will come. Uh, I know it's, it's very difficult to do because I'm very impatient as well. I always want things to happen very quickly. But uh, it's better to take a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, and it's important also to cooperate with the experts in the financial industry, that uh, it, it could be like people who work in banking or, or various other industries in, in tech that can give you sort of advice how to sort of build, a, build your tech and also how to uh, elaborate. Because the thing is, if, if you're running a hub and trying to build an ecosystem, it needs to change all the time. What worked three years ago doesn't work today. So you always have to be aware of, of, of big changes in the industry. And that's why you, you need to uh, be in contact on a regular basis with organizations in your own country, but also in, uh, in uh, hubs and organizations from around the world. And also talk to entrepreneurs because they know what they're doing and they have a good network themselves that you, you can utilize as well when uh, you're building your own community and your hub. And, and being a small country like Sweden, it's, it's super important to, from the start, to build uh, an international community. Uh, and that's why I think one of the reasons to why we have a lot of successful uh, Swedish companies, uh, not only in FinTech, but also in tech, because uh, Sweden is very small, 10 million people, so everybody from the start is always looking at expanding to overseas markets. Usually it's the Nordics first because the countries are very similar. And then usually the uh, uh, rest of Europe. And then it's usually the US and uh, certain parts of, of Asia and Asia Pacific uh, that will uh, sort of drive the business. But I must say that uh, yeah, the sector is... is uh, Despite COVID, uh, many of the fintechs are doing um, still exceptionally well, which is a bit surprised to me. Uh, and then also another thing that don't run a lot of large events, because uh, that's a huge time consumer. Uh, I, I've been running lots of big events uh, in, in my previous job. I'm not doing it so much now when I'm here for fintech, but these large events like uh, Money 2020, and, and East Bank, Singapore FinTech Festival, etc. cetera, uh, they take a lot of time. So if you're gonna run any of these big events, you need a lot of support uh, and, and also funding from um, different stakeholders because otherwise it will really take uh, most of your time throughout the year. So instead of doing big events, focus on smaller ones, I'd say. You can attend the big ones, but try to work uh, with small events and try to invite uh, key decision leaders and, and stakeholders. Uh, and the last thing I would say is, is uh, 
think big, but uh, start small. And now if you have any questions, I can take them straight away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat for now, but um, I would have a question to you. You've mentioned so many uh, elements of um, of that um, innovation support infrastructure, right, uh, in your presentation, uh, and uh, a lot of stakeholders. Um, the banks are also a stakeholder. Uh, and I'm curious to know how you would describe the current interaction between the Swedish fintechs and the commercial banks. So how do you see it? Are they growing together through mergers, partnerships, or do the banks prefer to develop their own fintechs as part of this whole ecosystem? Thank you. That's, uh, that's a good, good question. Uh, I think there are... Uh different ways. All the banks uh, are in Sweden are very interested in, in, in the fintech industry and, and what's going on. Uh, so we're in regular contact with them. We're even uh, working with some of them at this moment. But I'd say it's, uh, uh, I think there are different lessons here to be said. Working with a big bank, it's quite time consuming. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, uh, decisions that Needs, needs to be made, and, and it, it depends on sort of I would say the the size of, of the fintech startup and also sort of like uh, where they are in, in the journey. Uh, say for example, uh, there's a fintech that has I mean a great technology, uh, and of course all the banks are always they're very keen on, on getting to know these these uh, startups not only from Sweden but but from around the world. They're looking at a lot of different solutions. So if, if they find uh, it's interesting enough, uh, it's not a big problem for the bank to start to engage with this uh, FinTech startup. Uh, you might run like a, sort of a pilot project first uh, to see what works. And then um, at, at a later stage, uh, they would sort of like uh, engage and even cooperate or even acquire the fintech. It, it, it all depends, but I, I would say that if you're a small startup, you really need to think ahead of you if you want to work with a big bank because it would take a lot of your time. And also if you're going to implement some kind of, of, of software solution, uh, it could lead to that you don't have much time to look at other uh, potential partnerships or customers, so it, 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 it's very much very much up to the fin, fintech itself uh, how they want to do it uh, and sort of how it works. But I, I see that uh, definitely there is a, 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 a sort of like a good environment uh, to sort of start a, a cooperation or sort of like a partnership between uh, the incumbents and, and fintechs. That's the short answer. I don't know if you're happy with that answer. No, <laughs> that's a good answer. Thank you very much. Um, and I will also have uh, somehow connected, uh, but a more uh, more technical question to you, Tom. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, the valuation of the fintech companies, right? There are some key differences between valuing them compared to the conventional businesses. Obviously, it would look at the problem it solves, ability to scale up regionally and or globally, uh, lower the costs um, uh, compared to the, those of the existing financial institutions. What other things are considered when uh, calculating the total addressable market and uh, ultimately evaluating a, a fintech company? I think it, it depends on sort of like the stage of the fintech. Uh, there are of course different ways to, to evaluate that. But uh, uh, what, what I can see, I mean, with, with sort of the fintechs that we are working with, uh, that uh, I think that the three important things is like, you need to have like, I mean, uh, a solid understanding of, of uh, what kind of, of problem you're solving. 
that's the most important thing because I can see a lot of, of fintech startups and there's a lot of, of, of tech people involved and sometimes we don't really have a commercial idea. They really want to build something because they think it's kind of nice and fun. Yeah, that's, that's interesting to do, but no one is going to buy that solution unless you solve something. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, a lot of investors, they also look at the team. The team is, 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 is super important. Uh, do they have uh, sort of like the right mindset of, of building a fintech? Because you know, it's, it's not like a nine to five job. You have to work 24 seven for probably a few years. Uh, so a lot of, of, uh, of the VCs and, and banks, they're looking at, at the team, uh, your academic credentials, what have you done in your previous jobs? Uh, and uh, I, I could see that, uh, that that is very important uh, because if you have a good team, you can quite quickly see how they engage uh, for example, we, we run an accelerator program together with PwC and, and IBM. So we put these companies through a very tough time for almost six months. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's not a, a, a pleasant journey, but it's a tough lesson. And if you, if, if you can uh, sort of go through that program, you will have a lot of knowledge and a lot of lessons that need to be addressed in order for you to succeed. And this is the second year we're running the program, but we did it last year. And uh, we can see now that those companies came through are doing exceptionally well. Uh, so a lot of companies, they need to be ready to, to not only take advice, but also to change uh, their business model. Uh, and and uh, the third thing would be that if, if uh, a bank, for example, wants to engage with a fintech, they're also, also looking at how many customers do you have today? Do you have any paying customers? You know, a lot of fintechs, they don't have any customers at all. They run a lot of pilots, but it means no revenue most of the time. Uh, so it has to do with sort of like the market potential and, and, and sort of where you are. But that's also why it's very important for the VCs and also for the, the big banks to understand the technology. And sometimes they don't really understand it that well. It, it depends. So they have to also have to have a big, good understanding of, of, of that industry. We have, for example, an, an example here is we have some uh, companies working in the gaming industry. And gaming is something I don't know much about at all. But that industry is growing at a tremendous speed. It's just enormous. When you talk to these companies, and if you're looking at all the content on YouTube, one third is just around gaming. And that, you know, esports. It's, it's a big thing, but I think a lot of people hasn't really understood that. And it's growing big, not only here in Europe, but especially in the US and Asia. It's, it's a trillion dollar industry. And a lot of, 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 of VCs hasn't taken that into account yet. But it will come in, in, in a few years. The same with uh, insure tech. It's developing quite quickly, but mainly you hear about successful companies in, in sort of payments like Klarna. Uh, but there, there's, a, there's a new breed of sort of insure tech companies that are coming, and, and that will be sort of the next wave. Uh, that's what I can see. That's, that's a short answer to your question. Many thanks, uh, Tom. And uh, since you mentioned about gaming, maybe we can connect fintech with gaming, and then a new vertical can, can arise, especially now that, <laughs> as you mentioned, gaming is a trillion dollar industry. It's yeah. growing pretty fast um, and probably is one of the industry which is going to be mixed with ours in the future. Yeah, especially I think for a small country like Moldova, I mean, look at what, what you have today, which companies are doing well, you know the teams, then try to help those say 10, 15 companies to do really well. And if you do that really well, you will put, put Moldova on the map and then, I mean, other countries will want to work with you. Other investors will like to see you. I mean, there are lots of great success stories from the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, much smaller than Sweden. But they are ahead of Sweden in, in some respects, definitely ahead of us. Uh, so and even if Sweden is doing well, we also can learn a lot from other countries. 
uh, and also me, I've worked for another country's government, the Irish government. In, in some respects, they are much more advanced than Sweden. So yeah, we have a, a lot of things to learn ourselves also. And it's good that now we have an opportunity to learn from you guys. So maybe in, uh, in some future from now, we'll have our own Klarna. And please do let us know what other advices should we take in order to grow a Klarna at home in our country and have it, you know, on the global map of uh, the IT industry. Yeah, sure. And you feel free to, I mean, connect with me on, on LinkedIn. And you can follow us there, see what, what we're doing from, from the Swedish side. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for making your presentation, for being here with us. Bear with us and stay for as long as, uh, as you can. Uh, I know you have a pretty busy schedule, but please um, be welcome to, to stay with us, to come with any questions and any conclusions or advices. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very and much. Any suggestions would be wel absolutely welcome. Sure. And uh, with this, we are moving to our next speaker, Emil, who is representing QRED, a great example of a fintech company experience focused on uh, convenient and flexible financing for small businesses, which grew in Sweden and expanded to other countries. So Emil will share uh, his experience uh, in developing a fintech company in Sweden, but also will touch upon the challenges and obstacles uh, of the cross-border instant payments, uh, of the new domestic payment schemes, current infrastructure, and future expectations of the development of payment infrastructure. I hope I covered pretty much everything you are planning to cover, Emil. <laughs> the floor is yours. Well, that was a lot of expectations. Thank you for having me on no this pressure. session. And uh, interested to listen to you, Tom. Uh, maybe next time we'll make it to your slide on successful fintech companies. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, Listen, uh, I'm going to try to share my screen now. We'll walk you through a little bit from my experience. Uh, most of all, I just wanted to share with you what, what we experienced over the last couple of years and feel free to ask questions. Uh, so let's see, share screen, that's fine. Okay, so I hope you can see this, right? Great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how we created, how we started CRED and how we built nice scale up, going from zero in revenue to 30 million revenues in five years. Uh, short about myself, uh, I am the founder and uh, the CEO currently acting. Um, I have a background. I really see myself as an engineer. I also studied finance. So good background for going into fintech business. Um, this is really my fourth baby. Uh, I started with telecom. I've been doing investment banking. Previously, I've been doing gaming. And for the last five, six years, I've been working with fintech. Um, so I'm going to start with doing some bragging. Uh, we are Sweden's fastest growing company. And we're the eighth fastest growing company in Europe. Um, have had a phenomenal growth over the last couple of years. And we currently employ a little bit over 100 people, mostly here in, in, in Stockholm, but we also have offices in, in uh, Helsinki and in uh, Riga and Sao Paulo. So we're currently active in six different markets. Um, those would be the Nordic markets, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Benelux, uh, Holland and Belgium, and uh, we recently opened up activities in Brazil. Um, I think the thing we're most proud of are the number of jobs we create. So you all know that jobs aren't created by, by big companies or governments, actually created by small businesses and entrepreneurs like yourself. So now you all want to know how we did this in just five years and with a minimum of funding. And that's what I'm going to tell you about. Um, before we go in and disclose all the secrets, I just want to tell you a little bit more about what we did. Um, we provide small businesses with financing. Uh, it's either through our own balance sheet or we provide it through different banks' balance sheets. Uh, I think when it comes to business lending, it has long been a very tedious process for customers. Uh, you have to handle in 
pages and pages of application of paperwork. It takes a long time before you get a decision. So just doing this digital makes it so much more easy for the customer. Uh, it's a really convenient experience. It's a fast experience. We can screen everything automatically. We can make automated decisions using machine learning. And we can have your money in the account within 24 hours. And most of all, I mean, it has to be smart and you can access everything digitally. So uh, sharing some of my secrets, my, my experience from starting up CRED, uh, I'm going to start from the beginning. What should you potential entrepreneurs think about the idea? Well, I think the biggest problem that that is that entrepreneurs or startup people tend to focus on the solution and not the problem. And you will find the solution. The problem is to actually identify the problem. What problem are you trying to solve? And once you get your focus on that, the solution will kind of come to you. Uh, it's really difficult to come up with a solution just instantly. But if you identify the problem with hard work and persistence, you will find a solution. Um, my second advice is once you find your idea, keep it really narrow. Keep it really focused. I mean, you don't want to solve 10 problems or a huge problem. It's going to be too challenging for you. So just keep it really small and try to solve that little niche or problem. Um, my last advice is to steal with pride. Uh, this is what we did when we started CRIT. Um, I did not invent our product. I found an American company who did this a couple of years ahead of us. And I thought that's a great business idea. Why should I reinvent the wheel when there's already a lot of stuff available? So usually you, want, you find something you think, well, they're onto something. I think I can do this better. I can do it differently, or I can do it in another market. So don't be afraid of stealing. I mean, a lot of the great companies today, they were not first in the market, but they were just better and faster than the competitor. Good. So now you have your idea. And now you're going to do your MVP, your minimum viable product. And why do I think this is so important? Again, especially Swedes tend to over-engineer solutions for problems that don't exist. So you don't know if your idea is good or not until you actually know. And how do you find out? Well, you test it. And my advice to all of you out there is don't overthink it. Just get it done with and do it fast. Uh, don't invest years and years in building something that's perfect. And once you hit the market, you realize this is not what your customer needs. And I will tell you the story when we start. I mean, you might think that our product is super sophisticated. But from we, the time we had the idea and decided this is what we're going to do, it took us two months, two months to get our first customer. Uh, we invested less than... 10,000 euros in our product. We did everything ourselves. Uh, for the customer, it was kind of a digital experience, but the back end, it was all manual. It was a spreadsheet. And a lot of things that we thought was going to be a problem for customers turned out to not be a problem. Things that we didn't think about turned out to be a big issue. The good thing is when you don't have a system, it's really easy to fix. And I do. I strongly encourage you to run your whole business like a big A-B test. Try this and try that. If it works, it's fine. If it doesn't work, go on to the next thing. So just think, be pragmatic about it. And you can have a lot of ideas how it should work, but it's not really until you hit the ground and you start selling your product to your customers that you will actually find out if they understand it, if they like it, and if they're willing to pay for it. And to me, that payment is also important. Like if you're selling a product and they say it's great, but they're not willing to pay for it, 
well, you might find it difficult to actually capitalize on your business model eventually. Uh, so now you have your capital founders, um, you kind of piloted your product and you think it's, it's actually gonna be good. This is the time when you start building your team. And for me, it's, it's about, we're all different individuals and you have to be true to yourself and recognize that we all have our, our flaws and, and weaknesses. And even if we don't have weaknesses, uh, there are things that we don't like to do as much as, as other things. Um, so you have to, in order to be successful, you need a complete team that can do everything. Uh, if you don't like to do accounting, well, you need somebody that's good at accounting. If you don't know how to recruit people, well, you find somebody that's good to recruit people. If you don't know any legal stuff, make sure you have that competence. Um, so really looking at, at the total capability of the team and hire people that don't look exactly like you, but that complement you and that can challenge you. I will just go ahead. I need people around me with integrity that will say stop or say no, it's super important. Um, my experience from hiring is always go for ambition. Ambition beats experience seven days a week. And make sure you have culture. You gotta have a culture fit, even if the person is competent. If there's not a culture fit, it will create more problems that will, than it will be too good. And the third thing is, which I need to remind myself about all the time, I may have a clear vision of where we're going. I may have it all planned out. But if it's only my head, how's the rest of the team gonna know what we're up to? So rather overshare, be really transparent. Uh, don't be afraid of sharing. And I think this goes not only in your organization, but also outside. Share to the world, this is what we're doing. This is what we're at. And it's just gonna create more understanding from all parties, uh, how this is gonna happen. Uh, so now you have your idea, you tested your idea and you started building your team. Next step in your journey would be to go international. And this is actually where I think a lot of companies are a little bit too shy. Uh, if you want to work in the fintech space, you want to have a product that's best in class, maybe even best in the world. And you want to focus on a small segment. You want to address that segment in multiple markets. Um, so just staying in your home market is, is usually not enough if you want to build something really big. And the risk is if you don't go abroad, you don't go international, somebody that's actually bigger than you and have more resources will come into your home market and start competing with you. Um, so really finding that niche and staying true to that niche is I think the success of becoming number one. Uh, my philosophy is I, I wanna go international to really leverage what we have built. Uh, but I don't, at the same time, I don't wanna be in too many markets. Every market I go to, I wanna have a good shot at becoming number one in that market. Uh, it's simply better to be number one in five markets than be number 10 in 50 markets. The beauty of this industry, FinTech, is that the digital models scale very well. That is particularly true within the EU. Although there are a lot of local differences in regulations, uh, we have differences in data available. It's becoming over time more unified. And your digital model, even if you have local discrepancies, um, the platform typically scale very well, allowing you to scale up the business without adding on too much cost. And that in turn will give you profitability so you can invest even more into your products. But that said, uh, our experience from being in, in 
five different European markets and being in Brazil, the local differences can be rather big in what, in mentality, in the kind of data you receive and what you can do and how your product is, 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 is perceived in a different market. Um, but within the EU, I think it's, it's actually more difference within each market than a cross market if you have the same customer segment. Our customer segment, which are small businesses with up to 10 employees, um, a small business owner in Finland tend to look very much like a small business owner in the Netherlands. Um, so in our specific niche, the, the differences aren't that big. But then again, the data you have available in Finland compared to the Netherlands or Brazil do, do make a difference. So that was a short story about uh, my, my advice for you thinking what, what you th should think about doing a scale up. Um, I have been in Moldova myself and I think Moldova is a small country with a young population that's very ambitious and very eager to get out in Europe. So I would like, I would love to hear more from you in the audience, what kind of challenges you have, and maybe I can help you out uh, answering some of the questions. Yep, we actually have two questions. Oh, great, uh, love it. The, audience. Uh, the first one is, which growth crisis has the company encountered and how did you overcome? Okay, growth crisis. Um, our growth has been linear up until March last year. And that's when COVID happened. Uh, and then for the first time, we actually dropped revenue. Um, and to me, it was the benefit of having been an entrepreneur for many years is that you know this is going to happen sooner or later. You don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to happen. Um, and I think if you plan your business right, uh, in, in our case, we have a lot of recurring revenue that just keep flowing in. So although we didn't do a lot of new business, we had all the revenue from the previous business running into the company. But it, it, it was a tough period. It made me really nervous. How, how are we going to survive this? How are we going to find new customers? Are all our customers going to end up in problem not being able to, to serve their loans? Um, so the, it was a big challenge. Um, and I think typically in those situations, you want to you wanna do a little bit too much too soon uh, rather than just staying relaxed. Um, and in our, in our case, it, it was about securing liquidity very fast um, and, and being really cautious on, on the new loans we issued. I think we, looking back, we were too too pessimistic, but it also led us to being able to make it through the second quarter. And then already at the summer, I think we start to see like, what is the, what is the impact going to be of the COVID? And then we could grow, gradually start to release again. Um, so that was like an external crisis that led to this, but you might as well have internal crises. And many times we have realized that we need to to change our business. And I think this is where the agility comes in. You may have a great idea, but you really need to, to tweak your business all the time to find different ways of growing. And that's where the A-B testing comes in. And it's getting trickier the bigger you get. It was much easier in the beginning, but still we, we force ourselves to really challenge ourselves and not sell with what we have, but really trying to find what if we do this? What if we do that? And not only thinking about it, but doing it and actually testing it, tweak it, see what it resulted. Many thanks. Thank you, thank you, uh, Emil. Uh, I I just have a small small issue here. Marina, can you take the second question? And I'll get back to you. You know, yeah. in a minute. We have actually a couple more questions. The second one is, how was the culture born in case of your company? Organizational culture defined initially or the climate uh, that the employees brought in? So basically, yeah. was it from the beginning or 
on, yeah. on its way. Uh, so we did not define a culture when we started. Uh, we had no idea what we were doing. We're two guys in the room and we just, you know, started. And I think this, you tend to, or I've seen a lot of companies spending a lot of time trying to define their culture, but it's, it's something that really happens. And I think that you build a great culture by, by being an example, by leading by example. And in, in our company, it's, 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 I think it's very important that I don't want to have hierarchies in my company. Uh, if there's a problem that needs to be solved in another, in another department, don't talk to your boss who should talk to me and I should talk to the boss in the other department, then somebody do it. Just go directly. And I don't believe in, in like tight descriptions. This is my job description. This is my job. We have a lot of things that need to be done. And it doesn't matter if you're um, CMO or CFO, if the dishwasher is, is full, you need to empty it. Uh, if there's, if, something is broken, we need to fix it. And it's just all those challenging coming up. And, and I try to foster that culture. If I can do that myself, other people will look at me and hopefully do the same. Um, so trying to not be prestigious, trying to be approachable, try to listen to everybody. And then a lot about telling my vision. This is where I think we're going as a company. Therefore, this is important. Uh, but it's, it's also like if you're sitting with a problem as, as an engineer, for example, I want you to find a solution. I can tell you why it's important, but I, I don't know the solution. So really trusting your team to come up with the best solution and telling more the story. Why is this important? Why is this important for us as a company and you as a team? Um, yeah. Yep. I don't know if that was enough about culture. Hopefully, uh, we'll get another question, if not. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, but uh, the next one is a little bit linked with uh, culture. Uh, and it's uh, if and what's your vision for the company for the next 10 years? Oh, wow. Can you share that with us? Yeah. Uh, so I like being an underdog. I like being a rebel. That's where I feel good. And... Right now we have, we have in Sweden, we have four big banks that dominate the market. And it's been like that for, I will argue, uh, centuries. Um, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of small business owners that just get neglected, almost humiliated by the banks. Like if you're running a small uh, uh, pizza restaurant, you will come into the bank and say, well, I need to fix up my place. I need 20,000 euros to do that. They are not very accommodating. Uh, they will look, they will frown upon you. It's like you're not welcome into the fine bank. And that really upsets me. And that's like a force. I want to fix that. I want to help these guys. Those are my people. Uh, so I really want to teach those big banks a lesson. Like you cannot sit in your fancy offices with fancy dresses and not care about your customers. Small so customers also care count um, so right now we're we started with business loans we're going to launch a lot of products just focus on our customer segment and my vision is that we should solve the problem of small businesses not getting the funding they need to create jobs to expand and to grow their own companies that's my vision um, so we're going to continue the path we started uh, we're going to continue to grow in the markets we're at. We're going to add new markets and we're going to add awesome products for small businesses so they can get about their business and do what they're good at. So I think you're on mute. Actually, two questions which are, which are related to Moldova. First of all, uh, first of them is, do you see Moldova as a potential to expanding your country too. Uh, and that was actually the question I was thinking about putting uh -huh. you, although a bit differently wrapped up. And another one, do you see a challenge uh, the underdeveloped capital market in Moldova for fintech uh, as a particularity which might impact uh, the, the decision to get into the market? How would you address this and how can we work to 
develop the capital market here. Right. Uh, so it's been a couple of years since I was in Moldova, but I, I remember it has been a very nice place, fantastic people, very welcoming, but also one of the most underdeveloped economies in terms of GDP. Uh, and there's a big potential for you to change that. And I think the product that I'm offering is not, it, the situation is very similar across markets. I mean, the situation in Sweden is not very different from Moldova. Maybe the amounts are a little bit lower in Moldova, but I am convinced that you have a lot of small businesses that don't get the funding they need. Then what I don't know about Moldova is in, in Sweden and the Nordic countries, data is very accessible. I can find out a lot about your business by just pulling public data. I can also connect to banks and pull uh, bank transactions. I can connect to your accounting system and get your accounting data. And all of that data gives me an advantage. I can feed that into my algorithms and I can make a qualified assessment of your business, allowing me to, to limit the risk or optimize our risk. Um, Concern in new markets is, is, is the data accessible? How digital is, is the economy? I would, I would expect that Moldova actually scores fairly good on the digital part. A lot of the upcoming economies are good. Uh, countries like Germany are a bit behind, I would say. Um, and uh, in the Nordic markets, we have one thing that's well penetrated is, is the use of bank ID. It's an app where you identify yourself as a person. It's secure and it's fast and it's widespread. So that's what I would need to look into. Uh, expanding outside of EU is always challenging because we have GDPR uh, allowing or limiting data to go back and forth. Uh, so unfortunately, it would not be my top choice. Uh, we recently made a, a move towards Brazil, but it's a joint venture. Uh, so we are, I'm licensing the technology to a Brazilian subsidiary or Brazilian company who is using our technology and our know-how to build a, a similar business in Brazil. But it's really managed by a local team uh, with local funding. So I think for me, that would be the business model if, if anything that I would be looking at for in, in Moldova. Uh, but that said, I mean, it's a good business, helping other businesses to grow. And if you can limit the risk, it's actually not bad. And there's a lot of capital out there that's looking for yield. So the trick here is to, to take that, to access the big capital and funnel it down to the smallest businesses where it does the most good. Hopefully, Moldova will also have soon GDPR implemented so companies like yours uh, could extend to, to our market. Uh, you should and... join the club. Welcome to EU. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing uh, that we need to work on. Uh, we do still have one more question mm -hmm. um, related to the NTL rate. Uh, and the question sounds uh, like following, uh, what MPL rate do you have at the moment and how do you automate the recovery process? Okay, that was a very detailed question. Um, so first of all, you need to think, you need to realize that we were engineers, we're not bankers. Bankers try to minimize risk. Engineers try to optimize. Uh, so we, if we didn't take any risk, we wouldn't do any business. Uh, we live with risk all the time. Uh, so we need to find a deal that is good enough for us to, to cap our risk, but that's attractive enough for the customer to actually uh, use our products. Um, although we try to avoid defaults as far as possible, it's an inevitable in this business. As a small business, things happen that you cannot foresee. Maybe you have a good customer that in turn failed to, to pay you and then you're, you're stuck in problem. Uh, so it's really about working with your customers, but sometimes we fail and then we have an NPL or non-performing loan. Um, typically when the customer is a little bit behind, 
we work with the customer. We try to find solutions in the best way possible. Uh, should we fail, uh, we use third parties for NPL, non-performing loans management. Uh, so then it kind of leaves our house. That's, that's something we have outsourced. Uh, and that the process of transferring that receivable from, from our system to, to our partners, that's automated. And then our partners hand it from there. Uh, we we don't have more questions for the audience, but we would like to ask you a question uh, that it's more futuristic, but how do you see the future payment infrastructure uh, in Europe? And maybe uh, your views a little bit about Moldova, since it's, it's not part of European Union, but it could connect to, to the payment infrastructure global one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, we use the PSD2 framework a lot. And in particular, we use it to, to get information, account information services. Uh, so getting real-time banking data is very valuable for us in our, in our analysis of the company. Uh, unfortunately, the, the PSD2 doesn't regulate how the banks should give access to that data. Uh, and it's, it seems like every bank had their own solution, which forces us to use aggregators such as Tink or IA. And there are a couple of more providers of, of aggregating information. Um, but we really think that openness is something we strive for. Uh, we're all about transparency. We want to give the customers the best offer. It should be transparent. And we're all for sharing trans, uh, information. I think everybody will benefit from that. Um, then... PSD2 is still immature. It's a limited set of functionality that you can use. And as I said, it's not, it's not consistent across companies. So it takes a lot of effort for you to integrate a lot of banks. Thank you, Emil. Those were very interesting answers to some interesting questions indeed. But Marina, I believe we need to, to get uh, moving towards the next speaker. Emil, thank you very much for uh, your um, your presentation and the answers. And thank you so uh, we much do for... hope to have you for the next part as well. Maybe come up with some additional suggestions so after you hear the details on the situation in Moldova. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for all the questions. Good luck now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emil, uh, so much. Uh, we are moving towards our next uh, speaker. It's uh, Louise. Uh, Louise uh, is part of the Secretary General of uh, the Swedish FinTech Association that was created in 2017. Um, yeah, Louise has a huge background in regulatory FinTech, being a FinTech expert member of EEC and president of uh, Matskaton. Uh, did I pronounce it uh, right? <laughs> because I think it's a Swedish name, but uh, Luis, you, you'll correct me, please. <laughs> so we are happy to have you here to share your views uh, on uh, FinTech and FinTech development, especially from the perspective of FinTech Association. We understand that uh, Sweden uh, uh, has a voice specifically developed for the FinTech sector. Uh, and uh, this is this is great. Maybe we could take some advice from you in developing our ecosystem. Emil, uh, if you're still here, we have a, sh a short technical uh, problem. If you could help us fix it. I think our team made you a host and we're not able to make changes now. <laughs> okay, uh, let's try to do it later. But before, please, Luis, um, tell us a little bit more about yourself, and we'll be happy to to see uh, what what you have for us. Thank you so much, Marina. Uh, yeah, I will try to share my screen now, but that's not possible. It seems like. Is there something you can do to make me host or something? Yeah, we'll, we'll try to do it in a second. Sorry for this uh, technical difficulty. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but I can start just like, uh, 
present myself and, and a bit about the film tech. So yes, let's do that. Yeah, um, I'm the Secretary General for Swedish FinTech Association, uh, and I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and the Swedish FinTech Association uh, is an industry association which were founded in 2017, um, where some people on different, in different FinTech companies realized there was a need for um, coming together and actually uh, speaking with one voice. Um, so this industry, uh, well, this uh, association was founded by them um, in a very like small format with around 10 companies joining. Uh, but we grew very fast and I was joining the association in 2018. So I've been here for three years now. And we have a board uh, with the uh, excellent persons from different fintech companies. Uh, our chairwoman is Erika Eliasson, and she's also um, vice uh, president of Lendify. She's working for the fintech company Lendify. Um, and let me see. We, nowadays we have 78 uh, member companies. We're growing fast, especially last year where we had had many member applicants that wanted to become a member. And our main purpose is to advocating for a well-functioning FinTech market in Sweden. So we work as a dialogue partner to the Swedish government and also to the different authorities. Um, and uh, yeah, except for that, we do a lot of other things as well. But today I want to talk a bit more about our last report uh, that we launched or released last week. Uh, it's still only in Swedish though, but it's the FinTech report um, 2021. And it will be released in English as well in a few weeks. Um, so I'm happy to share it with you then. Um, Let's see if I can share my screen now. No, I cannot. Because I have some slides, but yeah, I can, I can move on. <laughs> yeah, uh, Louise, can you share maybe the presentation with us and then we'll stream it on, uh, on the screen, just uh, for it uh, yeah, to my email. Sh should I send it to your email? Uh-huh, yep. yeah. And that's gonna help us a lot. Uh... I'll do that very quick. Technicalities always making its <laughs> its face. But yeah, uh, so you said that the FinTech Association was created in 2017. Um, how did it happen that you have already so many companies? Uh, on your board, because uh, in Moldova, we don't have that many entities in FinTech. We have about 70 companies uh, in our association. So it's interesting to, to see how basically grew uh, such a big number in a short uh, period of time. Even though uh, Sweden is small, it's a little bit bigger than us. I still didn't expect that so many FinTech companies uh, to, to be there. Um, yes, we, yeah, I think the interest has grown the last few years. Uh, as I said, we started in like a small scale with around 10 companies. Um, and then the word is spreading. Uh, you're talking to colleagues in other companies and uh, many more companies wanted to join. Um, and especially the last year during 2020, we have been more before we've been more like a dialogue partner, speaking with uh, the authorities and, and the government. But the last year, we've also tried to be active in the debates. Uh, so people have seen us in uh, industry uh, media and in different um, questions that we are uh, lobbying for, I would say. So therefore the interest has been even bigger um, and we get really, um, yeah, the, the interest was big for our report that we released last week. So we've been in, um, yeah, some of the 
one of the biggest magazines in Sweden this week uh, and also yeah media the industry media um, so that's very interesting I've also had some questions from Bloomberg and international media that want to hear more about the Swedish fintech industry but I mean it's very uh, hyped and like hot right now because of Klarna of course but also because of Trustly and yeah those other unicorns that we have uh, we have your presentation in just a minute and uh, we'll be happy to, to share it. Just we'll let us uh, know whenever you want us to, to, to change, to make any changes uh, into the slides. Sorry once again for all this uh, craziness. Um, basically, what we are trying to do is uh, showing uh, how lobby and uh, an association can make changes uh, into the infrastructure in general, not only because uh, in Moldova, we do have a couple of associations trying to, to promote, you know, the development of the sector and uh, the development of ICT companies. Uh, and not only, um, we don't have yet an association for fintech. Then it might happen in the nearest future. We don't know when, uh, when exactly, but uh, this is one of the um, advices that we get from uh, uh, donor community for, from some uh, uh, studies that were, were done specifically for the um, fintech sector, e-commerce development, and uh, how can we move towards that. Okay, I have your presentation ready. I'm sharing it in just a second. Yeah, you can share it and we can go to, yeah, the third slide, I would say. Yep. Okay. Uh, this one, right? Fintech, Fintech in Sweden. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So this year um, we've uh, also had like uh, an agency for uh, growth analysis here in Sweden has done a report um, about the fintech industry in Sweden. I don't know if anyone else has talked about it before me, um, but um, that one also um, yeah, discovered more on how how does the Swedish fintech industry look like? And we got some statistics. Um, so now we know that we have more than 450 companies. Uh, there is more than 10,000 people uh, working in the fintech industry, uh, even more maybe because these numbers are from 2019. Um, and these companies are both working directly to customers, but also um, as partners with banks or other financial institutions. Um, but of course, the fintech companies are tech driven. They're coming up with new innovations and are very important for uh, the digitalization of the society, I would say. Um, yeah, you can move to the next slide. Um, just for you to know, in Moldova, I think we have IT companies about 1,600, 1, and the, the whole um, component of IT is about 17 employees. So it's interesting to see how big the fintech sector is in Sweden compared to ours. Yeah, but hopefully it will grow in Moldova as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, um, what, what's the difference between us and maybe FinTech or um, Stockholm FinTech Week is that we're working more as an, yeah, we're advocating for the FinTech community. And the FinTech uh, sector is a bit different from the rest of the tech sector uh, because it's a highly regulated market. And it should be, of course, um, it's needed. And we think it's very good. But what's the, the hard thing is that the regulatory framework are built from uh, our five big banks that's been around in Sweden for over a hundred years. And there was really a need for digitalization and innovation within the, the, the financial industry. Um, 
But this infrastructure and the regulatory framework belongs in many ways to the big banks, which make it sometimes hard for fintech startups to compete um, and to challenge these banks. Um, I've heard that you talked a bit before about the PSD2 uh, that came around. Um, yeah, it started to, it needed to be implemented in 2018. So we've been working a lot with um, the PSD2 and it really has made a change where it opens up the market and uh, make fintechs or third parts pro providers uh, can use uh, the financial uh, information from the customers. Um, so this is really a regulation that we think have made fintech better and the financial system even better. Um, as mentioned before, we still see some problems in the implementations. Uh, for example, when it comes to how this information are handled, where different banks are giving out the information in, in different ways, uh, the I APIs are used in different ways, uh, which sometimes is taking a lot of time and uh, effort uh, for the third part providers to actually get the information. Uh, and we think that it should be some kind of standardization in Sweden where the banks are using the same APIs that will make it even easier and better for the fintechs, of course. Um, and we also work a lot with the regulators to uh, inform about the industry and to share the knowledge. Because sometimes we see that the regulators uh, don't know how new business models look like and how they work. Um, and sometimes they can be regulated just because of, uh, of that, since the information or the knowledge isn't that big enough. So, that is something that we've been working with. Um, also getting back to the infrastructure, um, which also is a thing that we talk about in our report, uh, is that we see that many fintech companies that are having um, business accounts uh, at the banks, they're getting offboarded. Um, and from the beginning, it's also hard to get your business account because the banks see or can see you as a challenger. And uh, sometimes that could be hard because a lot of the infrastructure are held by the bank. Um, we also have great initiatives in Sweden, uh, such as Swish, which is like a digital payment method where you can uh, pay with your phone to different persons. And there's a lot of people use it in Sweden. I think we have like 3 million people out of 10 million. Um, so they are having some kind of oligopoly um, status when it comes to this. Uh, and we also have the, the, um, the bank ID, which is a digital uh, identity um, verification method. Um, and these two initiatives are very good and has created much more dig digitalization on the market, but they are in one way also owned by the big banks. Um, and we have heard that fintech companies cannot use them uh, in the beginning because uh, the banks wouldn't let them. So sometimes it's very good that we have these different um, actors that are bringing innovation to the market but sometimes it can also be um, practical problems because the infrastructure are so connected to the big banks uh, so this is something that we that we talk about in the report uh, also yeah you can move on to the next slide so in this report uh, we wanted to understand like how have the COVID crisis affect the fintech companies? Um, so we asked them, how have this crisis affected you? And it depends, 53% uh, uh, of our member companies says that uh, this has affected them negatively. Um, but 22% says that it has 
it have had like positive effects. And 25% says neither of them. Um, they are neutral, I would say. Um, and this is very interesting. And we, we, when we ask them like, uh, yeah, what are the negative effects and what are the positive effects? Um, they would say that the negative effects, um, especially for the SMEs or like the startups, is that they uh, have a harder um, time to get the funding, especially when you're in an early stage and uh, the capital market had been a bit cooler during 2020. Um, they would also say that the governmental support that we've had here in Sweden uh, have been mostly uh, focusing on the old industry um, and not so much on a new uh, type of companies, startups, SMEs, um, any new industries. And it's very, uh, if you don't have a collective bargain, uh, it's also harder to, to use some of these uh, support that the governmental have, uh, have released. But on the positive side, uh, many member companies says that since they're already like working uh, digitally, um, it's been easier. And they've also seen um, a bigger interest in the private economy. Uh, by uh, the consumers, uh, which have increased the interest in fintech companies in general. Um, so we don't. We both have like positive and negative sides of, of this um, of the uh, COVID crisis. I would say. Um, yeah, we can take this one. Um, so we're asking a few questions uh, if they're planning to recruit during 2021, uh, and 93% of the company says yes, and only 2% says no, and 5% says, I don't know. Um, so at the same time, we see that uh, the fintech companies are growing. Um, and one challenge that we see um, is to find the right, um, the right talent, especially when it comes to the, come to the tech talent, um, developers and so on. Um, we also see a need for uh, education on, uh, on the, to combine both uh, these technical parts together with the financial parts. For example, in Lithuania, they're having a master in fintech. Uh, we don't have that in Sweden yet. Uh, we're working on it and hopefully uh, maybe Uppsala University or Stockholm School of Economics are looking more into if it would be uh, a good thing to have like a fintech master. Um, and yeah, we also see like different things to do uh, when it comes to to attract talent. And we think that the government could do more to actually um, make it easier for the fintech companies to recruit this talent. Uh, it's, of course, when it comes to taxes, when it comes to how we get the talent to Sweden um, and the different things. Um, yeah, we can move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so why is a FinTech Association needed? I think um, when you look at a uh, well-functioning ecosystem when it comes to fintech, I think you both should have like a fintech hub. You should maybe have like a bigger fintech event as we have in Stockholm. We have the Stockholm Fintech Week. I knew Anna was here before and that's super great. But I also think that you need a fintech association. Maybe not in like the first step, uh, but when you come to the next step, you also need to share the information about the industry and you need to have a dialogue with the government and um, other authorities. Um, and we also see the importance of uh, collecting the community and uh, talk about different topics. Um, for example, we have uh, different working groups under our umbrella. We have working group within uh, uh, crowdfunding uh, that are working with the regulatory questions uh, connected to 
crowdfunding. Uh, we also have um, a group with working with blockchain and crypto. Uh, we are planning to, um, to, to start a new kind of uh, working groups connected to, to the lending companies. And they are working separately with these different parts. Um, and that's also like a very good uh, network for them to meet uh, with the different, uh, it's mostly the people working within legal and compliance, and they can meet people on the other companies that are working with legal and compliance. In the startups, maybe it's only one person working with this question, and it's really hard because it's a lot of regulations. Uh, so you can share uh, the knowledge with each other and you can build a network and we can work together um, with these questions. Um, so, yeah, that's why I would say. Um, I think this was kind of like a, um, a short introduction to the Square FinTech and what we do. Um, but let me know if you have any questions or uh, please reach out to me on social media or email if you have any other questions. And of yeah. course, I would like to share the report with you when we have it in English. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. We actually do have one question uh, from Vladimir. Uh, the question is, what were the main problems to implement PC PSD2 directive? And did it affect the e-commerce? Well, the main uh, problem, I would say, is the thing that I mentioned, um, that the banks and the third-part providers actually sees the regulations in different way and how you integrate, uh, implement it. Um, we have together with the Swedish Bankers Association, um, a working group uh, that's called like the API forum, where we meet like every month. Uh, so the big banks and also the third party providers. And we discuss, discuss the APIs and how they can be more like harmonized. Uh, from the beginning, it started in 2018, and uh, that we hoped for, like, to get some kind of uh, standardization when it comes to the APIs. But unfortunately, we see like the regulations in such different ways, so that hasn't haven't happened. <clears throat> and when we uh, brings up these questions, um, the banks are relying on well, we are still um, best in the implementation uh, in the rest of the EU. So um, compared to the other banks in Europe, they have, uh, <clears throat> sorry, um, they think that their implementation is much better. Um, but it's still like the APIs are too, yeah, this, the technical standard isn't good enough. So it takes a lot of time to, to use them and sometimes it's very complicated and it, it's different from banks to banks. Uh, so we would see, we would like to see some kind of standardization. And the other question was about e-commerce and <coughs> I don't know ex um, about that example actually, so. Okay, okay, uh, good. So you've um, actually related to, to the previous question, uh, the National Bank of Moldova initiated the process of transposition of PSD2 directive as it was PSD2 directive as it was mentioned uh, also before. Um, and uh, um, we are now thinking about the challenges uh, which could be considered uh, in the transposition process, but also further in the implementation process. You've mentioned some of them uh, I'm not sure you have anything else you could mention what Moldova could learn from in terms of the implementation of the directive. And if not, we can go to the next question. Um, <clears throat> I don't know exactly how it works in Moldavia right now, but for, for example, in Sweden, before we had like the PC2 or it was implemented, um, some of the TPT, TPPs were still um, scraping the information. So it, they did it in another way, but because of the PSD2, um, it became more, uh, yeah, more secure in how they were supposed to do it. So the transformation uh, was pretty smooth, I would say. Um, 
And I don't know how it works in, in Moldavia, if you can screen scraping the information now, or if you're not uh, allowed to do that. Um, yeah, well, uh, let's not get into it too much because we are very, very uh, <laughs> close to, to the end of our current session. But a last question, although uh, not least as important, uh, if you could elaborate a bit more on how um, how the fintechs uh, in Sweden have been impacted by the pandemic. Mm. It was touched upon uh, mm. by some other speakers. Uh, and I recall a mentioning saying that they've done, uh, some of them they've done pretty well, even if it was not expected. So uh, if you can provide a bit more details on this. Yeah, um, as I said before, we have the statistics that says that, yeah, 22% have a positive effects of the pandemic and, yeah, what was it? 53% have a negative effects. Um, and, yeah, I think I talked a bit about that. Do you want me to describe it even more? No, 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 no. no. I, 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 think, I think I was having my, uh, again, my technical issue at that point, so I've missed that. But we... We do have, we have uh, a question in the chat. A question from Vitaly in the chat, yes. And it says how the different players, uh, banks and fintechs, are seeing each other as competitors or as partners. Um, yeah, I would say both. Um, I mean, some of the fintechs are are making their products or their services for the banks. So they are, um, yeah, collaborating in, in a big part. Um, but some of the fintechs, uh, I would say, are more of competitors. And um, it's very, for us, uh, sometimes we see us as a competitor to the Swedish Bankers Association, uh, but sometimes we think the same. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, it's really different, but we, of course, we try to have a dialogue and we're, uh, yeah, we're relying on each other. So we need to work together to get the, the financial system in Sweden even better. Um, yeah, so I would say both. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Marina, will you do the honors? Many thanks, Alex, and uh, thank you, Louise, so much. Basically, with you, we are concluding the Swedish part of our event, and we are moving slowly to Moldovan one. Um, yeah, it was uh, interesting to follow first how an association is bringing the voice of the fintech industry uh, in Sweden, as well as learning more about the bank's uh, sense, where fintech uh, is, where the banking sector is, as well as the effects of the pandemic on uh, the sector. We really appreciate your contribution. Looking forward to the report, whenever it's published in English, we will be um, uh, sharing it with our community as well, uh, because uh, some, some companies are getting started in the FinTech area, including in Moldova. It might be good for, for them to learn more about uh, your activities. Many thanks once again, and maybe see you next uh, during next event in Moldova. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. We are now basically concluding. Alex, do you want to uh, put a conclusion <laughs> to this panel and then we'll come back for later on, so stay with us. Yeah, well, indeed, we will be coming back with, uh, with some um, um, takeaways from uh, this session, from the first session today, and we will be summarizing a bit what what are the key lessons learned um, later on but indeed it is uh, overall it is a very interesting experience we have been hearing today from our speakers and uh, we have uh, a lot to learn from uh, some things are ahead of what moldova can do as as for now and we will hear more on that in the upcoming session of course but also there are things which can be already implemented using the, the Swedish experience and not only Swedish, but uh, rather regional experience our colleagues have presented to us. So uh, looking forward to the, to the conclusion session when we will uh, summarize those and, uh, and uh, see how they fit together with the, with the Moldovan track. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, as I mentioned, we're moving towards World Open Panels and uh, we'll be uh, next to me. I'll have a co-moderator, uh, Vitaly Tarle. Uh, he's the digital advisor to the Economic Council from EBRD. So happy to have you here as a co-host uh, of the second part of the event. Uh, let's, uh, let's get it started. Thank you, Marina. Uh, thank you, everybody. It was uh, very nice. Uh, part of the day, hope to continue, um, we'll continue in the same uh, wave afternoon. Uh, it was a great introduction from the north uh, side of the continent, so now we are moving to, to the south, uh, where uh, uh, there are also some important uh, information to share to, uh, to share to the entire community, to the people interested in uh, fintech development uh, in, in Moldova. And of course, uh, who is better positioned uh, in, in regard to uh, present the key focus areas in the development of electronic payments in Moldova? Of course, this is uh, National Bank of Moldova. Uh, and we have here with us uh, Mrs. Natalia Tsurkanutianu. Uh, Natalia is uh, working for uh, National, uh, National Bank of Moldova as a Deputy Director of uh, the Payment Systems Department. Uh, Natalia has a great career, a stable career uh, in the National Bank. Uh, she actually is the uh, uh, interface of uh, National Bank of Moldova in interacting with the uh, Economic Council, in uh, interacting with uh, the community. Uh, she knows very well how we evolved to the roadmap, to the, the issues raised by the, the roadmap for digital economy. I mean, and she knows uh, very well the expectation of the market. So Natalia, please let us know uh, what we do not know yet and, uh, and, uh, and what will follow new for, for Moldova FinTech community. Thank you. Hello, uh, dear colleagues and uh, friends. Uh, <clears throat> do you hear me? Yes. Yep. OK. Uh, let me share my uh, presentation. Do you see the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Marina, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well and we can see your presentation. So everything is set. Natalia, you can hear us? Okay. Give us a second. I think Natalia does, is not able to hear us because we, we can and we can see the presentation. So I'll make sure she, she understands that. Right. Natalia? Yeah. Da, nu nu vă aud. Ok, încerc să prezint, dar o să-mi fie greu dacă nu o să vă aud, că nu o să... Ok. Ok, Natalia is not able to hear us, but we will be able to hear her in a while, so um, later on, whenever we we'll get to the Q&A session, we'll make sure she, she can hear us in a way or not. So let's get started. So, uh, I'm happy to take part in this event and thank you, Marina, for the invitation. 
Uh, let me introduce the topic that I, I would like to speak about today, and I hope it will be useful and interesting information for you. I will speak about the National Bank of Moldova's future projects in the domain of electronic payments. According to practice, payments usually take one of the greatest parts of uh, fintech, which uh, ultimately forms a, uh, a larger area of the financial services as a whole. This is the first reason why we need to address payments, but also because we don't have an overall uh, coverage of fintech and must admit that at the moment we don't have a clear regulatory framework uh, for fintech activity, except the activity related to payment service providers. Speaking about payments related to fintech, we also must admit that the market is quite developed, mainly referring to the non-banking sector. This uh, needs to be addressed by taking certain measures through implementing new projects regarding the regulatory framework and infrastructure. Thus, taking into account the overall conditions and the maturity level of the payment market in the Republic of Moldova, the following projects in the field of payments have been started at the NBM is working on. Payment Service Directive 2, modernization of local clearing settlement system and instant payment. The National Bank of Moldova as a central bank has the following attributions in the field of electronic payments, namely establishing licensing, regulating, supervising the financial market infrastructures and promoting their stability and efficiency. So here are represented the components of the electronic payment markets. It consists of the local interbank payment system, so-called SAPI, which is operated by the National Bank of Moldova and on the other hand, the payment service providers. At the moment on the market operates 11 banks and seven non-banking entities which provide payment services, five uh, out of which is issue electronic um, money. This number of service providers already promote a healthy competition, uh, which was one of the main objectives of PCJ1. However, the competition is reduced due to the fact that the payment operations initiated by the non-bank providers are performed through the bank circuit. The lack of a direct final uh, settlement for the non-bank providers generated a dependency of the non-banking service providers on the bank's operations. To address this issue, in 2019, NBM has granted access for the non-banking service provider to SAPI. As you all know, at the European Union level, the payments market has uh, migrated from the transposition of the PSD1 to PSD2, also uh, named the migration from traditional banking to open banking. This process will take place also on the payments market from the Republic of Moldova, because the National Bank of Moldova currently works in this direction. Specifically, we are working on the transposition of PSD two into the national law on payment services and electronic money. It is important to mention that at the moment, the PSD2 transposition project is close to the final uh, phase of adoption. PSD2 comes with the rules for new types of services which don't involve being in possessions of funds and these services are probably the most interesting for new fintechs and startups in the payments industry. We are talking about payment initiation services and account information services. Even though there are no restrictions for these services to be provided right now, the infrastructure and the lack of rules from our understanding are serious impediments in making this happen on a large scale. New provisions are the fact that these providers will be registered or licensed, will bring trust and clarity in this matter. For making this happen, we must be realistic and understand that there is a need for involvement and dedication 
not from uh, not only from regulator side but also from the account service providers other payment service providers and third parties involved european experience tell us that it is not as easy to make a shift or a change when there is no coordination and cooperation among all participants as a regulator we have hope and we are working on the possibilities to have this cooperation and coordination. After the PSD2 transposition project will be approved by the parliament, uh, the National Bank of Moldova uh, will uh, proceed to the second stage of the project, namely the adoption of the PSD2 secondary normative acts that consists of regulatory technical standards and guidelines. Further, I will speak about the modernization of the payment infrastructure project, which includes automated interbank payment system modernization and implementation of instant payment scheme. The main components of the SAPI modernization project refer to the increase of the payment processing efficiency, starting from the receipt of the payment order until the final settlement by ensuring an even higher level of automation through implementing the automated STP mechanism. Another goal is to increase the interoperability of the system with other systems and clearing houses by changing the message formats to XML standard and implementation of a statistics module to help a more complex, more exhaustive analysis of data, which will also enhance traceability. As you may know already, instant payments are electronic retail payments that are proceed, uh, proceed in uh, real time, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where the funds are made immediately, are made av uh, available immediately to the recipient. Currently, the National Bank of Moldova is also working on the implementation of instant payments in the Republic of Moldova. Thus, in order to implement such a payment scheme, the NBM uh, developed the concept of the project, also the functional requirements and technical documentation on the software solution for instant payments have been developed. Currently, we are on the standard stage of the project. Who are the beneficiaries of the instant payments? Instant payments, we uh, allow everyone to integrate easily in any um, uh, economic and um, commercial uh, relations that are developing in a very fast manner and are demanding faster services, products and solutions. We are expecting that everyone will use uh, of instant payments, which will allow customers or any individuals to perform payments that need to get to the beneficiary immediately in order to avoid delay costs or penalties. We are expecting that companies will benefit from instant payments since they will receive the financial means without delay, reducing their liquidity risk. We expect that payment service providers like banks and non-banking providers will benefit through offering these services to their clients, creating this way new products around this services. We also expect that central and local authorities will benefit from instant payments by integrating this service in any government platform that involves financial interaction with citizens and taxpayers. At the end, I would like to congratulate IT for organizing such a great event. It was an honor to be one of the today's speakers. We do uh, believe uh, that such events are really helpful for all the involved actors, both the public, the beneficiaries and the providers. We as regulators uh, are always open for, for collaboration with all involved actors, the current payment service providers and the potential providers, and we are ready to analyze any proposals from the market. You have my contact details on uh, this slide. Please do not hesitate to contact me. 
Have a great day ahead. I see you soon. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you for a uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation and updates uh, on, uh, on how we're evolving. Of course, harmonizing the internal legislation uh, with uh, EU legislation, EU rules uh, for electronic payments, it uh, is a great uh, uh, movement and uh, it will help us to integrate uh, our country better into EU market. Uh, and the, the, the uh, most important thing is uh, that uh, this new regulation takes into account the uh, emerging and innovative payment services such as internet and mobile payments and it will, very, uh, uh, it will be very helpful for, for Moldova to um, uh, evolve in uh, the direction of uh, e-commerce and e-economy uh, being one of the most uh, important uh, infrastructure element. I mean, electronic payments infrastructure, uh, which uh, have to be developed uh, here in Moldova and FinTech community is uh, the main player in that regard, which needs, of course, this kind of events, needs uh, more guidance and support in, uh, in uh, connecting to the world and uh, helping uh, uh, Moldovan customers to get connected uh, in, uh, uh, into uh, new uh, uh, economy model. Thank you, Natalia. Forward, if oh, I see a question here, uh, or no, it's just a comment. Uh, okay, guys, Natalia, thank you very much. Uh, My pleasure. So. Uh, According to our agenda, uh, we have to move uh, forward uh, on uh, opportunities and trends in fintech, open banking, and uh, crowdfunding. Uh, Marina, uh, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. I just spotlighted yeah. you, and this is why <laughs> you're not able to see me. But yes, it's... I'm here in the background. Okay, uh, great. So, uh, uh, Having uh, the next session ahead, um, I would like to, to present Dumitru Cioric. Um, Dumitru uh, is, um, I, I would try to, to put forward uh, first. Uh, Vitalia, sorry for interrupting, yeah. but we're, we're getting started with Karina first. Uh, she she has a pretty tight schedule, and we uh, Karina is uh, here with us, I think, should be here with us already. So um, we, we invited her to join. Hi, Karina. Are you connected? Is everything here? I, am, uh, I just need to share my screen. Yeah, and I'll try to make it quick. Um, uh, in between, in between, I will uh, give some introduction. Karina uh, Dogger is an analyst, young analyst at uh, Norfico. Uh, actually, um, it's a, it's a great example of how uh, our young uh, talents uh, um, uh, succeeding abroad. Uh, Karina is. Uh, working in, uh, in uh, Denmark, in Copenhagen, and is uh, interested in uh, fintech, blockchain, and would, it would be great to, to see a perspective from outside, from uh, our um, uh, nationals. So, Corina, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to try and share my screen, which uh, I'm not sure. Um, if someone, oh, yeah, okay, got it. So, can everyone see now? The presentation. Yeah, we see it and we hear it. That's perfect. So I'm going to quickly touch upon digital identity, what it is, and how Nordic countries use electronic IDs. I'm pretty sure um, having some people from Sweden in the audience, they probably use their own bank IDs in Sweden as well. So I will try and give a really um, clear introduction on how EIDs were implemented in Nordic. So um, first of all, I think we have to think about this question. What is your digital identity? What, what does it actually represent? Um, basically, the digital identity, let's say theoretically, is a set of attributes related to an entity, but more simply put, is everything that you are across the different networks and the different websites. So if you look at, sorry, if you look at, for instance, 
your bank account online, um, your school. Right now, almost everyone uses, you know, can access their school um, online, your Facebook account, what the police knows about you online and so on. So this is all about your identity online, right? And right now, I think the biggest struggle is the fact that all of these different entities, so the bank, your doctor, the school, Facebook, and everything, everyone else, they have different kinds of information about you and they're not interconnected in any way. So for them, for every single website that you access, you have a different, different identity, which is in reality not very true because when you go to the store, you're not a different person. And when you go to the doctor, you're not a different person. You're one entity, you're the same person. So this is sort of the big problem about our digital identities. Um, and that leads us, we're gonna go back to sort of the problem with um, your identity online. But in order to get there, we need to ask ourselves, what is trust in our society? And do we actually need trust in any way at all? And when do we know that trust is actually not needed? So in order to think about this, I'm going to give an example. Um, and later you're gonna understand how is this even related to open banking at all. So we have identification, we have verification, and then we have authentication. These are very different things actually. Um, and here's the example, think of when you go to a club or you wanna buy a drink. Um, in order to prove, so the thing is you have to prove that you're over 18 years old, right? Depending on the country. Um, in order to prove that you're over 18, you have to show your ID. And the thing is, the ID itself, it has a lot more information about you. So it shows the birthday, it shows where, where were you born, what's your name, maybe address, depending on the country again, right? But the bartender only needs to know if you're over 18 or not. They don't care who you are. They don't care, are you 60, are you 70, are you 30 years old? They just give you access depending on yes or no, is she over 18 or not? So this shows us sort of the problem um, and, and, and draws the line between identification, verification and authentication because identification is can be used, for instance, not it's it's actually used when opening a bank account. And identification is all about the question, who are you, right? Um, when you yeah, when you open a bank account, when you um, move your doctor, when you go to the police, you try to get your criminal record and so on. When you start a new job, it's all about who are you, um, and. For this reason, you need to submit certain documents. Um, you need to have a birth certificate, some proof, a passport, marital status, all of these things. Um, verification is about showing this proof or submitting it either in person or online. So your work contract and so on. And this is the very important step during um, KYC screening, credit scoring and anti-money laundering techniques, right? Uh, and then the last thing is authentication, which is actually the thing that we use the most nowadays because authentication is all about logging in, for instance, back to your um, bank account. And it actually answers the question, are you the person who you claim to be? So now let's say you opened an investment account. You said, okay, my name is Corina. This is who I am and this is the proof. Uh, this is my ID and my work contract, my income, my tax card, everything else, my passport. Uh, you go through all the verification. Um, let's say you show your driver's license if you want to borrow a car, if you go abroad, for instance. Um, so they do all of this screening. They check um, if the driver's license is valid and so on. And then in order to use the services again and again and again, which is very common for, uh, for bank accounts because you definitely log into your bank account quite frequently, right? That this is where we need authentication. And going back to the trust issue, the, the, the question is, do we actually need trust in this sense? Because um, if we think of, you know, manual, 
um, or traditional ID verification or authentication techniques. You don't need to go to the bank every single time you want to make a transfer and show your face and prove that you are who you are. Because first of all, it's less secure. Um, it's manual. It takes a lot of time. It's subjective. And it's also trust-based because somebody, a, a human being is uh, seeing you and is comparing you know, your face, for instance, with your, um, with your ID picture. And then they think, okay, is this the same person on the ID picture or not? When, if you automate things, if you include, for instance, machine learning or AI, it's not only more time efficient, it's also a lot less costly. If you think about it um, in a bank, for instance, for an organization or for a bank, if you have the employees to do all the KYC and screening and everything manually, it takes days. Um, and you have to pay those people not by the amount of cases they have screened, but by the, uh, by the amount of hours that they worked. So this is not very cost efficient, right? And also, you know, if, uh, if we talk about authentication online that goes manually and so on, and the general uh, traditional ID verification, it can be easily exposed, exposed to hacks uh, and identity theft. Yeah. So here is to draw a clear difference between the traditional ID and the electronic ID. Um, I think this illustration is pretty good. It shows that in the electronic ID case, all we need is the government issued EID and just access to the internet, that's it. And then from there, you can access all the different platforms um, put in all together that have certain pieces of data about you depending on the context. So for instance, your doctor has all of your medical prescriptions and um, medical information, and it's out there on the EID, but the police, for instance, doesn't have the same access to this data, but it's still on the cloud. So, uh, and in traditional identification, you need several physical documents. For instance, when you go to your doctor, you have to bring the medical book with you. Um, when you go to school, you have your student card or at work, you have your employee card for authentication and so on. Or for different kinds of loans and, you know, loan schemes, uh, you have to bring passport, ID card and so on. Um, the second thing that it requires very often, and I think in Moldova uh, is very popular as well, is in-person identification. Um, so you cannot open a bank account online, you have to go there and someone has to see you physically, which again has proven to be less cost efficient than time efficient. And then the third thing is several credential combinations. So for each of these accounts, let's say they're all online, but for each of them you have a username and a password uh, that was generated by you, which is usually not very strong, let's be honest. All of us, most of us don't have very strong passwords. So that puts up us, you know, again, in the front line exposed to hacks. Um, and then quickly about the, the electronic ID in the Nordics. Um, so here's a little bit, sort of a timeline of when they were implemented in the Nordics. but. It, this is only the Nordics, actually in Belgium, you have the ID. Um, Baltic countries um, use electronic IDs, have been using them for some time already. Um, so yeah. And what I found actually something really interesting is the Nordic Baltic EID project that was initiated in 2018 to make it easier because there are so many people who commute or for instance, you are Swedish and you work in Estonia or you're a Norwegian and you go study in Denmark and so on. So for, for the citizens across these countries to be easier to um, you know, uh, send out or automate the information transfer. For example, yeah, the medical information, financial information, tax card, and so on. Uh, they have created this initiative so that you don't have to do all these things manually. So that when you move to another country and you have, for instance, an Estonian ID, then it's gonna be a lot easier for you to make the whole transition. And you don't have to bring all the paperwork, you don't have to bring your birth certificate from home and so on. So yeah, that makes things a lot easier. Um, and then just to quickly touch upon the main EID features, sort of, um, yeah, make a conclusion uh, overall. 
it's all about automation. It's all about user friendliness. Um, it's easier to access fast, secure and digital. And what's very important is that one of the first EIP features is electronic, sign uh, electronic signing, which again, makes things so much easier for everything that you're doing in your daily life. For instance, when you file your taxes and so on, right? Um, you can quickly and easily register for appointments and events, for instance, make an appointment with your doctor. Uh, you can easily open and access your bank account. You don't have to go for KYC, uh, um, for three days, you know, wait for the whole process for every single account that you open once you're already identified and verified by a third party. Um, and also everything is just a lot more secure, the whole verification, right? Especially with, with PSD2, there is two fact factor authentication in force. And well, we're not, we don't have the time to go through um, the PSD2 requirements, but basically, all of these layers make electronic ID very user friendly and very secure um, compared to having all of your documents stored in a safe or you know under the pillow at home and so on. So um, to give a clear example of how it works, here is the Danish NEM ID. Of course, I picked it because I know how to use it. I've been using it. So basically, the Danish NEM ID is not the same as an ID card. So you cannot use it to travel um, to another country, for instance. But it has over, um, if you can see the yellow card over there. So the yellow card, it has a long number. It's called a CPR number, which basically is um, your birthday and also four other assigned digits, right? And this CPR number is directly linked to all of your information across the different platforms. So if you look up at the public services, you have Sunhead, which is um, like the national website where you can get prescriptions, you can check out all the medications, uh, you can make appointments, you can read about health authorities and so on. Borget.dk is um, another tool used by citizens where I can, for instance, out of very easily in five minutes change my address and I don't have to go anywhere to anyone's office. SCAT is the tax authorities and eBox is actually, I think, a very ingenious thing. Um, is a platform where I can communicate through encrypted messages with, the, with all those authorities. So for instance, if I call the police and say, um, I need a copy of my criminal record um, because I'm getting a new job soon, then they're going to say, okay, and in five minutes I get it on eBox. So I don't have to go anywhere or sign anything, right? And the best part is that you can access, and of course, the financial institutions uh, and banks, such as Nordia or Danske Bank. And the best part about this is that you can uh, use this NEM ID easily online, either. So over here in a box, you can see NEM ID, you have these credentials. You can pick your own credentials. You have two or three types of uh, different types of credentials. Um, I think maybe you can see that it says you either put in the NEM ID number, the CPR number, or a credential that you use, um, that you picked yourself, so a username. Um, and how it works is basically you put in those credentials to log into anything, let's say your bank account. Um, then you have either down on the left side, you can see an, a card, it's called a key card, and it's issued to you um, the moment you create your name ID. And you have all of these keys and they are unique and no one can access them, no one knows the combination. So if you get prompted, for instance, the first one is um, the name ID asks you for 6252 and then you see the key for it and you put it in. But this is the more manual thing. Uh, Part. Um, the more um, automated part, which I personally always use, is I, I go through the two-factor authentication, so I put in my credentials, and then it prompts me to the app on my phone. And then there I have the second layer where I use my face ID to unlock the, of course, to unlock the phone, and then afterwards to unlock the NEM ID app, and then I can sort of verify that it was me who tried to sign into my bank account. I know it all sounds like a very long process, but it's actually um, five times easier than, than any other way of logging in that I've tried before, to be honest. So yeah, 
Um, and here is also a quick um, use case example um, of how NEMID is used in open banking. So for instance, if you move to a new apartment, you have to pay rent. I don't know if, why I picked 2000 euros, but <laughs> um, so, you can use a third party in Denmark called Betailing Service, uh, where they connect they connect to the bank API. They use your identification. They they are also identified by the bank as a separate company, so as a third party and a financial um, services third party. And this all happens literally within a few minutes. And through this whole service, you can easily automate uh, and send. So um, Betailing Service just makes sure that every month, for instance, on the first um, day of the every month, um, you get 2,000 euros withdrawn from your bank account to the landlord directly. So that, that solves a lot of problems. Yeah, and this is my presentation. Um, I, I, I think I have time for a question, if anyone has any. Thank you. Yes, Karina, there is a question for you, and uh, this is uh, um, regarding who is issuing the name ID uh, in Denmark. It's the, it's the government. They are all government issued. Uh, uh, Corina, you, you brought a very uh, interesting uh, perspective and uh, uh, the key point in your presentation is that the services uh, are deciding everything. Even we are using here in Moldova the uh, IDNP for about 25 years, it's already boring to talk about that. The services and digital literacy are crucial. So somebody was trying nowadays to convince me that uh, things are evolving very fast in, uh, in developing these services here in Moldova. No, the services are critical and we are evolving very, very uh, slow in this regard. Even having a great e-identity uh, management uh, here in Moldova, mobile signature and so on and so on. Corina, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to run. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Corina, once again. We are moving towards our next uh, panelist. It's Vasily Valkov. You've met him um, a little bit earlier. He was uh, he is the president of the FinTech Committee within Attic. Um, he, as you all remember, probably, uh, we created this committee one year ago. Um, he's working for Saltage. Um, Saltage is a company um, which has a technical team in Moldova, and probably Vasilia will tell you more details about this. They are specialized in fintech, working with a lot of banks around Europe. Um, they do not have yet any products on Moldovan market, maybe uh, never will, but you never know. We, we are still uh, hoping that you guys come to Moldovan market as well, once AZ2 is implemented uh, here. Uh, Vasilia, I'm giving the floor to you. Yeah, thanks, Marina. Uh, hello, everyone, again. It's good to be back, although I uh, have been present for the other sessions and listened to, to the speakers. Uh, I'm actually also glad that I heard PSD2 and Open Banking mentioned by uh, everyone. So uh, when preparing the presentation, I was thinking to ask you know, the participants, like how many of you are familiar with this? But uh, it doesn't make any sense right now, as all of you have heard about it. So um, I'll just move to... Okay, Marina uh, is asking yeah, the we question. Launched it. Yeah, but okay, so those of you who are familiar before today, uh, maybe let's rephrase it like that. Okay, 82% have been nice, 85, 90%, so almost everyone. Okay, so uh, for, for uh, the presentation, what I have prepared is. Okay, We'll talk about open banking again. I'll try to give you the perspective we have here at Saltage. Uh, introduce the ecosystem players. You know, in other sessions, you've seen the uh, FinTech ecosystem. I will focus on open banking, show you some use cases uh, in different areas, and then uh, highlight some benefits and trends uh, that we see uh, around the globe. Mm -hmm. So why talk about open banking? Well, naturally, Saltage is an open banking provider, so we're a fintech and um, 
actually today we're celebrating eight years since uh, our uh, company was founded exactly to this day and as we speak uh, about a hundred of our of my colleagues are celebrating in a virtual zoom meeting uh, next door uh, we can say it like that um, and uh, although the company was founded in canada we have a very strong link to moldova so our ceo and uh, one of the co-founders is from moldova and uh, a big part of our operations is uh, headquartered here and the development team are also here. Although we have uh, went beyond Canada and Moldova, we have offices in, in London, in Milan, in Bucharest, and we have big plans to expand uh, this year. Um, our mission is actually to build uh, what uh, we like to say the most convenient, secure and effective uh, open finance ecosystem uh, or network because uh, open banking is at the base of it, but uh, as we'll see later, uh, it's moving now towards a, a different level. Uh, initially, open banking is uh, a concept, but uh, it's actually a movement right now uh, in many countries around the world. Uh, it's also a regulation in the European Union and a few other countries. Uh, in EU, for example, it started in uh, 2015 with the Revised Payment Service Directive, or PSD2. As you've heard about it today, uh, but its actual implementation started a bit later in uh, 2018 and then uh, 2019 and even this year, um, many banks are uh, trying to catch up and uh, be compliant with PSD2. My personal experience with uh, open banking was uh, two years before I joined Soltage, which, which was three years ago, so let's say five years ago. Um, I had a need to better understand my finances and those of my family. Uh, to better manage it, to, to be able to make some savings or uh, even investment. So I was looking for an app to help me because, you know, the, the banking applications were not providing any uh, services like that. And that's what, when I was exposed to open banking, as the application I was using allowed me to connect my bank accounts, uh, several of them in one place. I could have a financial overview of my life and see the transactions, uh, you know, mine, my wife's, uh, and then also do some bad budgeting around it. So at Saltage, we believe that anyone has the right to access their financial accounts, bank accounts or others via any app and receive the best service available on the market. And, you know, FinTech exists and has been around for tens of years now uh, to cover or, or meet some gaps uh, uh, that banks uh, don't see, don't provide. And there are a lot of innovative services and they still appear, I could say, on a daily basis. And then managing and moving money is also a right for all, and open banking is a big facilitator in this. Uh, so it's about empowering people to exercise these rights and improve their financial health. This is what we see open banking. And you know, from a technical perspective, of course, it's the enabler that helps people do all of these nice things. Um, other speakers from Sweden mentioned about you know, the challenges and the technical uh, difficulties they see in Sweden with uh, fintechs trying to access banking data as different banks implemented uh, this directive in their own way. So uh, having different API specifications or let's say the, the technical solution that allows companies to get access to the data. So one of our uh, jobs at Saltage is to uh, solve this technical problem. And, you know, we still have a long way to go, but um, this is our global footprint. We have integrated more than 5,000 financial sources in, in more than 50 countries. Um, just in EU, there are 6,000 banks, you know, we have about 2,500 of them. Uh, the US has more than 10,000 banks and, you know, at global scale, it's, it's a huge mission. Uh, but we're slowly moving uh, uh, towards that because uh, millions of people have, you know, connected their bank accounts using uh, one of our clients or several of them uh, because the Saltage technology is under the hood of these financial applications. Now, with open banking regulation, you know, the, the challenge is not just technical, but it's also uh, a regulatory one. So if you want to provide this type of innovative services, uh, Natalia from the National Central Bank said that, you know, the account information service providers, payment initiation service providers are new players in this field. You need to be regulated. And this is, of course, for the benefit of consumers because it provides, you know, a uh, more secure way to, to do this. But uh, it's also a challenge for companies that want to enter the space because getting a license from a central bank is, is not easy. 
uh, we got one in the UK uh, due to Brexit. Now we are uh, getting a second one in Romania. But basically, all all of the you know partners and companies uh, I talk to uh, say that it's difficult, and it's a process that can take you know up to one year or or even more depending on the roles you want to exercise. So we're trying to help in this area uh, as well. Now, uh, the open banking ecosystem. So uh, these are the players. You know, we have three main ones. The end users, you know, that's, that's how we refer to actually consumers uh, and businesses that want to, uh, to use this type of services. And then we have companies of different sorts, uh, fintechs, but not only it can be uh, ERP softwares or accounting softwares or lending companies. Uh, you heard uh, QRED's presentation early on, you know, they're also using this. Uh, and then the TPP are the third party providers. And sometimes they're one and the same as the company, but in many cases, a company might decide not to invest in this, you know, complicated process of getting a license. So they will partner with some, somebody like Saltage to, to tap into the banks and uh, the banks are uh, on the right hand side, you know, thousands of thousands, thousands of banks. Um, and then the regulator, of course, is uh, also uh, a part of the ecosystem, not participating directly, but very important to uh, make sure, you know, that the rules are being respected and implemented. If we talk about countries where open banking uh, hasn't uh, been um, implemented yet uh, and make sure that consumers uh, rights and, uh, you know, security uh, are protected. Now, a quick look of uh, what's happening with open banking around the world. Uh, actually, the, the history of open banking starts in the US in the late 90s when Microsoft and a couple other companies uh, unified a, a protocol for exchanging data between banks and some, some applications like Microsoft Money. Uh, but then it uh, evolved with technology. Uh, funny uh, thing, US is still uh, doesn't have open banking regulation, and uh, I don't think they will have any soon. So it's a market-driven approach in that case, but uh, millions of people in the US are using this type of services. EU uh, is the leader uh, globally because they were the first to uh, do this, you know, mandatory from a legal perspective. Um, and other countries have implemented some uh, versions which are similar were a bit different from the European one. Uh, Australia, for example, uh, they have uh, the CDR, which is the consumer data right. So their focus is really on the consumer, not on financial information. And uh, the banks are the first ones that need to, uh, to provide access to their accounts. But uh, following the banks, you know, there's the insurance providers, uh, telecom companies, uh, utility providers, and, and so on. Um, then we have Brazil uh, also with uh, regulation in place and now in process of implementation, uh, Georgia, uh, but also countries like Turkey, Mexico, uh, Moldova uh, are uh, working to provide uh, a legal framework for this type of services. Okay, let's move to use cases. Um, retail banks, um, imagine, you know, I, I think most of you should uh, be using mobile application of the banks that you bank with. And if you have accounts with two banks, you'll have um, uh, two applications where you need to log in and see, uh, you know, your account balance and the transactions. Now with open banking, uh, one bank can uh, provide you this uh, overview of uh, the situation in your bank B, for example, in it its own application. So if you prefer uh, one bank to another because you know the app is, uh, is better looking, the user experience or the functionalities are, are, are better, then you can do that and still see uh, what finances you have in, in your second bank. And more than that, not just see, but you can also uh, make payments you know, from the same application. Uh, second uh, use case, and I think you know the, this is the one or the use cases that uh, started all of this: uh, personal finance management. And uh, under this umbrella, there are actually uh, tens, I think, of different applications that help people uh, and businesses manage money. Uh, and this can be budgeting. This is um, helping people save money, help people invest, um, help people manage it, and. Uh, again, it's about providing this overview of the finances, but this is uh, not done usually by banks, so it's by, by fintechs. 
And then uh, the big banks see these nice fintechs and they invest in them or they buy them or they incorporate their products in, in their own. Another use case, uh, which is uh, uh, also very important and uh, brings a lot of benefits to both consumers and businesses is the lending space. So uh, it can be uh, banks, but also non-bank lenders like QRED, uh, you saw earlier, they provide loans to businesses. So open banking facilitates the process of how the financial data uh, exchanges hands from, you know, being inside the bank's infrastructure, going to the lending company in a secure way. You know, it can be fully digital, automatic, uh, happens uh, very fast. And uh, a lot of instant lending propositions have been, you know, appearing on the market in the past few years. And with COVID last year, we actually see a huge increase in uh, lending uh, and loans being provided to people, you know, because of course people uh, found themselves uh, in different situations and they needed to, to get money uh, from some sources. Accounting and ERP companies, uh, these are one of my favorites uh, and it's been a trend uh, for the last year and a half. So, um, a couple of years ago, the focus and when somebody was talking about open banking applications was around consumer uh, or B2C applications. Uh, now businesses are also tapping into this. Uh, and uh, it, again, it solves you know, real pains and real problems uh, with accounting companies, for example, uh, automating the reconciliation of transactions. So uh, things that are done um, manually or half manually can be fully automated. Just like the other uh, week, one of my colleagues had a call with uh, a huge company and, and they have a call center of 1000 people that are doing this reconciliation in a manual way. So it's just crazy uh, that the, the benefits that they can reap from implementing open banking. Uh, now, open banking is not just uh, about getting access to financial statements, you know, from a bank account, but it's also about payments. Uh, it helps uh, initiate payments, you know, for direct account to account transfers. Now, in Moldova, at least, you know, uh, regular consumers are not exactly used to uh, this type of transfers. We generally rely on cards, you know, to pay or to transfer. Uh, businesses do use it. Uh, but in, in the Western world, a lot of people use their uh, bank accounts to make this type of transfer. So um, for e-commerce, for example, it's again replacing uh, existing payment instruments, which um, you know, have uh, disadvantages, also advantages, but uh, you know, with open banking fraud can be uh, eliminated from this process because uh, PSD2 also has a concept of, around uh, strong customer authentication. So making sure that no one can uh, act on your behalf or, or use your uh, credentials or anything like that. Uh, E-wallets in countries where they are popular, you know, topping up your account balance. Uh, maybe uh, here in Moldova, people go to, you know, Kiwi terminals and enter cash, but uh, imagine you can do this from uh, your preferred e-wallet application, tap a couple of buttons and you do a transfer from your bank account, which is also much cheaper than uh, using other ways. And of course, uh, repayment of loans or paying invoices uh, or paying for rent, for example, you know, as Corina mentioned earlier, are also use cases that can be implemented. Um, I can tell you about uh, tenant verification, uh, planting trees and uh, monitoring CO2 emissions, you know, very hot right now, uh, making donations or uh, savings using roundup functions. Um, so more than 30 use cases in, in more than 20 verticals. And, um, you know, every, every uh, two or three weeks I hear about or talk to somebody who's thinking uh, about a new way of using open banking. And it's quite, quite fascinating. It's, you know, I've been uh, with Soldish for three years, but uh, every day is like a new day and uh, it's not uh, repetitive at all. Okay, uh, let's quickly see, you know, what are the benefits? Uh, I did mention them, you know, here and there, but just to put them all, all on one slide, you know, for consumer. So it's about financial advice, uh, budgeting, you know, personal family expenses, uh, but also automating some of the uh, experiences like paying bills. Uh, I've seen some tries in Moldova, some banks that try to do it. And, you know, it's extremely useful not to think about, well, you know, I missed paying my uh, electricity bill and then, you know, the utility provider just comes and uh, unplugs you from electricity. 
uh, and it's not because you don't have money, it's because you forgot. And you know, these are real things that can uh, bring a lot of uh, help. Uh, making payments using any payment instrument uh, or the, the one of your choice from one interface or one preferred application. So you don't need to be stuck with you know, your, your bank, but use something uh, better. Um, making transfers to friends and family for minimum fees. So maybe not always a problem here in our country, but uh, if you want to do cross-border payments, then you know, a lot of savings can be done uh, through open banking. Uh, it can be used for online onboarding, so no, uh, not to have to go, you know, physically to some uh, business office or bank or whatever, uh, but just rely on the identity that uh, your bank has about you because the banks know who we are and, you know, we've been to the branches. Uh, they took, not pictures, but, you know, they looked at us, they have copies of all our documents, so they identified us. Um, also increasing security and eliminating fraud. Now, for businesses, it's also very interesting. And with payments, uh, we find that you know merchants uh, can lower their transaction costs and fees by five to ten times. So this is not five or ten percent, but it's a magnitude of five to ten. So it's a huge, huge uh, deal for them. Yeah, there are still some uh, challenges on the technical side, as you know my uh, other colleagues mentioned, because of different implementations by different banks and. Uh, maybe at a country level, you know, with um, efforts and discussions and involving all the players from the ecosystem, this can be solved. And UK is a great example about this because uh, it's working smooth. And, you know, uh, three years now since they implemented it, uh, payments are also uh, becoming um, uh, important and they're being used uh, at volume and you know Sweden also is trying to solve that problem now you know my uh, our hope is that in Moldova because the we can learn from the experience in Europe we can implement it the right way and uh, so that you know commerce and businesses can reap these benefits uh, right from the start um, obtaining loans and you know uh, tracking uh, payments of uh, employees for example also a huge problem uh, there are uh, fintechs and startups that have raised tens of millions just in this space to solve just this little problem of how a corporation uh, or a big company can track the expenses of their employees. Okay, now finally, uh, the trends. You know, right now, uh, people and you know, fintechs and even regulators, for example, in the UK, the discussion is around open finance, not just open banking. Uh, open banking is about bank accounts and only payment accounts, but there are also a lot of other type of bank accounts which are uh, important and being used by uh, consumers and businesses. Think about uh, loan accounts, investment, mortgages, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and they want to extend the scope to uh, include all of the financial type of accounts. And then in Australia, it's about open data. It's not just about banking or, or finance. So yeah, they start with banks. Uh, and banking, but then they will have the insurance providers, the utility providers, all of them being obliged to provide, you know, nice modern uh, ways uh, using technology for the consumers to be able to transfer this data from their infrastructure to whatever application uh, they want in an easy way, but also in a secure way. And the third one, uh, which is also, I believe, very important, is about embedded finance. So it's not just about fintech or banks or financial institutions, but it's how financial products and services can be embedded in uh, other uh, applications or services. So here, think you are using your uh, um, accounting software or invoicing software. You have to pay an invoice and you pay it from that uh, you know, web app uh, but using your bank account, but you don't need to go to your bank account or internet banking for that purpose. Or you're short on cash and you need like a quick loan. So you get that loan again from uh, that um, application without leaving it. And of course, uh, this is, you know, uh, enlarging the entire ecosystem and making financial products and services acceptable on an extremely large scale. Um, 
In the UK, we have, uh, I think, more than 3 million people that have used uh, open banking services, so just one country. Um, there are no uh, statistics yet for the EU, but you know the number is uh, uh, much larger, and it's only beginning. It's only increasing, and you know uh, this is a long-term game. So uh, maybe initially the expectations about open banking were you know quite hyped that you know it's gonna work, it's gonna be perfect from day one. It didn't happen, uh, but we know how uh, how what the problem is, how to solve them, and you know it's being adopted more uh, and more. So. Uh, we're quite excited to be in this space, and uh, I, I thank you, um, Marina Natik and you know the fintech committee, <laughs> which I'm part of, to organize this and uh, be able to share this uh, with you. Now, if uh, anyone has questions, then I'd be more than happy to to answer. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, email. Please uh, contact me. Let's get in touch. And if you have, you know, if you if you want to take this offline, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to do it. Thank you. <clears throat> Many thanks, Vasile, um, both for the input that you are making in our FinTech committee and generally for all the amazing work uh, uh, Soltech is doing. We have a question from the audience. Um, it sounds like this. What are the current forces that disrupt the Soltech business, if any? The disrupted, is that from a good perspective or...? <laughs> Um, let's say from a good one. I wouldn't take it from a bad perspective. Um, well, our business is growing. So, you know, although we've been eight years doing this, but it's, it's always growing. And uh, we have been providing this, you know, I said millions of people and we have more than, you know, 100 clients, but this is just the beginning. So it's only the very, very early adopter that do it. And, you know, the... The, the majority of the other businesses and people haven't even heard about it, even in, in the UK, you know, the, most of the people don't know how this works, uh, what is, is it for. So we see a lot of perspective in this. Um, but one thing that uh, maybe I didn't mention uh, that, you know, for open banking and especially the payments part to, to really um, blossom is the instant payment uh, side of payments, which uh, I hope in Moldova will have soon, but you know, not all European Union countries have it, or you know, uh, other countries. Uh, but where you have instant payments, then you know, combine this with open banking, then this can uh, really accelerate uh, the things and uh, bring us, you know, a lot of happy people and users. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you for the, the, the answer and uh, we'll see you again during the uh, finalizing co conclusions, but bear with us uh, until the end of the panel, we might have some additional discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vasily. And uh, uh, moving forward in, uh, with our panel, um, I would introduce uh, Dumitru Cioric. Uh, Dumitru is uh, a telecommunication engineer, one of the most prolific uh, um, tech influencers in Moldova, and now he is working as a business development manager at Fagora. So, uh, uh, Dumitru, you were involved in, 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 uh, in many processes, discussions in this regard. Uh, what is your perspectives on, on the topic we are discussing today? Hello, uh, good day to everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, yes, currently um, I am. Uh, we are involved in developing a startup in Moldova, a startup born in Moldova, registered in Estonia, which uh, wants to make big steps into expanding in other European markets, and the first target is Romania. Um, just a second, I will um, share my presentation. Uh, How many screens do you have there? Because <laughs> I see you looking. <laughs> it's them. a lot of screens, and uh, I, I don't know why I'm not seeing the presentation, but I think uh, this is the one. 
So uh, let me know if you if you're seeing it. Yes, we are. Okay. Um, Do, do you see the entire page or do you, you see just uh, some parts of it? And uh, now we see it uh, fully opened. Um, uh, okay, great. Um, so, Fagra is a P2P lending marketplace which was born in Moldova, launched in 2019. Uh, we have registered the business in Estonia as we want to position ourselves as an European uh, European startup. And uh, our plan is to expand in other countries also. Our goal is to offer people simple loans and smart investments by using automation and machine learning in the lending process. Um, we believe that people can manage online their entire financial life and the people that have talked before me uh, gave very nice and good examples on how we can do that by having ident uh, id um, online id by or by digital id by having uh, uh, more access to to different uh, to different um, accounts open banking and uh, our mission into this program, into this uh, startup is to develop a P2P financial social network where people can invest, borrow or transfer money from one person to another. Our solution is very simple. On one side, we have the borrower who needs money. On the other hand, we have investors who have money and want to get more revenue than on bank deposits. In the traditional model, banks win the most money which we believe is not the best solution for people. On our model, investors, people uh, are those who are winning the most. Um, for two years, we have built a technical system uh, which analyzes dozens of criteria, demographic data, net income, credit history, and the decision is taken in one second. This is actually the core of our system. It's the heart, uh, which we are very proud of. We address mark, uh, millennials and, uh, in Romania and Moldova. We have about 13 million borrowers um, and we have about 11 million people with bank deposits, a, a total of 41 billion euros of money, which are staying in deposits with very low interest rates. So we, we offer an alternative uh, by, by proposing our solution to, to customers. The business model we, we are embracing is very simple. We need just 0.2% market share to achieve the break even. And uh, our business is, uh, is based on a commission fee. We take 3% from borrowers and 2% from investors. On the screen, you can see that we propose to reach the break-even in the next three years um, with a very high amount of loans funded. I will speak now a bit about the traction. Uh, today, or in February, at the end of February, we had more than 20,000 user accounts created on Fagra. That means people that want either to borrow money, either people who want to invest money and win more than on bank, bank deposit. The, the approval rate we have uh, until now for almost two years of activity, it's just 9%. That's how good it's our scoring system. We had more than 6,000 lo loan requests and we've approved less than 600. If we talk about the amounts invested throughout Fagra, then I have very great news. I don't know. I'm very uh, fond of what, uh, what we've managed to realize. At the end of March, more than 400,000 euro were invested throughout Fagra by investors who wanted to maximize their investments. On the other hand, all this money went to people that, look, that looked for 
money which are cheaper than on um, non-banking institutions and it's offered much faster in an online ecosystem. Our strength um, is that our process takes place 100% online. We offer higher profits for investors, we offer lower interests for borrowers, and we have no hidden commission, which uh, we believe it's a strong argument why people should choose FAGRA when looking for financing instead of other institutions. We have built a system, as I've told you earlier, which is working very fast. Uh, and um, I've, uh, you have a preview here of how the process takes place. A person which applies, who applies for a loan, it needs just about 10 or 15 minutes for the first loan. We check the credit history, demographic data, and some other important uh, information that we need to offer a scoring for that person. The approval time is one second. Our scoring system checks all those dozens of criteria and takes the decision in one second. If that person closes the loan and applies again, then the repeated loan takes time to, or takes about 10 seconds. That's how easy it is right now to get money funding your ideas or your needs on Fagura. If we talk about the roadmap, um, we have very important news to share with our community, with the borrowers, with the investors. Uh, we are concentrated uh, right now on three major aspects. The first one, unfortunately, uh, Republic of Moldova does not have right now a crowdfunding law. We know there is a draft at the government and in the parliament, and we are working with the authorities, offering all the necessary support uh, to have such law approved in Moldova, uh, maybe by the end of uh, this year. We really hope that th this will happen uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2021. Another important goal we have, we are working right now to organize a seed round. We, it's the first time when, uh, when we're sharing public this information. We, we are preparing a seeders round right now with, uh, with our community manager in London. We hope uh, we could get live to organize the crowdfunding by the end of April. Of course, we will advertise uh, all this information to, uh, to all the interested persons. At this stage, we're looking to fundraise about 250,000 euro, and all those money will go for expanding in Romania. We need money, so we are very active now in Moldova. You have seen that we have we've reached almost half a million uh, euro invested throughout the platform in Moldova. We want to go to the next step on a bigger market a 10 times bigger market, Romania. So we will announce about this a bit later. And the third priority we have right now, we are working uh, on another project. Project. Until now, we've had scoring for individuals. So we've offered scoring for people looking to finance their ideas or their needs. We want to go to the next level, establishing, building a scoring system which works fast, but this time it's for companies, especially for SMEs. Why, why that? Because small and medium companies need also financing. And when you go to the bank with a newly created company, uh, most of the time you won't get financed because the, the company is new. So uh, also our system is going to check the credit history of the company we were, we're going to build a digital profile of the founders of the companies, and we're going to look automatically into the financials of those companies. By this, uh, by this uh, module that we, we plan to launch, launch also this year, we, we hope 
we want to grant access to finance for startups and SMEs. It's also a great opportunity to partnership with banks for using our algorithm. Also, we're planning to offer our system to third parties companies which need to make safe background checking at first in Moldova and of course at the next step in Romania and other markets which we will uh, include in our future steps to develop. Um, so basically these are our important plans for the next period. This is what we're doing. Uh, this would not be possible without a great team. Uh, we know each other for more than uh, 15 years. We've managed uh, already two successful business exits and we have invested a lot in Fagur until now. You can see the team right now uh, is doing a great job and we hope we will achieve all those goals I have mentioned earlier. Also, we have two new investors uh, on uh, Fagura. Uh, we have closed uh, an angel investment round. I'm talking here about Sergio and Constantin, who believe in the team, believe in the idea. Uh, they are also our advisors on the legal part and also on the marketing uh, department. Fagura was nominated among top three best fintechs in Romania, brand of the year in Moldova. And uh, we hope the words will not stop here. Basically, this was uh, the information I wanted to share with you. I really hope Moldova is going to take uh, um, steps and um, and in, um, in um, the law that is wants to to adopt. And uh, I really hope in the near future, we will see much more fintechs, much more startups, which are trying to tackle this ground, which is uh, we, should, um, we should recognize highly, highly regulated. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitru. And a uh, question for you from Nadezhda Milinti. Uh, what is Fagora's risk appetite compared to a bank and how is it covered? Any risk management practices in place? Of course. Um, one, uh, one investor cannot choose to invest all his money just in one loan. He can invest uh, maximum, uh, maximum 50 or 25 uh, euro. So when people, investors decide to, to or choose the loans where they want to invest. Uh, we, are, um, we are minimizing the risk, offering them the opportunity to invest in many loans, not in just one loan. At this point, uh, we have one of the lowest default rate uh, of, uh, of uh, non-performant loans, uh, one of the lowest uh, lowest um, lowest rates in eastern europe it's about uh, it's less than four uh, percent or in uh, in this area uh, why uh, because we we have all this process of management of risk in the case of investors and also we're working with collection agencies and other institutions to to get back the money into investors uh, virtual accounts Thank you. And another question is uh, from Stefan Nistor. Uh, he is uh, wondering uh, about consumering, consumers. Consumers are generally trusting banks more than financial app uh, applications. Do you think trust is a challenge for consumer fintech? If yes, how do you tackle these challenges at Fagora? Absolutely. It, it is a challenge. Of course, in, in people's minds, uh, they are resonating with the brands they are seeing around them and that's especially banks where they get their uh, salaries where they get their cards so of course the image the trust is one of the key things we are addressing uh, uh, at Fagra we are very open with all our customers we are very open uh, with all the information uh, we do not have any hidden commission commission fees we are organizing seminars, explaining how we work. 
and we've uh, we've reached to an interesting um, conclusion in the recent months that a lot of people trust Fagra because of the founders and not because of the startups. So people, uh, we have investors that are following the project uh, for more than three years when the, it was just an idea. So, and they did not uh, invest until, I don't know, last year, until the beginning of this year, but they followed very closely. What are we doing? What are we saying? What press releases are we giving? How we conduct the business? What are we promising and uh, what they get into the platform? And people have checked us. People have followed us for years. And uh, many of them who have done that understood that we are doing a honest business. And uh, they, they, uh, they onboarded on the platform and started to make investments. Of, of course, at the beginning, small investments, 100 euro, 300 euro, they have tested us, they have requested the money back, we have done everything by the book, very honest, people got their money, people checked us twice, three times, and then they decided to invest more. So now we have investors that, uh, that with their investment portfolio is over is over 3,000 euro, over 5,000 euros. So in this business, you need a lot of trust and it's not being built in one day or in one marketing campaign, which takes place for two or three weeks. It's a thing, you have to work on it every day. Uh, and we're doing that. And my personal belief is that the figures I have shown you, it's because people have Follow, followed us from the beginning. They have they've understood the idea. Mm -hmm. They have tested. They have understood it. And now they uh, went on the platform and they are investing massively in, uh, in financing other people's needs. Many thanks, Dimitro. We are happy that we had you here. And uh, this panel, I think, was great. Um, was a good panel to show uh, the expertise uh, from Moldovan part on uh, areas of uh, fintech which are yet to be developed uh, in Thank Moldova. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitro. We are we are slowly moving to our towards our next panel, uh, where we are going to discuss uh, in detail how Moldova is moving on to the uh, market and how are we developing the fintech sector in our country. Uh, we have a panel with a lot of speakers and we'll try to, to keep it uh, tight in order to stay uh, according to, to the proposed agenda. Um, we, uh, the, the panel is called Moldova Moving Towards Fintech Development. Uh, it's going to be a discussion panel, but at the same time, it's going to give you an overview of the conclusions that we have already in our country uh, on uh, fintech and fintech uh, related um, areas. And uh, our moderator, special moderator for this panel is Radu Vrabi, Deputy Director of the USAID program, Moldova Structural Reforms. Uh, Radu is here with us to guide us through the presentations of all the speakers and um, have on board your questions as well. Yeah, thank you, Marina. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as Marina said, I'm Rado. I'm deputy director of the Moldova Structural Reform Program. It's an USAID program. And uh, thank you once again to the organizer for, for inviting me. I'm probably <clears throat> the least in fintech uh, and you can see i'm the only one who has tie it's because i'm from the other life but pro I, I i promise you if next time you'll invite me i'll be aligned to to, to fintech um so at the same time it's my first experience uh, moderating uh, a fully virtual uh, conference so sorry if i will push not the the, the right button um, as I said, uh, I'm coming from a bit different uh, uh, area, but uh, you know nothing happens for without reason. So last summer, my program um, conducted con conducted two uh, assessment. 
Moldova, rapid assessment of Moldova e-commerce um, and uh, uh, cashless economy and P2P transfers. So uh, during these assessments, I met with uh, a lot of people, including my uh, today's uh, panelists. So familiar faces, uh, good experts. And uh, uh, we hope to, uh, to find out what is the current situation in Moldova in terms of fintech and what we miss. Um, and we will have a kind of mixture with international expertise, with local expertise, with uh, local view uh, from business side and partially from the government side. So my four uh, panelists are Jay Tikam, is a fintech expert uh, from UK. Uh, he was our fintech expert uh, during uh, our uh, research on uh, e-commerce rapid assessment and the founder of the Vidanvik uh, uh, company, uh, one of the probably uh, greatest experts I, I, I met in, in this area. Uh, also with us uh, is uh, Yuri Chibaba from uh, uh, Taxaco. Yuri also be, was our uh, expert with in, in, in uh, cashless economy uh, report. Veronica Siretiano from Amcham, uh, she will uh, uh, she, she'll talk about uh, business perspective. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Vitaly Tarlev, you know him, uh, former uh, deputy minister of economy responsible for IT sector. Now he represents uh, economic council, right, uh, Vitaly? Uh, yeah, we have one hour. Please use uh, Q&A uh, section to ask uh, questions. So, and let's go. Uh, we'll start with the international perspective. So, Jay, I remember from our study and from other different studies that when uh, experts talk about Moldova, they say like, it seems like everything is in place, but something misses. What is what we don't have? So, and what we can do to improve. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Radu. Thank you for your kind words. And thank you, Marina, for the invitation. Um, hopefully, I'm going to be able to share some, uh, shed some light on the Moldovan experience. So let me just share my screen very quickly. OK, you should be able to see my screen, right? OK, perfect. Yep. So um, as Radu introduced me, I'm Jay Tickham, founder of Vedanvi. Uh, we're a boutique fintech consultancy uh, based in London, but working across uh, Middle East, uh, Southeast Europe, and also Africa. And we work with kind of startups in the UK. So yeah, I, was, I had the uh, honor of being invited to participate in this project that was run by USAID uh, last year uh, in, in sort of July. And we've basically focused on the fintech aspects, mainly related to e-commerce. So we didn't look at the whole sort of market uh, in, in general. And so today I'm going to be speaking really about uh, the experience and you know, the findings that uh, we've actually come through. So it was a comprehensive study, but it was also a quick study. Um, so we met uh, around 41, you know, we had 41 meetings. We met more than 100 stakeholders from different groups. The meetings uh, and the whole sort of project was started in July. And by end of October, we already had quite a comprehensive report. It was meant to be a quick helicopter study. Uh, we were meant to produce a 30-page report, and it ended up being more than 100 pages. So hopefully everyone's have access to it. If not, I'm sure Radu and, and uh, Marina can give you access to that. So what did we find? Overall, as Radu said, you know, we found a well-developed financial system. And to be honest, as part of the team, we kind of spent weeks scratching our heads as to, you know, what's, what's wrong? Why are they creating the study? Uh, everything seems to be working. So, you know, all the necessary building blocks are in place. That's the good news in Moldova. I think there's an ambitious startup ecosystem. Um, 
customers also have choice, you know, so there's all different types of payment systems, you know, you've got QR codes, you've got point of self payments, you've got ATM cash in terminals, everything seems to be there. However, as Radu said, you know, we've noticed some frictions, some frictions, basically the glue that doesn't seem to bind the relevant parts of the ecosystem. And one of the most key findings for, from our study was that there's a lack of sort of cohesive governance structure uh, and some kind of a central implementation body. So I, I know this morning we spoke a lot about the ecosystem and you know different parts of the ecosystem play different parts uh, in their own right. But you need something or someone or somebody to bring all those ecosystem parts together. And I think that's kind of where the, you know, the problem lies in Moldova. We feel that, you know, fintech, especially post COVID-19, where people are kind of forced onto the online channel, we feel that fintech potentially could be quite a game changer for Moldova. So we looked at, uh, we, when we talk about the ecosystem, this is what we looked at from, from our study perspective. We looked at government and regulators. Uh, we looked at the current incumbents uh, and we did speak to a few banks. We looked at the alternative finance providers that are in place. These are mainly alternative payment companies rather than the crowdfunding, although we did speak to Fagura. We also uh, spoke to uh, supporters like Attic, uh, you know, accelerators and, and the tech hubs. Um, and then we looked at the perspective of the end users. And, and as I said, you know, all parts of the ecosystem uh, need to kind of play their part. So what did we find? on? On the demand side, which is kind of the most important thing, if you don't have demand, no amount of fintech is going to bring about any solution or you know objective that you're trying to achieve. So we felt that you know, given some history, there's currently a bit of a lack of consumer trust in uh, the financial services system. Now things may have changed uh, post COVID, but we found that people are very much reliant on cash. And to a point where, you know, we heard cases where salaries were deposited into a bank account and the very next day, somebody went to the bank, withdrew all their money and started spending cash from then on. However, it's interesting to see that, uh, you know, looking at some national bank data, people are willing to engage with electronic channels when it comes to international platforms. So they're quite happy to use credit cards on an international e-commerce uh, platform compared to a Moldovan platform. So, you know, we felt that at the moment, you know, the consumers are fairly well educated, are responsive and progressive. And I guess as soon as, you know, trust comes into the market, potentially people come in and, and you know, provide new types of solutions, we'll see more people coming into the space. So the demand side is key, uh, obviously from the merchant perspective, we felt, I mean, we spoke to quite a few e-commerce companies. So, you know, pretty small companies, also medium-sized companies. And one of the biggest constraints that everyone speaks about in Moldova is the high uh, payment fees. So, you know, 2.25% versus 1.2 and 1% in Ukraine. This is now significant considering that the current margins are between 5 and 6%. So, you know, it's a huge chunk of margin that eats away just for for providing uh, digital payments. And therefore cash seems to be, you know, the best way and the most economical way for merchants. Now, even if they went in and said, okay, we're going to offer electronic payments, uh, the cost of payment infrastructure is difficult and um, quite challenging for these uh, SMEs. So for example, you know, to integrate a payment portal onto your website, unlike in the UK where, you know, you can just basically have a, a code and you've got Stripe on your website within, you know, literally a few minutes, it needs some sort of a developer to build the interfaces and then maintain the interfaces. And that's pretty costly. And so if I'm a small merchant, I'm just going to say, look, you know, I'd rather just go for cash. It's much easier. Obviously, there are other things that the team considered, like, you know, uh, logistics and, and postal service and things like that. The merchants also have a high deposit requirement. So obviously, in case of refunds, if, if it's a bank, then the banks will hold quite a lot of money um, for quite a long time, which, you know, from a cash flow perspective doesn't work. And then what we also found for, with merchants is, you know, merchants don't generally go and raise funds. Um, so SMEs rarely raise funds. They fund their startups or their businesses themselves. And once they're operational, they seem to not use other financial services products. So, you know, for example, uh, point of sale credit, that doesn't seem to feature. 
and neither did uh, insurance for you know goods in transit or uh, hedging currency risk when they're shipping things externally. So we felt that there's a limitation of uh, you know use of financial products, at least at the lower end of the market. Obviously, once you go higher up the the market, then there are a lot of uh, use cases. So on the government side, uh, again, I think you know we feel that the government, obviously, the fact that this study was commissioned, and we see a lot of initiatives from the Economic Council, etc. So there's a will by the government. You know, they definitely want to drive e-commerce, and they, f- they feel that fintech is a key component of that. So we see that there's a drive, there's a willingness. However, as we said, you know, there's a lack of governance and possibly execution capability um, at government level. And that may be exacerbated by, you know, the current political instability. Um, You know, so once that settles down, you might get, uh, you know, more traction in the space. As far as regulators are concerned, so we did have a chat to regulators. and, And the positive news is that the regulatory framework is kind of being aligned with uh, EU framework, which is, you know, good news. Um, However, we felt that the regulators were cautious. Again, there's some kind of history there. And because of that, regulators are a little bit cautious uh, to encourage innovation uh, and, and they're preferring the status quo. It's also a bit of a chicken and egg because, you know, we, we said if you had an innovation hub or a sandbox, uh, that would kind of encourage uh, innovation in the space of fintech. And I guess from the central bank's perspective, you know, their question, and it's a right question, you know, do we have enough demand for such a, uh, you know, such an innovation hub? So there's always that sort of balance. Now, obviously, given that there's a lack of sort of some sort of an innovation hub, it's very difficult for fintech players to engage with the central bank. Uh, I know even in the UK, when you find startups, you know, they're very nervous to go to the regulator, just in case they make a mistake, you know, they feel that there's going to be a black mark left on them. Okay, so when we come to the fintech and payment landscape, as I say, we only looked at the payment landscape. And obviously, at the moment, unsurprisingly, banks and and card companies dominate. Um, There are seven alternative payment providers, as uh, someone from the central bank already mentioned. However, they are reliant on banks and, and card companies. There is an effort to work some kind of a national payment uh, switch or payment gateway. MPay was you know, explored as a solution, but that's proving to be difficult to implement and potentially also costly. Um, now, if I'm an alternative payment provider coming into the market, there's significant uh, barriers to entry. You know, If I want to get access to the MasterCard uh, system, ecosystem, then I'm having to pay quite a lot up front. Uh, and similarly, if I want the license, then you know, there's quite a high uh, capital requirement initially, which is pretty much unaffordable for, for most startups. Now, we also spoke with telcos and, and postal providers, and we feel that you know, if they come into the payment system, given that they've already got quite a vast infrastructure, um, you know, there's mobile penetration of 123% recorded in 2018. So there is a platform, and if these players were to play, they can again make quite a significant impact on uh, the payment system. So lastly, will, the supporting environment, again, there's a lot of initiative. You know, TechWell has a, a, an XY accelerator, there's Attic, there's the FinTech committee now within Attic, and there's the Alternative Financial Services Provider or Association in Moldova. And there's obviously international development partners like USAID. So there's a lot of kind of support structure set out there, but we felt that each one kind of focuses in their own environment. So Attic is very sort of tech focus. The APCFA is very focused on alternative lenders and probably not representing other FinTech players. Um, So, you know, we felt that maybe there's more of a need of a coordination uh, in the FinTech sector. Uh, And we'll come to the recommendations in a minute. So those were the kind of high level findings. Uh, In terms of the recommendations, again, we looked at recommendations specifically for the parts of the ecosystem that most needed them. We also felt that, you know, we we could come up with loads of recommendations, but we felt that, you know, we wanted to bring out the most uh, important ones and the ones that can have kind of the highest impact with, uh, you know, with a quick turnaround. So we tried to focus on, on those kind of high level recommendations. So firstly, I think we spoke a lot about PSD2. Uh, now, PSD2, as you've heard this morning, you know, they are PISP and AISP uh, business models. If you think of the high payment fees for merchants, the PISP takes that away very quickly. And so, you know, we're encouraging 
the central bank to try and accelerate PSD2 as, as fast as possible. I know that it's currently going through parliamentary process, but last year we felt that, you know, that could come slightly sooner. We also encourage the central bank to launch some sort of an innovation hub. Maybe it's too early for a sandbox. Um, and I guess there's a little bit of risk for the central bank if they launch a sandbox because they're allowing firms to operate outside the legal environment. But at least the innovation hub will get the central bank engaging with the fintech community. And lastly, we looked at the, you know, the large barriers to entry for new payment providers. And so potentially, if you look at some of the other countries, they've reduced the uh, initial capital requirements for low volume businesses. Obviously, they'd put some restrictions, but that at least gets them into the market uh, quicker. From a government perspective, uh, you know, we, we recommended some sort of an implementation of a govern governance framework, some sort of a body that's, you know, including public and private partnerships. And I know the Economic Council probably has a big role to play, but there needs to be some sort of a dedicated, you know, implementation mechanism that also preserves institutional memory. We also felt that uh, you know, government should have some kind of uh, facilities to incentivize the development of fintech. So at the moment, there's you know, a lot of uh, effort to incentivize IT companies, but not so much on the fintech space. And lastly, this is more longer term thing. If you create an open banking environment, looking at the UK experience, you have a lot of kind of glitches in the system. And in the UK, they created an open banking implementation entity that takes away some of that friction and again, sort of coordinates the various bodies. And lastly, we felt that uh, from a supporters perspective, uh, and as mentioned from the Sweden example, a FinTech association that represents all uh, innovation in finance would be much more, much more welcome. So that's a quick whistle tour. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, you can uh, get me on LinkedIn or you'll find my details uh, in the top right -hand left hand corner. So thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, we so we we collect questions at the end, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, basically, uh, we have, um, uh, as I mentioned, these two studies. They are uh, public, by the way. Uh, you can find them on. Uh, uh, Atik uh, site or on economic council site and uh, maybe in the meantime we'll, we, we can put the, the link here to uh, to see for those who are interested uh, as you said uh, it was uh, bigger than we expected but it's easy to read so both uh, the studies are easy to read so uh, who, who, who has free time or interest in this area we can um, uh, we can share the, the, the studies. At the same time, um, at four o'clock, you, you, you've mentioned, um, uh, Jay, uh, the political instability. So at four o'clock, we expect um, a political decision in this political crisis by the Constitutional Court here in Moldova. So that might put an end on, on this uh, uh, political drama. Uh, but uh, we might lose our participants by, by four, so we'll move to, to another our panelist, um, uh, Yuri uh, Yuri Chibaba, who will uh, who will talk uh, about uh, fintech from let's say uh, Moldovan perspective, uh, based uh, on the, those findings uh, from the study I mentioned, but and, uh, as well uh, as from uh, his uh, uh, experience and discussions with. Uh, uh, companies here in uh, in Moldova. So, Yuri, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Thank you, Rado. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Attic, for organization. Thank you for Sweden colleagues. And uh, that uh, we have such possibility to, to so experience of other country and to share our experience. So uh, the report that uh, we prepared, assessment report on the e-commerce and cashless economy, we go a little bit deeper, uh, comparing it to what uh, team of uh, Jay did it. So we gave, went a little bit more detailed. So uh, what we have covered with our study, we have covered all uh, phases of e-commerce cycles from the decision to start the e-commerce or to open the online shop 
and to connect to everything payment solutions to take money to deliver the goods uh, and to report to the state authorities and also to the shareholders in such way uh, also during the preparation of this uh, report a little bit we could say that we realized that some of the myths that we i at least thought uh, have a little bit uh, gone and i have realized i have changed some my uh, my views on some sort of situation also uh, we have tried to cover all the expenses for starting e-commerce business in moldova especially not only the financial starting from 500 euros and uh, going up but also on the time and as jay said this is true that sometimes connection to the payment solutions could take at least two weeks and uh, on such uh, it was like a joke up to two years for some of the solution i think that uh, on the beginning but it was a real uh, case but usually it takes from up to one month medium uh, also we have discussed a lot of with public authorities to understand what what our their view this is banks international payment system fintech merchants uh, business and professional association also the national bank moldova uh, agency for the protection of the consumer rights uh, MLS, uh, Center of Anti-Money Laundering, uh, pr uh, data private data protection uh, data. Uh, based on this, so as it was mentioned, we have all four possibilities, uh, payment solutions that are available for e-commerce. This is Visa MasterCard, credit bank transfer that is not used by the individuals it's mostly usually only by the companies cash on delivery most use, uh, used and uh, it was confirmed by the merchant uh, that it was most used but not uh, payment by card and your yeah, wallets that is uh, let's say on the beginning of the stage unfortunately maybe for for individuals let's say for our for consumers we have no uh, international uh, payment service provided but at the same time this is good for the local uh, PSP, they have possibility to develop well solutions. Main issues that we tackled for the, let's say, for our fintech uh, in our uh, study, we could divide in three main topics. This is operational costs, so domestic special regime, market issues that uh, fintech has, and at the same time, merchant has the issue, and also tax compliance issues that. Uh, my colleague Veronica will describe in more detail in her presentation. So, uh, as uh, Jay, this is uh, we have started very accurately, and we discussed with the merchant what what the real merchant fee are for the local uh, merchants, and we are talking about local. So it's starting from zero five percent and up to three percent when we are talking about accepting uh, cards issued by the foreign banks. At the same time, uh, if we are talking about the e-commerce in Moldova and especially e-commerce uh, uh, on local market, the main issue that have been raised, this is very low with deposit for the uh, small and medium enterprise companies. This is one of the, let's say, myth busters. So yes, fees are a little bit high. At the same time, after negotiation with banks and uh, uh, increasing volume, the fees could be reduced. At the same time, rollo with deposit represent a much bigger, let's say, uh, expense for the company because it does not receive all the money of the sales at the same date. It's up to 180 days. The uh, bank could reduce from 5% uh, to 15% could be take uh, as a rollo with deposit. One of the myth that we have discussed and what what we have uh, analyzed a little bit more, this is a, a special domestic special regime development of a sp domestic special regime that could reduce the expenses for the merchant. Uh, so usually it, it was provided two main solution, but uh, this is a capping interchange uh, rate for processing by local transactions and taking into consideration that we have free processing centers uh, developed by three main banks, uh, Victoria Bank, Moldova Grand Bank, and Moldin Bank. So uh, that is why everybody use uh, this processing center for post terminals. And the uh, second solution, we're implementing a switch mechanism uh, between these three processing centers. 
and by this we could reduce the cost for the banks and at the same time reduce the cost of the merchant fee. Uh, nevertheless, when we go deep and analyzing more detail what means reducing the cost, we just uh, to realize that we should calculate how much it will uh, add to the price, how it will generate. It will be investment covered by the revenue that will be generated. And then after that, we would not have another issue that after that, the additional cost will be implemented to the individuals who has to the card holder. So in such case, now banks are covering a lot of uh, their fees based on the merchant fees, not uh, introducing high uh, fees for the card holders or for the individuals. So, and if we took the day statistic data from the National Bank of Moldova, so we should re reply on three main questions to us. Would it generate revenue for all players? We are talking about banks, payment service providers. Uh, so based on the fact that we are talking about 0.1% 0, 0 from the total turnover of the payments by card issued in Republic of Moldova will represent only 500,000 euro per year. It, it would be enough to uh, cover all the expenses for the system and to, to generate additional profit for the development of the systems and so on. What will be the cap in such case? What it should be? Uh, would uh, also another topic, would it increase the number of the non-cash transactions? We don't know. So, and what is the limit? And at the same time, another topic that the colleagues from the National Bank of Moldova have introduced, they are developing the instant payment solution. But currently it means that it will be a huge investment uh, done by the National Bank of Moldova that could reduce considerably the cost, future cost. So could, maybe it's better to think about how to increase uh, revenue, how to increase the turnover uh, of the non-cash payment. And in such case, by this and waiting for instant payment solution, we could resolve the issue that is currently saying about that management fees are high. What we investigated and what would be nice to have if we are talking about domestic special regime, this is that common database of all utilities, bills, and other service providers. So frankly speaking, this is another topic that could reduce the cost for the banks and at the same for the banks and payment service providers and else the result for the individuals. So in such case, we will have more possibilities to pay our bills. I am talking citizens for our utilities. Uh, also this possibility uh, to provide the billing systems for these entities. If we are talking about, for example, municipal of Kishina, we are talking about 700,000 uh, uh, people who are living. Okay, let's uh, say about 100,000 houses. And it means that monthly it is issued around 700 bills, 1,000 bills that could be done by one system. So as I mentioned, the, what we have in the fight that what like uh, Jay just prolongation of Jay uh, in their helicopter study, this is that we have following market issue. So everybody knows Moldova is a small market, but at the same time as the relation with banks and regulator and regulator, I would not say that this is only National Bank of Moldova. I would say also a parliament who should adopt the laws, for example, law on ground funding, but it's very uh, also, uh, important for the development of fintech. I'm not saying about PSD uh, to, uh, second, uh, uh, because it's also very important. And the revenue increasing. If we are talking about bank regulator and the payment service provider, so we should uh, discuss about rollover with deposit policy, but usually is implemented locally. And in such case, more transparency on this policy should be implemented. SAPI access. So it means that um, currently only two payment service providers are connected to the SAPI. And SAPI is now in the process of uh, additional uh, modernization that uh, as National Bank of Moldova informed that it was selected and the job was done. And next step, this is the instant payment. So in such case, it should be speed up the process. Car processing center. So we have only three car processing centers and okay, it's enough for Republic of Moldova, but uh, banks using their monopo monopoly situation at this stage. 
okay, we could not do this as a business. So in such case, everybody understands that banks and PSP now are competitors. So uh, maybe the lead regulators, National Bank of Moldova should introduce some additional rules to be done. And as mentioned, Parliament should adopt full on PSP2 and law on crown funding. This is important for the development. If we are talking about the revenue increasing, that in such case we can reduce the costs for the merchants. So what we have identified, but this is unfortunately uh, Yevol digital wallet is not using, is not has good coverage in Republic of Moldova. But at the same time, if we will uh, see this is uh, a good solution for making e-commerce simpler. It will reduce transaction costs and also it will uh, increase widening of the economy. It means that a good solution for the tax authority to, re to review their uh, cash, uh, cash register machine that could be revised and implemented additional rules. So in such case, just not you do not need to have cash register machine in case if you uh, accept payments only via your wallet or via the cards, so in such case, you don't need the cash machine because you have no cash. Uh, if we are talking about the issue that it is not paid by the cards, so this is as usual individuals, uh, we, so the citizens. And in such case, it should be some implementation on the level of the parliament should think about and the Minister of Finance, the source of cash should be tackled. So it should be we reduce the cash and also how the payments are made by individuals and what 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 could be done. This is the obligation that we wage paid should be paid only in electro electronically. And not only we are not talking about bank account, but also let's say service providers, payment service providers accounts, their wallets. Uh, some of the payments that done to the individuals like dividends, like uh, rent of the cars that sometimes are done by the companies should be also done only on an electronic uh, way. Uh, and also uh, our proposal that we have in the defiance, this is where one of the tax incentive, we are talking about cashback. So usually everybody talks uh, about the reducing VAT rate on the e-commerce. Um, Currently, during our preparation of uh, our study, we have identified that now it's better, and I think that it was more acceptable to have a cashback uh, solution because all the international payment providers implemented in the Republic of Moldova, some of the banks have uh, introduced this cashback uh, payment for the accelerating usage of the cards for card holders. So the solution, technical solution exist on the market and in such case if the minister of finance and the government will decide to increase the solution to to increase the usage of the cards the cash could be used our idea is following that uh, on every payment uh, electronic payment by the cards the individuals received after that three percent back as a cash back and it could be done by the usage of the system that is currently used by the uh, Visa MasterCard and banks has implemented here. And also additional 3% is uh, reimbursed directly on the merchant account. So in such case, we also will cover this merchant fee, could be covered this merchant fee. And at the same time, this is the real possibility to tackle the idea, just pay with cards. And for what following that, as it was mentioned, implementation of a PSD2, adoption of the loan, crown funding, supporting financial funds for payment solutions and other fintech ideas, implementing a fintech hub. So the um, Moldova Startup, uh, fund, uh, Foundation of Moldova Startup, it could be one of the good, uh, good example that it was now implemented by uh, Arctic. Uh, elaboration of the concept of sandbox mechanism and your signature. So if we are talking about the commerce, if we are talking about crowdfunding, the identification and the electronic contract is becoming more important. And in such case, we should implement the automatization of the process of the update of the signature, not just spending the time. And I should go to the office 
and we are talking about our office in Chisinau, and but we are covering we are, the coverage of Moldova is a little bit high. Yeah, we are a small country, but at the same time, it's important to to have possibility to update signature electronic. So that's that's all from my side. So and all questions later. Thank you, uh, Yuri. Uh, I've noticed that uh, in both your and uh, Jay presentation, you mentioned about sandbox and uh, uh, like fintech acceleration. So it seems like local and international expertise uh, showed the same, uh, which is uh, which is good. Um, but rem remembering uh, our discussions with stakeholders in the first study, helicopter study, how we called it, and your study with uh, with uh, Veronica, I remember the discussion with tax authorities and Minister of Finance when like you started to say, well, we need some tax initiatives and the smile, you know, on, 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 on their faces saying, oh, okay, don't, don't, don't touch taxes. It's, it's, it's in, in, in Moldova case, it's like impossible to touch taxes because this means uh, revenues for, for the budget. And you know that, that our budget um, is, uh, is small. However, we would like to touch uh, tax compliance and uh, discussions around taxes because again taxes is part of, uh, of the expenditures from for, for, for merchants and for the for the entire chain of e-commerce so we will touch it and veronica uh who represents now amcham but uh, she has uh, a big experience in 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 tax area she uh she, she was deputy Minister at that time, I don't know, State Secretary, and current uh, uh, name uh, of uh, the Ministry of Finance, responsible for taxes, uh, excise, and so on and so forth. So, Veronica, I know you you you've done a good job related to taxes in e-commerce. So please uh, tell us about uh, tax challenges for e-commerce and how we can improve the, the, the current state of play in, in, in this area. Veronica, I have the floor. Thank you very much, Radu. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to be part of the bridges with uh, my favorite country. I mean, uh, another favorite country than Moldova. Everyone who knows me at least a little bit uh, knows how much I like everything which is connected with Sweden. And by the way, if we speak about taxes, uh, in Sweden, tax administration is considered the most trustful and the most beloved authority uh, for several years, as I remember. So uh, that means that uh, the subject that we're going to uh, cover today, it is uh, something that uh, it is important for fintech. Uh, why we are discussing about tax compliance, but before going there, why I am here by representing uh, Amcham. Uh, Amcham, basically, it is uh, a non-profit, non-government uh, organization representing uh, more than 140 um, entities uh, with uh, local and international uh, investment. Uh, but uh, the most important thing that uh, we are having our digital transformation committee. I am uh, in charge of this committee also. And together with ATIC, together with Marina, we are working very, very close in promoting and advocating for fintech sector. Because uh, here at uh, um, Amcham, we have representatives for from all the chain, let's say, about the payment. We have banks, we have all four PCPs, we have uh, um, our international systems, uh, Visa and MasterCard. So we can easily speak uh, for them in front of the government. And by having a professional organization like Attic uh, together and going in the in the one single front, it is much easier. For example, we are uh, advocating for uh, very, very hard uh, for the AKYC, the things that Corina touched a little bit earlier. We are advocating for PSD2, the things that Yuri and Jay touched a little bit earlier. Now we are struggling uh, with the crazy regulations that entered into force starting with the 1st of January regarding some extra burden on uh, PCPs, including banks. So uh, we are doing our job together in that. And uh, one part of this job is this tax compliance. And I will come back to the tax compliance. And I will um, show you just um, um, 
I like to to usually I like to have my uh, um, I, I like to come into this kind of um, events by speaking with you more than by presenting something. Now I decide to to have one single slide, so um, uh, do not kill me and please do not be very very do not think it will be very very. Uh, um, usually when we are speaking about taxes, people are waiting to a very boring stuff. I will try to not be very boring. If I will be, please tell me in the end of my presentation. If I will not, please tell me also about that. So why we are speaking about fintech tax compliance? First of all, it's essential to be compliant. So it's much easier to be compliant than, other, uh, than in other case to fight with the effects of not being compliant. So in, it's referred to any activity, not just to the um, fintech activity, but we are going further. In order to be compliant, all the rules should be clear. And here we have our first challenge, because if we are speaking about fintechs, not all the rules are clear regarding tax compliance. There are a lot of lacks that should be um, tackled and there is a lot of uh, uh, question uh, there are a lot of questions that are still raised and there is no an answer on that so uh, speaking about tax compliance is very relevant if we are speaking about a new uh, growing industry like fintechs the last but not the least uh, cause why we're speaking about tax compliance is because the tax compliance appetite of fintechs um, uh, companies is directly connected uh, to the capacity of tax administration to ensure fair competition in this sector. So if we will not speak about this fair competition, we will not speak about compliance of all the actors which are involved in there in one sector, we will not be able to to, to speak at all about tax issues and about tax compliance. So um, let's take it one by one. First of all, the first issues that we are, if we are referring to tax compliance, it is a structure of the business. And when I refer to the structure of the business, I mean there is a lack of understanding on the fintech business activity from the tax authority side. It is uh, uh, something that it is quite new. Um, the business structure, it is not very known because it involves a lot of uh, e involvements than uh, physical involvements. It could be not so easy checked, uh, I mean physically checked, and that require a much uh, deeper knowledge about uh, how the things are going on in, in, uh, in our days, let's say like that. And it is sometimes very challenging for the one who should uh, for example, answer for a question that the fintech is uh, addressing. Um, this is a, a very important uh, thing to consider because in the moment we are addressing the tax administration or Minister of Finance, we should be sure that we explain very well what exactly we uh, is our structure of the business and what exactly we need them to, to cover, to explain, to show or anything. So um, I think it is a huge work to be done by us and by Attic in order to achieve that the, this understanding of this particular business will be much wider and the uh, state tax service minister of finance will understand how the business is working in this particular area. If we are referring to some specific issues, we should refer definitely to cash register equipment and fiscal gateways. And here, there are several issues that um, should be tackled also. Uh, first of all, uh, um, it, it is a little bit interesting situation in Moldova. Uh, it, despite the fact that you are using an electronic uh, device or any, anything you should uh, or post terminal for example if we're referring to bank uh, uh, card uh, banking cards card banks yes if you are referring to them you should usually uh, issue two receipts one should be issued by the cash register machine and another one by the device that is uh, um, doing the job by the way it is counting this particular operation and this is something that we think it should be somehow eliminate uh, there is also some issues about uh, issuing uh, issuance of uh, posts uh, of tax receipts uh, for order placed uh, through marketplaces, for example. It is also a huge issue about this fiscal getaway and e receipts, because this e receipt is, um, from one hand, it is mentioned in the legislation that it could be issued. 
From the other hand, this e-receipt, uh, it is not a um, document that it is clearly understood by the Agency of uh, Consumer Protection. So uh, they, uh, despite the fact they refer to these e-receipts in some of their communications, uh, when uh, we have our discussions with them, uh, they were very concerned about the capacity of using this e-receipt in, uh, in a court. For example, if you have an issue with a merchant or something, how it will be um, different from the perspective of a regular receipt or how the, um, the, the, the things that you have just bought could be refund uh, um, and, and so on. So it is an issue that it is still uncovered by the legislation in a very clear way and it still uh, raises a lot of questions on that. The fiscal getaway also raised some questions because um, uh, despite the fact that in a way or another this fiscal getaway was used by several of our think fintechs, the new legislation was adopted and uh, uh, now uh, a lot of new rules comes into force and uh, re registration of this fiscal getaway should take place and it is uh, quite challenging to, to face it in a way or another. So uh, there are a lot of issues here and if we are, I am referring here to a more particular one, for example, some definitions of uh, peripheric equipment are not very clear if we're referring about the cash register uh, equipment or, for example, uh, there are uh, some misunderstanding how it should be, this receipt should be issued, for example, by some particular equipments, equipment. So uh, there are a lot of issues here that uh, are still on the roll and uh, we are trying to work on them with, um, with our um, uh, members and uh, with other colleagues from other associations. I told you about ATIG. Uh, and uh, we are trying to, to tackle them in a way or another. And the third one, and in my opinion, it's a very important one it's a fair competition that the tax administration should ensure as i told you earlier if the fair competition will not be ensured by the activity of tax administration the one who is dealing everything in the right way um, will be not so competitive uh, than the other one that it is doing in the not so right way let's say like that uh, and uh, in this case of course uh, it is very important to be sure that um, Mm, the fair competition is established. And uh, the message that the tax administration could give to the business community here is, uh, of course, showing us several examples how they do uh, realize some efforts here because um, um, we are like an association and our members are always addressing to the tax administration if, for example, they find uh, some um, situations in which, uh, for example, the, um, some operators do, does not comply, uh, does not comply exactly in the way in which they should, but uh, there is no any communication back uh, in which we will be sure that some actions are taken here in order to, to, to cover this uh, very complicated but very important uh, part of the um, uh, compliance. Basically, tax compliance of fintechs is a very important issue, and this road is still under construction. All of us are working on uh, on construction of this road, and uh, I hope in uh, in uh, in the nearest future we will be able to to speak about that in a more progressive way, to not take care about these tax compliance issues and to be focused on this amazing development that we have just learned from you a little bit earlier uh, in Moldovan perspective, but also in Swedish perspective. So thank you very much. If you think I uh, can help you with understanding a little bit uh, here, better here or anything connected with these tax issues, let me know. I'll be more than happy to answer to you. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. I hope uh, we'll have questions about uh, taxes. I'm, I'm, I'm looking that we, we are losing participants and I, oh, no. <laughs> hope, I hope it's not uh, due to my style of moderation. And not uh, about taxes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I, I was uh, uh, at the beginning, I, I, I said uh, that I'm not exactly a fintech uh, person. I jumped into this boat uh, at the end of last uh, spring when someone Vitaly Tarlev launched a 
so-called digitization roadmap, an ambitious document uh, that uh, uh, and a good document um, uh, that at that time like uh, um, drew uh, drew our attention on uh, on um, e-commerce and digitization uh, things. So we uh, took over on some activities from that uh, digitization roadmap. Uh, to cover from uh, USA the MSRP uh, program. Uh, in the meantime, Vitaly moved from governmental side to, I don't know, economic council is probably a kind of associative, uh, more expert side, but still Vitaly uh, controls the, the digitization roadmap. He, he uh, has an important role to see what has been uh, done and what uh, is uh, um, what still needs to be uh, improved. So Vitalia, you um, you've heard about uh, recommendations from experts, some ideas. So could you please give us uh, a kind of uh, uh, the, like the final the final updated info? What what is the the current state of play with uh, with roadmap plus uh, we would like to 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 hear your expertise on those questions related to fintech uh, was mentioned oh, you might you may have additional aspects to 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 share with us <laughs> you have the floor uh, thank you radu uh, thank you for such an introduction. Uh, my role or the role of the institution I was working uh, in at that time uh, is actually uh, very uh, unclear regarding the uh, digital transformation in the country, digital transformation on uh, verticals, especially regarding the uh, fintech. Uh, so uh, the, the first attempt to uh, uh, address uh, the issues regarding e-commerce uh, evolution development in Moldova uh, um, had a very uh, reluctant reactions from uh, different institutions that uh, this kind of uh, topics are uh, not in our competences. Uh, this is not for our entity. Uh, actually, this is a transsectorial uh, issue uh, and of course uh, here we needed a more implication of uh, different stakeholders different players and uh, it was very difficult to, to find a, a common ground a common view on this uh, that's why uh, the solution came to, to um, non-binding uh, document roadmap which was approved uh, at the level of uh, economic council and fully supported by development partners and fully supported by the association, the private uh, sector. Uh, you know that uh, moving to the to the government with this kind of strategy is quite difficult because different institutions have uh, different uh, point of view, expectations, readiness, and so on and so on. So we had to to, to move on this uh, on this path, uh, and uh, actually two um, uh, presented studies on uh, quick or rapid uh, e-commerce review, and the second one on uh, on e-commerce and cashless economy, actually confirmed our. Uh, uh, initial uh, conclusions that uh, there are uh, at least a uh, few uh, bottlenecks, few constraints, few blocks of, of constraints in, in this regard. And uh, the fintech is one of the, um, or e-payment infrastructure is one of the, the, the main uh, issue in, uh, in order to move forward to, to uh, uh, digitalization instruments in the uh, in economy or uh, narrowly in, in e-commerce. So from these perspectives, uh, of course, uh, we see uh, a lot of uh, work had to be uh, organized, had to be done at the level of the government, but in the meantime, uh, there is no clarity what uh, we are going to another round of, uh, of uh, uh, political processes. It means again that the government uh, would 
uh, not be uh, ready to go deeper in that. So the responsibility of the associative sector of donors is to, to continue to move forward uh, in the same way, to identify issues, to identify solutions, to be more visible, to, to put uh, uh, pressure on, on, uh, on uh, uh, institutions in order to obtain more openness and in order to obtain uh, what we call um, more attention facilities were not encouraged to use uh, words like tax incentives and so on and so on. And Veronica will confirm it. Uh, we we uh, faced it many times, and I would not bring uh, examples at different stages when we were trying to to find solutions. But usually we succeeded. So I I'm pretty optimistic that in this case uh, um, we will succeed too. So uh, uh, the arguments uh, or the position of uh, the uh, opposite or uh, um, entities which are not fully supported for this is that Moldova is not fully ready. And guys, Moldova is, uh, is ready from many points of view uh, for, for new solutions, and Moldova is, uh, is ready from, uh, from different perspectives, but uh, there are a few bottlenecks, and uh, uh, we have to, uh, to continue this, uh, this effort. Uh, of course, uh, the, the uh, economy commerce roadmap will be upgraded. Uh, there is no uh, clarity on the national strategy regarding e-commerce development or, uh, or digital economy. So we have to do our job with uh, the accessible instruments. And uh, uh, we are working on, on updating um, uh, the roadmap. Uh, many of the activities are already covered. Many of them uh, derived from the studies, uh, including the studies presented today again. And uh, of course, we can uh, not move forward without a counterpart from the government because, you know, you, we, uh, this is how it works. We have to share ownership, we have to involve institutions in this debate, and we have to attract more and more players. Um, because again, this is about ownership and people uh, have to feel that they are in, and uh, this is not uh, coming from outside, but uh, this is uh, our common uh, scenario decision and we will work on this. Uh, one of the deliverables to, to, to the parliament, um, I expect it, um, we expected it to have it registered as a, as a legislative initiative is a legislative package, a digital legislative package one. And this is already in the parliament. And the second one will cover more aspects uh, discussed today. Uh, and we have an, already an agreement that uh, the, the, the second package, legislative digital legislative package, will uh, go deeper uh, on the financial side and uh, hope to succeed together to insert as much as uh, possible um, uh, clear or uh, very, very accessible uh, um, action lines in uh, in, uh, in that new new document. In the meantime, uh, uh, EBRD, European Bank for, Bank for Construction and Development, is uh, is looking closer to the possibility to uh, contribute to uh, strengthening the the fintech community in Moldova. And uh, of course, from both perspectives regarding the the community, regarding the uh, 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 common or aligning itself to, to common effort in this regard. And from another perspective regarding the regulatory framework, which is European driven and uh, of course, which was uh, mentioned before um, regarding PSD2 or regarding other acts uh, on, on um, uh, know your clients, uh, distance know your clients uh, regulations or, or um, in uh, other areas remains on our focus and uh, hope together we will succeed uh, to um, drive or to, to formulate an agenda which, uh, of course, uh, uh, have to be aligned with uh, the community expectation and have to be accepted by the, the uh, policy makers. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Vitaly. Uh, I really much uh, hope that uh, this work on uh, digitization roadmap will continue with some uh, more, you know, sensitive, uh, no, uh, not sensitive, but uh, but more clear and real um, actions. 
and uh, we hope we'll have uh, more uh, political support as you as you mentioned and uh, we'll have more ownership so uh, I would like to uh, thank all uh, uh, panelists for, for, for their interventions uh, but we will not end although we are on a small delay so we have three questions but two of them are the same uh, so one from well two two questions on the same uh, matter from Mary Nemchuk and uh, Anna Kiritsa about what kind of fintech sandbox do you recommend for our country this is a question for Jay so Jay if you can answer Okay, yeah, sure, no problem. So I think there's two questions. One is, do you think that Moldova has a chance to achieve any chance to achieve competitive advantage? And the other one is Sandbox. So, well, this is the second, but anyway. Okay, okay. <laughs> let, let me take both questions. And so I think on the uh, area of the competitiveness, so, you know, in, in each market that I work in, and I work quite extensively across, uh, you know, S S S Eastern Europe or Southeast Europe, all markets are kind of small. But having said that, you know, we just, we just, found that there are pockets of uh, inconsistencies and opportunities. So wherever there's friction, I guess entrepreneurs can play a role in fulfilling that, uh, you know, or, or filling the gap in the friction. So, so I mean, I think the market is small, uh, but having said that, uh, financial inclusion is relatively low. So, you know, I think there aren't any exact figures. It looks like there's about 60% of people are included in the financial system. So there is openness gap in the market uh, within Moldova itself. The current solutions are potentially not working as well. Uh, and therefore, you know, entrepreneurs can come in and play some sort of a role to try and sort of eliminate those frictions. Next thing I would also say, you know, each country is pretty small in its own right. But at the same time, I always encourage, uh, you know, neighboring countries to see how you can collaborate together. So, for example, you know, what if you cooperated at the regulatory level and made it easy for Moldovan companies to go into Romania and, and places like that? You know, that's one option. So, yeah, I mean, two, two things. I think there are opportunities in Moldova at the moment. And secondly, you know, look at regional opportunities and some kind of a regional hub, which might be an, uh, an advantage. On the second question of a sandbox, so I think there's two types of sandbox. One is a regulatory sandbox, which you know everyone kind of knows about, and this is experimentation for uh, innovative ideas that don't fit within the current regulatory framework. The second one is more of a commercial sandbox. Um, now, I, I would say that as far as a regulatory sandbox is concerned, it's probably early days. And my, my advice would be start with an innovation hub. Uh, because even in the UK, you know, the FCA said all innovation fits within, you know, as far as possible should try and fit within the current regulatory framework. And it's really only minor tweaks that you need rather than wholesale, you know, new legislation. So start with the innovation hub. Also bear in mind that, you know, when people get to the stage where they have to test in the sandbox, you know, the idea should be validated. They should have had systems and processes developed. They should have had software developed and have a pretty good idea of who their target customers are. Uh, so that will come probably, you know, in a year or two's time. Um, remember, Sandbox is at the testing stage. You know, it's not at the idea stage. So from a regulatory perspective, I would say, you know, regulators could open up an innovation hub and then, you know, think about a Sandbox later down the line. As far as a commercial sandbox is concerned, this I do encourage because, you know, it is a huge task for any entrepreneur to go into the financial services space. You know, e-commerce is relatively easy. Uh, other types of businesses, you know, you need a computer and you can be up and running. With financial services, you kind of have to go, you know, the extra mile to put processes and systems in place, get a license, and it's not easy. And obviously there's a tech requirement. So I've seen countries where there are commercial sandboxes where you've got the technology, you know, you've got some kind of a platform where uh, fintech companies can come and build. And also there, there's a potential for a kind of a super license. So a sandbox could have a super license uh, awarded by the regulator, and then they could take on fintech companies under their license, and they effectively become the regulator support uh, compliance efforts. For, for the fintech founder, what that means is, you know, they have a technology stack that they can build on very quickly. 
and they have a license that uh, you know from day one they've got access to uh, you know the license and therefore they can go out into the market once they're further down the line then they can go and develop their own software outside the platform and similarly you know in the meantime they could apply for a license that i think could work as well so hopefully that answers both questions yeah thank you uh, jay uh, if uh, those who addressed uh, questions do have some additional you can ask now or you can uh, be in touch with jay uh, after that so i believed i put some i pushed some wrong uh, buttons uh, marina did i understand did, did I understand correctly that you wanted to to, to take one uh, question from from those address? No, no. no? Okay. Just reminding you that we have little time remain. <laughs> ah, okay. That. So if we don't have any other questions, I would like very much to uh, thanks our uh, panelists uh, uh, Vitaly, Veronica, Yuri, and Jay for this. Um, uh, for this uh, presentations, I enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, let's be in touch. And if you have other additional questions after this uh, conference, you can ask. I guess uh, Marina, you can facilitate these uh, discussions. And once again, thank you everyone for for attendance and uh, be in touch. Marina, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rado. And uh, thanks again uh, to all the panelists who joined until now. We have two more smaller panels to, to go. It's one uh, on conclusions and closing remarks. We don't have that much time left for, for this one, but we'll try to keep it short in order to uh, give you the opportunity to learn more. And this is why I'm asking you again to stay tuned. You are going to learn more about FinTech Moldova program, which is going to be presented by Anna Kirita, Alona Stratan, uh, and uh, Vitaly Tataru. There is a huge plan uh, on uh, that end, which is going to be for one hour uh, once we conclude all our sessions. Now, for the conclusion and closing remarks uh, session we have here, uh, first of all, my two co-moderators, uh, Alexander Guzun and uh, Vitaly Tarlev. Uh, uh, we have also Vasile Valkov, who is the president of the FinTech Committee, and our special guest, uh, the, the, it's Katarina Nilsson, the program manager of, at Embassy of Sweden. Actually, this event wouldn't happen without uh, Katarina and her team. Um, and once again, I want to thank uh, the Swedish Embassy for all the support and for making it happen. Because as Vasile mentioned in the beginning, it started as a small idea and then it grew up as a whole day uh, event. So Katarina, I want to give the floor to you uh, first for the closing remarks and then we'll proceed with uh, everyone else. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Marina, and thank you, everyone, for uh, joining this event. I am so delighted. I just, uh, my hair is all messed up. I've been writing all day. I've been listening. I've been trying to have some lunch in between. It was amazing. So uh, thank you uh, to Attic, uh, our partners in this, our colleagues at the Swedish Embassy, and all uh, the speakers. Uh, I uh, have listened to all the uh, interventions uh, and what, what's a lot of things are in my mind right now, but Tom Holgersson in the beginning said, don't spend so much time on big events because they just take time and so on. I think this was a pretty big event but it was totally worth it. I know people have spent time in preparing and uh, joining and in intervening, but it's totally worth it. Uh, I have learned things. I hope you have learned things. Uh, one of my biggest uh, sort of general takeaways uh, from this is that here in Moldova, we are talking about creating uh, a fintech ecosystem. I think today we have seen the ecosystem. We have seen the different actors, the people with experience, the people uh, who are working uh, 
uh, for institutions, people who are obsessed with tax issues. Uh, there are so many engaged people. Uh, the, the ecosystem is there. So now it's just about breeding and connecting like uh, uh, Anna in the beginning, Anna Bliablina was was saying like which factors are needed uh, for an ecosystem and showed the map. It's there, so let's uh, let's grow this uh, uh, together. And uh, I also uh, specifically <laughs> from my side, I work on uh, EU for Moldova startup city Kahul, which is of course a regional uh, initiative and. Right before this, I heard uh, uh, mention the, the sort of the value of creating a regional hub. And uh, uh, someone mentioned earlier as well, like don't just focus on the capital, but focus on other, other cities. So uh, I just want to mention Kahul as, the, as a potential uh, connector uh, for some of these initiatives. And uh, not the least, I want to mention uh, that Sw Sweden and the Swedish embassy, we are here. We are your partner in this. Uh, we're happy to facilitate further connections. If you are looking for other experiences and information, we are happy to facilitate and set up meetings or what is needed. And Marina, did we hear something about gaming? Early on <laughs> today, I think we heard, uh, and of course, Sweden is also known as a gaming gaming industry leader. Uh, so there might be a budding idea to do something else, but more focused on gaming later on uh, together. So please reach out uh, if, uh, if you see possibilities and further need further connections. And I, I'm just wishing you uh, luck for the continued work on this. Uh, and we are here. Thank you. We really felt your support and we are feeling it every day, especially the ICT sector is continuously supported by the uh, Swedish embassy and Sweden in general. So thank you once again for being with us, for taking notes, for uh, organizing this event together with us and uh, for everything. Now we'll move uh, quickly to Alexandro Brazil. Uh, he was uh, my partner in crime for the Swedish uh, panels. Uh, therefore, Alex, if you have some closing remarks, uh, but just try to keep it short in order to- I will try to keep it point. short. <laughs> I will try to keep it short if you make sure that you are hearing me this time well. Yes, we are. <laughs> Fantastic, finally. Okay, thank you, Marina. It was indeed a very informative and dynamic session we have we have had. Uh, we went through all the ecosystems relevant elements from both macro and my, uh, macro and micro perspectives. We have learned about the scale of the fintech industry in Sweden with about 450 companies and the number of employees uh, overtaking the total number of employees in the Moldovan IT in the industry as a whole. Uh, we also have learned that despite the expectations, the impact of COVID-19 um, crisis was not so massive. About 50% of the Swedish fintech companies claim that they have not been affected at all or even have seen a positive evolution, while those affected were mostly lacking funding. Moreover, uh, an interesting message was that almost 100 of the companies, uh, percent of the companies claimed that they uh, plan to recruit in 2021. Uh, if we speak about the takeaways, uh, I would summarize them as following. So firstly, in order to build an efficient uh, startup ecosystem, all of its components, such as access to capital, supportive regulator, government and community, uh, and of course, literate consumers need to be working together. Focusing a bit on the regulatory part, fintech is a highly regulated market, as it should be. But in many cases, the re regulatory framework is built uh, based on the functioning of the banking system. Thus, is not always easy for a fintech to succeed. And PSD2 definitely was a buzzword here today. The PSD2 framework uh, was uh, used a lot by Emil, but he also mentioned that uh, its immaturity, uh, immaturity and inconsistency across different countries. Similarly, the innovative uh, infrastructure um, 
needs to be, if, even if it's good, it needs to be made available for all of the stakeholders and allow the fintechs to grow uh, by, by, by using it, right? Uh, which leads me to a next point. Uh, the associative efforts are important. The voice of the fintechs uh, need to be heard, needs to be heard and matter. This will make the both financial system and fintechs better. And thus the need for a fintech association as a eco ecosystem player uh, becomes obvious for both dialogue ensuring purpose, but also for playing the role as an expert organization. And this point was fortified uh, by the fact that helping each others to succeed was one of the key conclusions of the Stockholm FinTech Week, along with some other highlights such as uh, which were orbiting around maintaining and sustaining trust as a fundamental part of the industry, as well as the usage of the data and the cloud as um, uh, parts of the foundation of a digital transformation, through digital transformation. Uh, building innovation hubs are the motion force. And to quote Jay's recommendation earlier um, in the Moldovan bit of our event, start with the innovation hub would be a first step. While doing that, the think big but start small philosophy should, should be embraced. And also, besides focusing on a few verticals and ensure local networking with relevant organizations and successful entrepreneurs, a very important note, uh, especially for small countries such as Moldova, is to build an international community with other hubs and learn from them. Uh, one of the reasons for Swedish success in tech and fintech was from the very beginning look looking uh, out for scaling and expansion to the region and further and beyond, right? Uh, and finally, Emil's bluntness in his advice to entrepreneurs was, cherry, was the cherry on the cake, to me at least. Uh, we have heard the story of how to go from zero to 30 million in, in five years. It was a very rich presentation in useful advice, uh, useful, well, with a lot of useful advice for entrepreneurs, such as focus on the problem and not on the solution, while keeping it narrow uh, and get inspired from others, which was an interesting remark from Emil, uh, rely on the team and build a proper culture within the own organization by leading, by example, and think global, but act local, uh, uh, trying to become a number one in a niche, but respecting the local differences. I believe that's pretty much it. Uh, of course, uh, it's hard to summarize uh, uh, so many interesting discussions in just a few minutes but i hope i've i've um, i've reflect most of it oh yeah and the education system should be adapted to fintech uh because this is something which uh, which inevitably will be will be an element uh, uh, to influence further growth in the fintech industry as a whole and it, the space that needs to be uh, uh, started to be grown from 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 now already yep thank you L looking forward for having a master degree why not in fintech soon enough in our universities. <laughs> it could be a game changer for Moldova. Um, I will go next to the next uh, of my uh, next partner of mine is Vitaly Darlov. He, he was with me for the whole uh, session uh, on panels for Moldova and we'll finalize with Vasile. Vitaly, I'm giving the floor to you. Thank you, Marina. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's quite difficult to summarize something else after Alexandru. Uh, so, uh, but let me focus a little bit on uh, what was uh, said from uh, from all one side. So, uh, of course, we we had a very uh, good uh, discussions, which uh, focused on uh, on many aspects. As Katarina uh, mentioned, uh, we have actually an ecosystem, and many players, many uh, actors of these ecosystems had the occasion to uh, present their position to uh, headline what they considered is more uh, important for, for Moldova at this stage. Um, we had a uh, uh, very encouraging message from National Bank of Moldova that uh, the regulatory framework or uh, enabling policies are envisaged by the authorities, which means that uh, uh, a part of the, the, the conclusions of this uh, event uh, are somehow covered, and we hope the parliament will be, uh, the government and the parliament will be able to, to proceed um, uh, quickly with, uh, with uh, uh, internal harmonization process in order to, to have this package of enabling policies uh, um, 
uh, rolling on and moving to, to, to the department. Of course, we will need more uh, other kind of enabling instruments like supporting FinTech, uh, like uh, consolidating the, the community, uh, offering them access to initial uh, initial funds investments and uh, there are a few instruments I am, I'm pretty sure will follow in the next uh, few few minutes regarding the uh, fintech program of the, the association but uh, some uh, some uh, of course as uh, Veronica mentioned some instruments from the government from uh, uh, or government supported instruments in order to uh, um, strengthen the, the fintech community are necessary and uh, we hope uh, uh, we'll be able to, to promote it. So, uh, of course, we've discussed many uh, infrastructure elements and uh, we had an outside view uh, on, on many uh, elements necessary to Moldova. We had great presenters with, uh, with uh, USAID supported um, uh, studies assessment on, uh, on uh, e-commerce and cashless economy evolutions here in Moldova. Uh, very valuable um, uh, conclusions and uh, mentioning, talking about them uh, as much as frequently possible, we uh, can um, uh, be sure that uh, this, voice, uh, this voice will be, uh, hear it and uh, concrete uh, actions will, will follow. Uh, we had, uh, of course, uh, an interesting point of view from uh, uh, fintech company startups from Moldova, and uh, they actually had uh, the occasion to um, uh, highlight what they consider necessary and important for, for uh, developing this community, this business in Moldova, and uh, we hope uh, they will be able uh, soon to get associated and to be uh, more visible to be um, understood and supported by uh, by other partners uh, from governmental side development partners uh, and other uh, linear or uh, cross-sectorial associations so uh, for me it looks very uh, very encouraging and i hope we'll succeed together uh, at least we know where the issues are, and the next step is to uh, take actions in order to, to solve these, uh, their issues, uh, the, those constraints. Thank you, Marina. Thank you. We will definitely take some actions on our FinTech committee with Inatic, and we, hear, we have here with us uh, Vasile Valko. Uh, another partner in crime for, for this uh, event because he was uh, with us uh, from the beginning, including with idea conclusions. So, Vasile, please uh, let us know your last thoughts and uh, specifically if you could mention what can we take over on our community uh, as a task force. Yeah, uh, thanks, Marina. I was actually uh, looking that you know we have quite a few attendees here. I was expecting just the panelists to close the event. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad people are still following. It, it means it's interesting. And I a fair share of references, you know, fintech, open banking, and, and all that. But this was quite, um, uh, quite, quite interesting and uh, quite engaging. Um, and since there is this interest, and then Katerina mentioned about, uh, you know, the ecosystem being here, you know, present at this event, uh, as the FinTech committee, I would suggest, you know, maybe to uh, organize a breakfast or some sort of uh, event where uh, people can also uh, speak out and speak up and, you know, share their views, um, ideas, or, you know, they work in different sectors and, you know, every, everything is connected to finance and payments. Uh, I think Alex and uh, uh, Vitaly mentioned most of the important points, um, but I, I want to say that besides the regulatory framework, which you know I'm sure we'll get it over the, the line with the legislation, as important uh, as uh, passing the legislation is the actual implementation and making this work in practice. And you've heard our uh, colleagues from Sweden that uh, even there, with all their experience in you know high tech society, uh, there there are issues with PSD two implementation. So uh, I think it's very important. 
I thought for a second that I'm freezing, but it seems that Vasile is. <laughs> I guess uh, technology is again here. Vasile will probably be able to connect in a minute, I hope. Uh, but yes, uh, definitely implementation is really important. Uh, I guess we will have to move slowly to our last but not least panel. And by the way, we have people which are watching us on our YouTube channel because we're streaming, streaming uh, this conference on YouTube. Uh, there are a couple of uh, more viewers there. So I'm uh, happy and uh, proud to introduce to you our next panel. And uh, while keeping all the conclusions pretty short and uh, uh, maybe coming back later on with some keynotes on this, because uh, our, our, this panel is focused on future plans and probably coming with solutions to, the, to some problems that we already touched upon today. Uh, so the next panel is about FinTech Moldova program 2021. Uh, we have here with us Anna Kirita, who is Strategic Project Director of uh, ATIC, and uh, Alona Satan, uh, first Vice uh, President of the Management Board at Maib, and Vitaly Tataro, Founder and Managing Partner at uh, AgTech. Uh, uh, I'll leave them uh, here to give you more insights on the plans for this year and many more. Thank you, Marina. Uh, I shall start uh, if, uh, uh, with your permission. And uh, first of all, uh, welcome everybody to this wonderful event and thank you for being here still in the late afternoon. As Marina mentioned, we have two um, co-speakers during this, um, uh, this session. Uh, I will be with you uh, until uh, 1630 and uh, moderating this, uh, this component and Vitaly Tatara will take over uh, from that moment on. We have been present preparing this presentation together. So, uh, so just in case we are uh, here on the same track. Um, so I'll share my screen. Uh, definitely uh, some of the things that have been uh, probably mentioned today will have a, repeat, a repetitive uh, component. How however, uh, we want to focus on the actions that we are already doing and actions that are already happening and uh, extending those um, uh, support initiatives that are being developed within the FinTech Committee of ATIC towards uh, including the banks, the insurance companies and all the other stakeholders who are key for the um, uh, development of the FinTech as a vision in general in Moldova. Uh, what we actually wish and what we stand for when we uh, go for the fintech, uh, we do want to see Moldova recognized for its international or internationally for its fintech uh, doing business environment and progressive activities. Why? Because we think we can, and because there are so many stakeholders, so many stakeholders that can actually uh, take on take these things on board. Uh, whenever we talk about the premises, we do have uh, active players such as Dova IT Park, uh, FinTech Committee within ATIC. Uh, we have the Tech World FinTech uh, related programs. Uh, we have the Association of Banks. Uh, there is an AmCham Digital Committee. There is the Digitization Roadmap developed by the uh, Economic Council of Moldova. There is the government agency playing its, its own role. The National Bank the, uh, and the other regulators uh, plus, we say there is a wish. Uh, also about the background, we do have specific legislation uh, available, and this is based on the FinTech Committee of ATIC provisions. Uh, there is progress on, um, although slow progress, but there is uh, progress on the implementation of uh, various directives. And uh, there is the MPA, of course, there is the legislative framework permitting um, that the fintech is being developed here in Moldova and that we are known as a, po as a positive example overall. Uh, of course, you have talked about all these multiple services today and how this can be performed, but this is just the beginning. And in order to develop this whole vision, just to re reiterate because I was listening to the other speakers, um, we have set some also targets uh, we want every second person in Moldova to use fintech solutions by 2025. Uh, this number is 
we're saying for solutions and it's not limited to one or, or specific um, um, way of doing business using fintech. We're talking about the peer-to-peer -peer lending. We're talking about cards. We're paying payment systems. We're talking about insurance and other elements that are either in progress or being developed. And of course, 50% of the transactions uh, overall in Moldova would be nice to happen online. It's, it's a lower amount currently. Uh, and, uh, and definitely uh, this could be an interesting target to reach by 2025. This would mean financial inclusion and providing and equipping the next generations with uh, specific uh, instruments that would lead to, uh, to the fintech uh, or to engaging everybody in adopting fintech. How do we see it? Definitely the innovation and the open innovation. I'm glad you've talked about the innovation hub. Uh, that means capacity building and, and um, overall, over the industry, over the cross industry. What we are planning to do, and uh, this can be a different discussion, a whole big different discussion. We're working together within, uh, with our donors under the um, uh, USAID and government of Sweden for the FinTech hub component, which would permit creating a specific environment for uh, FinTechs and for um, aspiring to be FinTechs, to be able to use uh, physical and virtual related infrastructure. Definitely, um, there is a need for cross-industry collaboration Whenever we talk about the fintech, uh, we should not forget about the telecoms, we should not forget about the banks, the PSP providers, the donors, the technology companies, the regulators, and everybody who can contribute to this uh, to happen. Um, we, you talked probably about the financial education. We are working on developing the financial inclusion educational program, uh, which would permit uh, every uh, um, need every interested person to be very aware about how these can uh, or how financial instruments work, what are the financial instruments, how uh, from a very early stage one can benefit of the e-services, including financial e-services present or just being developed in Moldova. This is not a 2021 yet target. I assume this would be the 2022. But this is uh, a thing in process, and uh, and we definitely uh, would like to see this happen. Uh, of course, um, international relationships and exchange programs. In order to be able uh, to accelerate, there have to be different programs put in place. Today, we launched a, a, actually an acceleration program call for proposals, uh, including e-commerce, which would have fintech uh, component as well, and everybody who is interested in this sense can contribute. Uh, partnership with different associations and get integrated into the international circuits. Um, whenever we think about fintech, it's not bound by specific boundaries. It should be uh, regional, global, and uh, available to everybody. That's when we succeed together. And of course, this is the component that we think the Attic Fintech Committee does wonderful, uh, the regulatory component, which can be expanded to uh, other stakeholders and is probably extended to other stakeholders. This is something that we're actually doing this year together with MasterCard and the Moldova Agroin Bank. We have a whole program uh, tailored on three pillars, uh, which is a hackathon coming soon on the 23rd uh, to 25th of um, April. There are 49 participants involved already ap applied to this program and probably there will be many more. Uh, the applications are open until the 20th of April. There is the acceleration program that we have talked about. And then there is also the uh, um, conference that is planned for the October 28th. Uh, this is the first time when we have such a triangle related uh, partnership. Well, we have a bank, we have uh, MasterCard and we have the technology driven programs or, or uh, association and uh, tech world behind it. Uh, and uh, when, whenever we say it's just, just some first steps uh, forward, but, uh, but we are dreaming big. And we hope that uh, whatever has been mentioned before and can be further uh, also presented by Vitaly and Aliona, 
um, can have more um, engaged parties and partners uh, to be able to reach that financial inclusion that we're looking for. And the hackathon, as I mentioned, open until April 20th. Uh, join us and we'll also be able to uh, provide actually physical access to, to tech both of the teams that will require that in case they need to be, here, uh, to be working here. I'll stop here. Vitaly, you have the floor if you want to uh, add up on any of the slides or uh, actually yeah. further moderate yeah. the session. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Hello, everybody, and all the 34 people that are still present here. Yeah, we have, I mean, I mean, a uh, uh, <clears throat> big passion for FinTech so far. I mean, I mean, proving it, I mean, once again. Uh, so, in fact, uh, what uh, I have to add to Anna's presentation, yeah, in fact, there are also so many I mean, directions yeah, in order to build a truly uh, uh, performant ecosystem, yeah, so many people, I mean, already, I mean, today, very, very good ideas and very good experience going, I mean, to be uh, acquired, in fact, by, by Moldova's community, just to be focused on some points here, yeah, so that is quite, though those are really quite important, yeah, uh, so I truly believe that that, that, that uh, Arctic uh, FinTech uh, committee is doing a great job so far, and I think it's a, like a... Uh, <clears throat> leader, I mean, in order to promote the, the, the fintech uh, uh, communication, I would say, between various players uh, here. And at the end of the day, still, the, 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 that's a couple of the valuable speakers, I mean, uh, spoken about the, the fintech association. Yeah, I think this uh, 2021 would be the the year of the, uh, uh, hopefully, would be the year of the foundation of this. Uh, uh, of this association, yeah, at least will be everything will be almost ready. Hopefully, it will be uh, almost ready to the, to the fintech conference. Yeah, uh, what is a, a couple of things? I mean, going around the, the focuses uh, mentioned uh, by Anna. Uh, first of all, uh, at least for me, I would like to have a, a bigger, bigger competition. Yes, yeah? so, so stronger competition on the Moldovan market. If it's not so big, but uh, still there is a, a room for for uh, additional players and more initiatives on that. Uh, definitely not only by the the, the, the market players, but uh, also to be supported by by the government, National Bank of Moldova, and the other at least financial institutions here. Yeah, not to be referred, I mean, on, only to the banks. This is one point. Another one. Uh, as uh, Louise mentioned, yeah, just I was uh, uh, very curious to, to, to see what is the what is the, like uh, the evaluation of the competition and partnership here, yeah, so in different regions, because definitely they are slightly different in different countries and, and even regions, yeah. But what I would like to to, to, to see here in Moldova that the the financial institutions here, yeah, like banks, like like microfinancing companies, like insurance companies, yeah. Uh, to be uh, to be more open here yeah, for the fintechs, not only like it proving, I mean, and, and, and buying the IT solutions, yeah, but in order to, to give them like a part of their processes, yeah, like outsourcing processes, yeah, and just, I mean, to be definitely all the regulatory framework, yeah, definitely will like a PSD2 and uh, uh, so going into the open banking, but I would say here just to, to, to be a uh, a bit, uh, a bit wider, not only open banking, but also the op open financing and uh, open insurance, I would say. And just not to, not to uh, skip the, the fact that uh, the, the uh, Swedish FinTech Association also is, uh, is going, I mean, to, to attract the, the like uh, red tech and insure tech. Uh, so because of the, Moldova is not so big, big country, yeah? I think uh, might be, I mean, the, 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 the good idea in order to go also, I mean, and to attract uh, uh, even the, even the some, some points like a health tech, yeah, so just might be, but to, to, be, to be a bit cautious about this, yeah, because the, uh, uh, like a financial services definitely will become more and more uh, embedded, yeah, so into many, many services, yeah, so as soon as the, the the the, uh, the services are going to become like more friendly uh, to the users. Yeah, definitely they will be. I mean, like uh, 
incorporated into the, the, the main service that the user are, are going to, 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 to get. Uh, one, uh, so, uh, so, and another idea before, before passing, I mean, the word to Aliona Stratan, uh, I would have to mention that we have a very good background of the technical and, and so far infrastructure organizational, just to mention that the common, I mean, efforts will definitely will uh, uh, multiplicate uh, the, the effect of, the, of, the, of those, I mean, all the players, yeah? And another point, yeah, we have the very good technical development. Yeah. So far, there is a big need for the for the uh, customer experience, yeah, and uh, and uh, uh, optimize for the for the for the customer uh, processes. I mean, the customer like so called the customer journey maps. Yeah, there is a so one of the focuses is is mainly for the for the financial uh, education. Yeah. And also, we have to, to, improve, to, to improve and to go into this direction as well and to try to, to, to get more programs, you know what I mean, in the universities, schools, in the, in the companies to get uh, experience, yes, on, uh, and, and experience based on the, on the, on the customer preferences. So there are many, many, so, so many topics, I mean, to, to be touched here, but uh, I'm, I'm stopping here and I'm passing the word to Alena Stratan, the first vice president of Moldova Green Bay. Who is, I mean, uh, one of the on my uh, on my point here yeah, is uh, uh, even it's the biggest bank and largest bank in Moldova. They are uh, quite uh, so surprising. Yes, yeah, they are quite fast. Yes, yeah, so uh, at least in the half of the last half of the year, yeah, they are moving. I mean, like a, like a very very quickly into the into the transforming and providing the the quality financial services. So I learned on the floors. I'm passing to you. Thank you, Vitaly. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you all. Even with, if we were at dig a digital event, I had a lot of problems with connections. That's why I was going out and in again when I, when I, when I finally found the place. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. But finally, I am here with you and everything is OK. And um, Vitaly, thank you for nice words that uh, even uh, we are the biggest, one of the biggest uh, market players in the financial sector, we, are, we do not have professional arrogance. And in fact, yes, we are very agile and uh, uh, making a lot of things to happen uh, during the last, uh, last period. Thank you very much. I will share my, uh, my screen. I prepared a very short presentation uh, in order to speak uh, about um, what, what we are doing and we, what we would like to, to have after, um, after all these uh, events and all, all these meetings uh, we expect. Let me just try to, to do that. Uh, share the screen and here we have a presentation. I will put the full screen here. Oh, okay. I will start with this part. Uh, I am very happy to say that uh, in uh, 2019, at that point of time, uh, I was uh, not still uh, as member of a management board, but uh, in the supervisory board, bank uh, adopted uh, uh, the um, strategy to go digital. And the, uh, Maib said firstly in 2019 that we go digital. Mm, it's very uh, difficult to say, it's very difficult to make the strategy, but usually it is said that uh, after the strategy, it's several times more difficult to, to implement it. However, the bank had done a lot uh, in this regard, and I will speak a, lot, a, a little bit about what hap happened after 2019. Um, in 2019, uh, we uh, had our new um, application probably a lot of uh, you saw it already. And uh, since then, um, we tripled our number of clients in online. And uh, this is um, uh, not only actual for uh, physical persons, but also for entities. Uh, today, uh, around 65% of all our payments are going already online. And we are very happy to see that uh, our um, uh, online uh, channels are rated very high uh, by uh, our community. Around our NPS for uh, mobile application is around 63%. And this is considered one of the most, uh, mm, let's say, high level for applications in Moldova. 
However, even if we are good in that, as I said, we do not have professional arrogance, but this is good. And now we can just build more on that. We think that the ecosystems are our next steps. So um, it's good when a client is in the center, you create digital products for them, you create digital channel, but we want more. We want to, to be in the life of our clients and not to, uh, to come and say that, uh, please client, uh, use our application or use our self-service. We want to appear uh, in the life of our clients where they want us, not where we want them to come. Mm, we, we think that our approach will be that we grow together. We grow our business together. We grow our payments together. We grow uh, everything together. So, um, and because of that, we think that um, uh, this uh, accelerator we are speaking today uh, is even if it's our first uh, intention to do that, we think that we can do business together and this could be an important um, start for us uh, as a bank. Uh, it's an important partnership for us. And uh, we are very happy to have uh, a MasterCard as a payment uh, um, um, partner and also TechWell, which is very proactive and uh, very modern and uh, IT uh, partner for us. Uh, of course, as a bank, uh, we are happy that uh, in the financial sector, we are the biggest, but we know that we have to do a lot. And uh, we want to learn from the best and we want to grow with the best. That's why TechWheel and MasterCard, we know for sure that we can learn from them and we can do a lot of things together. And we are very proud uh, of this uh, initiative of our bank and uh, uh, we think that we can do a lot of things uh, together. That's why uh, for, for us, this uh, partnership is, uh, is um, a thing of, uh, of which we are very proud today. Um, what are our expectations from this accelerator? Uh, we have, uh, we would like to have uh, teams in retail and corporate at the same time, uh, because uh, uh, we know that just building around uh, physical identities, you will have something very, um, very narrow. We expect something more. That's why we expect to have and retail and corporate at the same time, some interactions. We expect, expect bright product vision. So we, we, we would like uh, people to understand what we are providing what we want us to implement and how this will look like. So not just an idea, but understanding, we expect a good understanding of what is expected from uh, to be delivered. Uh, we want a remarkable founders. So people who care about what they are doing, not just uh, something that it's put and maybe it will happen, but we want them to, to believe in what they are doing and to, uh, to care about this for a longer period. Uh, we want these products to be oriented to create and grow our businesses. Uh, and uh, it's important to understand but that not only to create something, maybe something exists, maybe something is already good. How, we, how these products could be grown up and um, let's say boosted to, to grow. Um, we want uh, these products to look at the local market, to be tested on the local market. Uh, as, a, as an idea, but then uh, maybe we can uh, uh, leave, um, let's say, boundaries of Moldova and go out of Moldova. And uh, of course, this is very important for us, considering our new strategy we approached uh, um, uh, several months ago. Uh, we have, because we also have an ambition for regional and global expansion. Um, this could generate um, uh, a synergy to my ecosystem. Mm, we have uh, some companies around us and we also a big bank with a lot of clients in uh, retail and in corporate. And we expect that after this, we'll have some ideas which will be connected to uh, our whole ecosystem around the bank. And of course, uh, for us is a priority to use artificial intelligence data. So it would be great if we have ideas which can use data and transform them um, how we use the state to monetize them, how we transform them in business, how we use data to grow, uh, to grow up the business and to grow up the payments. Um, how Mayib can contribute and we expect to contribute. Uh, we uh, will give access, easy access to Mayib sales pipeline uh, in order to test uh, and to validate ideas. Um, 
in order to be sure that we understand each other very well, uh, we would like to say that we count a lot on um, on uh, uh, bank secrecy. So for us, it's important that clients know that their data are safe. That's why we expect that we will look for anonymized data. So we will use data in a way which will permit to keep the bank secrecy at the desired level. Uh, we will be able to mentor and coaching during the accelerator. So our uh, banking uh, staff and the people in the bank uh, are ready for mentoring and coaching. Uh, we are uh, ready to give access to payment gateways of the bank and to the bank infrastructure if it, this will be necessary uh, during testing ideas and uh, working with, uh, with possible ideas of, um, of candidates, let's say. We will uh, uh, give uh, um, access uh, if necessary for integration with sales pipeline and with our CRM. So um, in this case, uh, it will be easier to test ideas that uh, um, our participants will give. Um, we think about uh, revenue sharing approach uh, in case we use product and this product will be um, already on, uh, well, let's say, in the production. And uh, of course, uh, we will have opportunity to have investment for growth. This is uh, how we expect to contribute. But I consider that most important uh, here is the, uh, the fact that we are ready for giving all necessary connections in order to test the ideas, to look how they work in production, and uh, all the infrastructure of, uh, of the bank, in case necessary, will be available for testing ideas. And our people will be with the teams in order to, to test ideas and to coach them. Um, here, my colleague suggested me that it will be good to, to show how uh, synergies usually are working. And uh, here we choose the Horizon Capital, one of our shareholders and uh, uh, how uh, Horizon Capital invested in a lot of companies, including Moldova Agro and Bank. But th at the same time, Moldova Agro and Bank is working with a lot of clients you see here uh, on the screen. We are working with Porcari, we are working with Creatio, who is implementing our CRM system. We are working with, with Rosetta. So this is uh, how synergies are created. And we expect also through this uh, um, exercise we are doing, we are starting to do today, also to create synergies uh, which will grow. Um, and an example is, is on my screen. Next steps. Uh, so um, I, I, I know that is already uh, in, a, in discussion here, but in April, we start the process. As I understand, this already was agreed with all, with all our partners. So in April, we, we start the process. Acceleration will be during uh, May and uh, August 2021. So we will work together in order to create synergy and to test our ideas. We will start the uh, pilot in uh, September till uh, December uh, 2021. Growth will start uh, already in the next year in January and the continuous uh, development. Um, so, uh, we go together, we go digital. <laughs> I, I try to be as short as uh, po uh, much possible, to, uh, you know, the, not to, to use uh, a lot of time, but uh, um, I hope that I was uh, able to cover most important issues of what we expect and how we can do together. Thank you very much. Vitalia? Anna, uh, who, who is taking the floor? Vitalia is taking the floor. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> No, I was a little bit late, that's why I don't know the rules. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't know, it's a question to you. Yeah, you see, I mean, just uh, uh, how do you think, yeah, so for you to involve your customers and in your journey, yeah, I mean, for the transformation? Why I'm asking, yeah? So, so far I was uh, spending the last 15, 16 years, not so, so much time in Moldova, but uh, half of the last day, most I was here. I mean, you see the point here, I did not hear, uh, I didn't hear about the, the uh, customer research or the like, uh, I mean, uh, involvement of the customers of the any banks, yeah, so into the, so when they are developing their products, yeah. How we involve our customers in transformation? Yeah. Is uh, you know, Vitaly, I will, I will tell you a very short story, but a funny one. I think it will be interesting. Um, 
a few months ago, we implemented uh, for the first time our centralized, uh, as we say, loan conveyor with a client database. So it was uh, a new uh, database in the bank, a new implementation. And one important thing which uh, this uh, system has is uh, customer security care. So we care a lot about security. And when we moved all the information from one system to another one, all clients at the same time received the, an SMS telling them that your data are changed. Please contact call center in order to check if, if it's you or not. It was, it was very funny because all clients in our bank um, contributed to this movement and to this change. We didn't expect it to send them SMS. We, it was like a, you know, a short, uh, let's say shortage in the bank. However, they all contributed, they all knew, but we moved because everybody calls to the call center. And sometimes, yes, uh, when you, you make big transformation in your IT systems, in your uh, customer journey, all of clients somehow they are contributing because they, they tell you how you should change in order to be better. Or, and sometimes uh, about your errors, you can communicate. Yeah, I don't know if I answered to your question or you expected something else. Yes, at least I mean, so, so at least part of it, yes. So just what I mean again, I mean, it was in various, I mean, the best practice worldwide. I mean, even in the couple of the, the, the projects I have involved in, it was like a special laboratory. So we say, I mean, uh, asking the customers, different types of the customers, I mean, the customers of the bank or the, 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 the pr prospective customers, yes, yeah, so on the street, yeah. Just oh, you mean that way? The type of the new product, yeah. Are you interested in this? How you are looking about this, the design? Even they, I mean, going, I mean, to invite the customers into their laboratory and make films, I mean, just when the customer is entering the, 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 the credit and loan application, perhaps, or the or the request for opening a, a, an account. Yeah, just in order, at least, I mean, to, 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 to open, I mean, and to, to film it, and after that, to detect the customer's uh, emotions, yeah, even on that, yeah. Now I understand. Yes, we have this process too. Uh, we have a uh, product in the bank, a new one on the market also, probably you had about uh, Libercard. And uh, when uh, redesigning this product now, because we are in the process, we have a focus group uh, talking to people, asking about their experience, what they liked, what not, and what they would like to see in the development of a product. Yes, uh, we, this is a special project we use, but usually through call center, we also have focus groups when we call people, asking them, uh, did they know about our product, what they like uh, in that product, if not, why not, if they don't want to, to have it, why they don't want to have, uh, to have it, and or when, or in, in what format they would like to have it. So yes, we have this, uh, this part of in the bank also. Oh, so, so very good, yeah, so, so, so it's, I'm very glad to hear it about it, yeah. And but we question. have some more plans, but I will not speak about them today. Yeah, you see, I just, you are not, I mean, uh, uh, going, I mean, to, 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 to unveil all the secrets of the bank, I guess, yeah, so just. <laughs> Um, uh, you see another question here. Yeah, so, what do you, so is the vision? I mean, yours or I mean, the bank, yeah, what's going, I mean, for the online banking, yeah, and uh, and how we are going, I mean, let's be like uh, online, offline, the proportion, I mean, in the nearest time, I mean, two to three years, yeah, so what we are expecting, I mean, to, to be, because you know, the story, yes, yeah, so worldwide is going, I mean, to be, I mean, very uh, speeded up by, by pandemic, yeah, so it was more like uh, going into online banking. What your so, so what's your current um, plans and visions of the of the bank and what are your expectations within the next two to three years? Mm -hmm. uh, for now, uh, as I said, about uh, sixty five percent of payments are already online, and the people tend more. It was uh, doubled during last uh, last year after pandemic. Uh, these are payments which do not imply any you know coming to the bank. For example, to pay for your utilities or to make transfers to each other. So this uh, are doubled and the number are increasing. By the way, number of clients is increasing significantly during last period. So people don't want to come to the branch. They want to do everything online. And uh, we, um, we think uh, that payments will go uh, more or less around 90% online. Uh, in the next uh, several months. Uh, and we are um, even encouraging 
uh, through our meter greeters in the branches uh, to, to teach people how to do that and not to lose time staying in the queues in the bank if they don't want to do something else. The same is on the part of deposits. Uh, we opened a lot of, of uh, services already in, uh, in online and people can do their deposits online. Even we create conditions better there, you know, they're not to come for the bank if they can make their savings online. The same you know, is on loan side. We already have offers online and people should uh, are not expected to come to the branch because they can do these transactions online. And we expect, Vitaly, that uh, in a few, um, let's say in one or two years, people will come to the branch only in case they need to do something which way is expected by the legislation to do in the branch or they need some consultancy. So in the branch already, you are not coming for daily operations. You are coming for consulting, for advice, or for something required by legislation. Um, at least is as we see our strategy for, for branch development and for uh, online development uh, for next years. So my next question will be a bit provocative, yes so on. So we are expecting in this case to, to reduce the number of the branches or not? Why? You can increase number of clients and increase number of advice you are giving there because I'm speaking already about a, a little bit different approach in speaking to our clients and in advising we are going to, to provide. So you, if you change uh, your approach to the branches, you will have different staff with different abilities and with different uh, attitude there. And you can have more staff in head office preparing all these online channels, preparing products for online, developing uh, um, ecosystems, but not uh, sitting in the branch and make, making uh, uh, daily operations, for example, paying utilities or something like that. Okay, thank you. And uh, I guess it would be almost uh, the last question, yeah? Uh, hopefully, we have a couple of minutes yet. Yeah, so the, the point is, uh, do you, what do you think, yes? Yeah, so what is it necessary, I mean, for the, for the faster progress, yes? Yeah, so for the, for the online banking and perhaps the, the fintech developments here? What are, I mean, the, 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 the necessary steps to be done or are, are the necessary actions to be done? This is one part of the question. And uh, what, uh, so what do we see the, the key players in the, in the financial area? I mean, that are like a governance of Moldova, government of Moldova, the parliament, the National Bank of Moldova, and a couple of associations here. Uh, so who are in fact, in fact so far I mean that what is need from them who are the most active and what are the like a promotion of the of the such I mean like a development yeah faster for faster development yeah so in the in the financial and perhaps fintech area as well. Mm. Uh, I will start with the first uh, question what should be done um, of course uh, mm, we, we are looking why sometimes people are not adhering to the online channels. What's there? And for example, still now we have clients asking for paper in order to demonstrate that they paid utilities. So we started to, to, to understand who is using that, why, why they need this. So first step to do is to convince the people and to be sure that authorities are not asking for papers. Otherwise online channel will be difficult to, to, to develop. So uh, as a first step, is, uh, is to um, teach clients to use online and not to be afraid that transactions are not processed or money will be lost. And we are working intensively on that. The second part is to be sure that the processes which are today by paper uh, done, they are going online and not only in the bank, but also in the universities when we, you pay, for example, they receive information that payment was done also in, the, in, in the, for example, I don't know how it will be in English, ACP. Uh, this is um, where you registrate collateral or something like that also will go online, not only, because if you buy something and you have to go there and register uh, collateral is difficult. So you need also access online and we are working now with this government institution to make uh, things to happen. Um, yes, it's necessary to change attitude of people and it's necessary to be sure that on, on, the, on, the, first, on the next part, you have institution accepting the same way as, uh, as we are. I am very happy in Moldova. I, I am here for one year already. 
in March is one year. And I am very happy that here we have a lot of access to databases, which permits us to work without paper and to make things faster. For example, in Moldova, we have a, uh, if client has already his ENDP, uh, you don't have with your hands to include a lot of data in order to work with the client. And this uh, creates more opportunities uh, for online uh, to happen. But one thing which remains very important is the uh, distance identification. If we uh, manage to have um, identification of a client without coming to the branch, this will, of course, boost uh, online, uh, online a lot. And we are working uh, with uh, some institution here in Moldova to make things uh, happen and to maybe next year to have already uh, distance identification of a client. Thank you. Just, I mean, like uh, to complete, I mean, your, your answer, I would say just I'll answer on the on the Nadir the Melinti uh, question, yes, or in the chart, yet yeah, to which extent are the regulations ready to relax the rules in the direction on facilitation digitalization of banks? This is one, a digital identification, yeah, KYC as well is, is, yeah. is another point, yeah. And you are, you are truly, uh, truly right that because the agency of public services, at least on the opinion of the experts and many, many, I mean, the people that uh, already spoken with, they, are, they have the very good uh, infrastructure base in order to, to define a special, I mean, services of the digital identification, yeah? You know, just, I mean, it's more like an organization and, and, uh, and uh, a legal framework question rather than the infrastructure because they, they, the, the infrastructure is almost ready. From another point, how they are ready to relax, they are ready, they are doing it, but they are doing it slowly and very, and very, and very. I would, I would say, uh, 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 cautious. Yeah, yeah. Just I mean, uh, not uh, might be, might be not at the, the full speed that are uh, expected by the by the by the, the players on the market. Yeah, but understandable. Uh, Vitaly, but at the same time, things uh, are happening and not so slow. For example, I'm very happy of our new project with uh, um, Primaria. Uh, uh, yeah, of Kishina, because we implemented uh, payments uh, in uh, in public transport, and we are implementing uh, some additional project related smart cities. So things are happening, and uh, they, they are very fast. In some areas, in some areas, you have to convince them. So comparing with our countries, uh, I think that things uh, are moving now. But what, are, what, what, in your opinion, are the main impediments on, on, on that development? On what? Impediments, yeah. So, like, uh, problems. Yeah, so problems. Yeah. Problems are anywhere. <laughs> uh, but uh, you have to, to work with them to understand how you can uh, overcome somehow. I, I, I can't say that we can't sometimes overcome some issues that are arising. I will not come, call them problems. I will come issue, I call it issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the problems are to be solved. Yeah. They, they arise, but anyway, anyway, you can expect that something can happen. But anyway, if you work on them, if you understand, or if you propose, if you are proactive, that's why I'm encouraging everyone, everybody to be proactive. And now we are working, as I told you, with uh, EGOV, on some issues, and they ask how we want, uh, what do we want, and they react to that. So I suppose that uh, if we are clearly in what we want to do, things will happen. Okay, and uh, the, I think- I am very optimistic, as you see. <laughs> that's very good, so, so that's a point, yes. So the, 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 the progress is, is, is made by optimists, I guess. Uh, but the point is the last question, yes, so would be, where do we see the, the, the Moldova Green Bank within the five to seven years, let's say? I see, I see Maib, um, not only as a bank, but as a partner for physical and legal entities, uh, which is uh, very mobile, uh, very, uh, easy to deal with and very simple in dealing with um, creating value for its customers and helping them at, um, at every point of their life. 
So it's not only a bank where you are doing your daily banking operations, but it's a place where you can find everything, deal with everything, and uh, grow your business, grow your, uh, not grow, but uh, develop your personal uh, ideas, uh, have a house, uh, have a, I, I don't know, everything for, for personal, per, uh, um, for persons, for physical persons. So it's not only a bank, it's an ecosystem already. Is the way I see, I see the bank. In other words, in the five to six to seven years, in a couple of years, uh, if I would like to have a, a morning coffee, I, I have to go to Moldova Green Bank, I guess. For sure. But it will not be bank at the end. It will be my <laughs> without <laughs> bank. <laughs> Today, I was told by one of our um, advisors that the banks are hated. Uh, in Moldova, and I asked why, why the perception is that the banks are hated, and we started to to understand that people coming to us, they they have to banks. Usually, they they have a feeling that these people will start asking from me money, and they will call me a lot of times. We we don't want to be like that. We want to. To, to be in the life of the people, but uh, you know, as we say here. Uh, we want a customer experience which permits us uh, to be efficient so things are done easily uh, to be uh, understandable so for, for for brains people understand you easy they are not afraid of you because they are understood and people love you you are in the heart of the people so this is where you want we want to be we want to be easy understandable and uh, that people love us yeah, I just, I mean, can consolidate you a bit here yeah, because according to the worldwide, I mean, the researchers, yeah, the banks are the second hated uh, area <laughs> in the world. And the first are, unfortunately, the insurance companies. Insurance companies, so I understand. <laughs> That's why I don't want, I, I would not like to be a bank in the next years. I would like to be something more. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, Marina, uh, so we, so almost, I mean, uh, answer to few questions here. So if you had some, or I mean, just, I mean, you have our contacts, uh, just uh, pass, I mean, the, the, to, the, to, the, to the all attendance here, yeah, if it's necessary. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it was really very good event here today. I was pleased, I mean, to, to, to follow him at most, I mean, 100% time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. If any of you uh, have anything else to add, by the way, Alona, somebody is asking for your contacts. In case you can lead them, <laughs> you can do it, or you can send it to us. Because it's an anonymous attendee. I don't know who exactly is asking for it. You, you can acquire one more client. Yeah. So even if it's an anonymous, <laughs> your AI into the bank would uh, identify him. Maybe it's a fan. <laughs> or maybe someone who wants to learn more about um, the program that you are launching, we, we put it, the link with the details uh, in the chat for all attendees. FinTech program, you can find it on the startupmoldova.digital page, as well as on my Inquest page. So uh, you are welcome to, to get more details. Uh, we'll come back with more uh, or some conclusions of the event, but we'll include um, the future plans of what we're planning next. Um, yes, Alona, I'm going to send the, this email. Send to my everyone. email. One of our core values is transparency. So if somebody wants to speak to us, we are open anytime. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you for making uh, this panel happen. I think it's amazing to see once again the plans that we have and uh, let's uh, rock the fintech uh, in Moldova. Uh, it's going to happen and it's going to happen starting with uh, uh, this year, with today and uh, every day from, uh, from now on. I, I want to thank all the panelists and the attendees for staying and bearing with us. I'm surprised we have still uh, people connected at this late hour, this is a whole day event and we still have some people on YouTube, <laughs> which is again crazy, but thank you once again uh, and many thanks to Swedish uh, Embassy because due to them we had this event uh, today and uh, see you during the next future event. Thank you to all. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you.